بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world. Between perspectives and challenges, reinvestigating the English, the reality of the English language. We start this day, which is a very special event in the English language department at the University of Qasdimirbah, the second virtual occasion in the same department. This conference agenda starts with the uh, recitation of the Holy Quran and then the inauguration speeches by the Vice Rector, Professor Murat Qureshi and the representative of the Faculty of Letters and Languages, Professor Dahu Hudayn. After that, we move to the speech of the conference chair, Dr. Mohammed Sagir Halimi and the keynote speaker, Dr. Caroline Colloway Thomas from Indiana University. With no further delay, we'd like to start this, uh, this day with a recitation of some Quranic verses by Ben Ali Ilyas, a second year master student at the University of Qasdi Mirbah. Thank you. 
Sadaqallahu al-Azim, a very special thanks to the student Ben Ali Ilyas for his mesmerizing recitation. I call now for the podium, the Vice Rector of the University of Qasdi Mirbah, Professor Murad Qureshi, to announce the official opening of this conference. أدعو الآن إلى المنصة بروفيسور دحو فضيل من أجل الإعلان الرسمي عن افتتاح هذا الملتقى وبالنيابة عن كل من بروفيسور دحو وبروفيسور مراد قريشي أدعو الدكتورة نسيب شهرزاد من أجل الإعلان الرسمي عن افتتاح هذا الملتقى فلتتفضل مشكورة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته السادة الحضور زملائي الأساتذة زملائي طلبة لكل مشاركين في هذا الملتقى من داخل وخارج الوطن نشكر دعمكم على فعاليات هذا الملتقى الدولي الملتقى الدولي ملتقى الدولي first international conference première conférence internationale sur la linguistique au monde en la politique de la linguistique au monde voilà donc sans trop tarder parce que Euh, C'est vraiment à l'imprévu. Au jet de chokri, les poules m'ont abîmé. Ou à l'inan, il dit à Hadel Moutaka ou à Chokran. Voilà. Thank you so much, Dr. Nasib. And on behalf of, of the organizing committee, we'd like to thank the administrative staff of the University of Qasdi Mirbah for all the help and encouragement they provided in order to achieve this uh, event. We move now to the conference chairperson's speech. Please help me welcome Dr. Mohamed Sghir Halimi from the University of Qasdi Mirbah, Wagla. Help me welcome him. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Urahad bi doyufin al-kiram. Wa niyabatan an rais al-jami'a. Wa niyabatan an amid kulliya. Wa niyabatan an kulli huzur ladhi ta'adhar alim al-huzur. لأسباب مهنية بحثة لأنهم ليس في في مدينة ورقلة أنا في مدينة أخرى. First, I have to repeat to reproduce my friend's words. Who says, I try to speak slowly for I believe our collective years can process information differently across culture. So this is the reason why I'm going to speak slowly. I don't believe that we all share, have the same knowledge and the same uh, uh, perception. Our honorable rector, honorable distinguished speakers and guests, conference participants, particularly those who are from abroad, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the organizing committee, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all. Our distinguished guests, our colleagues, and our students to the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world 2021, organized by the Department of English Language at Qasim al University of Wurma. Albeit this unprecedented situation with the global COVID-19 pandemic situation 
the Mirbah University, and particularly the Department of English, in which decided to move towards the virtual space in academia, which has become a must. This is why we all are indebted to our honorary, honoring Charles, Professor Mohammed Tarhalilat, Director of the University of Wurgla, Professor Lai Jalluli, the Dean of the Faculty of Letters and Languages, and Professor Murat Qureshi, who have proved and supported the area of holding this conference. As we are indebted to Professor Dahfudayl, the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal Paradigms, Professor Khanur Salah and Professor Dillabadi, the directors of the lab, Le Feu, for helping us to carry out what has long been our intention, which is to get up an effective picture for the University of Azimir Bahwurgla. We would like to express our deep gratitude to the president of the organizing committee, Dr. Radwan Kavi, and his technical staff, to Dr. Khawla Hakum, to Dr. Yus Bishikh, and to our dear student, Nordin Dahou. In fact, we are indebted to all the organizing members for their great efforts. They all work together and extremely hard for the same goal to prepare an outstanding international conference. We express sincere gratitude to both our national, means from Algerian universities, and international peer reviewer team who volunteered to review the abstracts and promised to review the full papers after being sent. Their contribution, I confess, is invaluable. The first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world 2021 has attracted a large audience in spite of the relatively short period of its announcement. We have for like 62 presentations from 19 Algerian universities and six non-Algerian universities. And we have the countries from universities from the USA, from France, from Spain, from Ireland, from Nigeria, from Burundi. And we have other Algerian universities, which are for like 19 universities. And they all contribute. They have talked about three different, round three, uh, 10 different tracks, which are the academic writing and English language teaching, culture and literature in EFL classes, critical thinking and English language teaching, translation knowledge production, language education policy, ESP in the Algerian context, teachers training and TFL, promoting innovative teaching in EFL classes, critical studies in EFL teaching learning, reading and writing in EFL classes. Before giving the floor to the moderator, Dr. Khawla Hakom, obviously, I would like to express my personal gratitude to our keynote speaker, my friend, the professor, Caroline Calloway Thomas. Caroline uh, Calloway Thomas is professor and a chair of African American and African Diaspora Studies in Indiana University, Bloomington, USA, who has accepted our invitation with great pleasure and without a single hesitation to give a keynote speech. We are very pleased to hear the echo of this conference from here. From her, sorry. I close my welcome remarks, our honorary chairs, committee members, moderators, session chairs, students, and colleagues. Thank you all for your contribution in shaping this event. And a particular thank to my colleague, dear Dr. Toria, who paved me the way to make this conference real. And thank you very much. And thank you all. Thank you. Ms. We highly appreciate your contribution, dear conference chair. We all who are in this conference as participants or as audience, thank you in return for allowing us to meet when meeting is strictly banned and is truly unhealthy. We meet today in a very healthy and in the safest atmosphere, the academic and scientific atmosphere. Thank you again, Dr. 
uh, Mohamed Sreer Halimi. We move now to the keynote speech by Dr. Caroline Calloway Thomas from Indiana University, the United States of America, with her contribution entitled Uses, Tropes of Identity, Racism, and Repetition in Black American Culture. a wretched pandemic. I wish it were possible for us to meet face to face, but here we are virtually, and that also matters hugely. I can't breathe, said George Floyd repeatedly 20 times as he begged for his life in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the United States of America on May 25th, 2020, while police officer Derek Chauvin knelt for nine minutes on his neck. Despite Floyd's moving, haunting pleas for his life, Chauvin remained tone deaf and just kept kneeling, creating awful indentations in Mr. Floyd's neck. All who witnessed the event saw the tape or heard about Chauvin's cruel actions were outraged and many began sustained protests against police brutality and for racial justice. The killing of Mr. Floyd not only highlighted the gross injustices and cruelties that characterized black lives during slavery, but it also called special attention to systemic and legally sanctioned discrimination in the United States. Moreover, the killing reminded all citizens of the past sins of Americans and unlovely practices that prevented black progress, such that today, according to William Edgerton, in the splintering of the American mind, the average wealth of black families is less than a tenth of that of white families. Mr. Floyd's death also opened a floodgate of comments about why white Americans treat black Americans the way they do. And we've been met with charges of systemic racism. And these have become a huge part of the dialogue and discourses in America today. In fact, the repetitive trope of racism rings like a fire bell in the night in terms of the ability to drive the cultural agenda of Black Americans. And it is a key linguistic trope or figure of speech. Ever mindful that it will not be possible for me to cover this topic fully within the minutes that I have been given. First, I will call our attention to some past uses of repetition, however briefly their force and power to illustrate that words pack power and are laden with values, values that move us toward that which is good, values that move us toward that which is bad, but sometimes values may fail to move us at all. 
like actors and actresses on stage, values perform. They do something with powerful consequences. Ideas have powerful consequences. Second, I will discuss some special rhetorical features and functions of repetition. Finally, I will argue that the chromosomal imprinting mechanism of the trope repetition, the trope of racism, is a special species of existential usurpation, which disrupts the intellectual, human, cultural, and economic capital of Black Americans using examples where necessary. By existential usurpation, I mean the sheer persuasive ability of repetition to divert one's attention from other crucial issues of a group's agenda through magnification and monopolization. Magnification and monopolization. Usurpation causes us to lose focus and away from other galvanizing forces that need to claim our attention with a potential and real cost to the group that may be greater than what members can imagine. Historically, of all the ways to ensure that hatred and ugliness are promoted, performed, reinforced, and sometimes leading to genocide, one need only turn to the brutal cases of Southern slavery in the United States and genocide in Nazi Germany and Rwanda, cases that were knitted together via repetition as a compelling way to galvanize ugly, mean attitudes and behaviors toward the so-called repugnant other. The deadly use of terms such as bacilli, vermin, and rats led Kenneth Burke in the rhetoric of Hitler's battle to write dolefully and urgently, we must try to discover what kind of medicine this medicine man has concocted that we may know with greater accuracy exactly what to guard against if we are to forestall the concocting of similar medicine in America. And Ibrahim Kendi, Ronald Takaki and others observed that the historical repetitive framing of blacks as child savage, sambo, docile, irresponsible people, giving to lying and stealing, lazy and being perceived as affectionate and happy, and other degrading and demeaning terms historically distorted Black Americans' image of themselves and what they could produce and do. The sheer force of repetition in the minds of many whites froze Blacks in childhood and as inferior in intelligence with deficiencies in industriousness and criminality. In this light, such negative linguistic terms become and became an ongoing process of self-making and self-shaping of Black Americans, to use Paul Gilroy's words. Racism intermingled powerfully with the subjective consciousness of Blacks and gave them a means to understand how race and racism helped to build their identity, who they were, why and with what effect. Racism, true to Gilroy's definition of identity, helped Blacks to comprehend the formation of the perilous pronoun we and to reckon with patterns of inclusion and exclusion that it cannot help creating. In other words, when one says we, it quickly excludes certain people as in we are Algerian, we are Muslim, or we are Americans. Linguistic exclusion occurs automatically. Of course, over the years, Blacks tried 
and are ridding themselves of the Western notion, supported in large measure by Western science, that they were an inferior race. In his 1854 speech, titled The Claims of the Negro Ethnologically Considered, abolitionist Frederick Douglass referred to such madness as scientific moonshine as he tried to talk and to argue black folks into the human family. I'm amazed that one had to do that. The repetitive notion that blacks were of a lower class and order and that whites were superior filled books and scientific papers of Louis Agassiz, and Samuel Martin, a Philadelphia doctor with notions deep inside his book, Crania Americana, of the terrible idea that he had measured the cranial capacities of the skulls of whites and blacks and discovered that those of whites were larger. As we know, the circulation of mean and twisted systemic images of Black Americans by the press, by the pulpit, and by Congress, as well as courts, damaged the very fiber of Blacks' collective identity. Such brutal images found their way into the public consciousness and political rhetoric with devastating consequences for African Americans. And such views were largely orchestrated via repetition, which entered the consciousness of Blacks and struck them like a thunderball. Although sociocultural things have changed, and although we rarely read about such nasty, brutish things today, I hope my historical allusions to the power of repetition associated with these, albeit quick mini studies, drive home the point that repetition is a compelling trope, a potent vehicle for learning, for persuasion, and for action. Hitler's propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels knew this. He knew that things repeated often enough become fact-like, and that if one keeps repeating and saying things over and over, eventually people will believe them, and most crucially, people will act on them. The repetitive trope of racism is so compelling and so seductive precisely because it has the potential to derail our individual and collective human projects using the moth effect. And I'm referring to the insect that is not a beautiful butterfly, but the moth, the moth effect. However, we can stop is encroachment if we are more vigilant and more watchful of the abundant evidence and information gathering around us outside the very orbit of repetition. And this is an important point about how the tool of repetition tinkers with our brains by manipulating us into thinking that there is only one agenda that should claim our attention. Just as a moth is drawn to a flame or a fire, so too, I argue, does repetition draw our attention to racism by largely ignoring much of the surrounding spacious, symbolic, geographical terrain, the trees, the bushes, the flowers, rivers and streams, bees, squirrels, and chipmunks. An apt aphorism warns, we must pay attention to what we pay attention to. I agree wholeheartedly with Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, who once said that the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. 
It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. I repeat that again. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. In this hugely significant way, racism is truly a usurper. From the ancient days of Aristotle and Cicero in 5th century BC, tropes have played a central role, not only in speech, but also in cognition, in conceptualization, and in comprehension. Aristotle argues it is frequent repetition that produces a natural tendency and that the more frequently two things are experienced together, the more likely it will be that the experience or recall of one will stimulate the recall of the other. And Hanneris notes insightfully a flooding of perspectives, either through a massive redundancy of messages in sheer quantitative terms or through a use of cultural forms of peculiar qualitative potency can have strong effects. The rhetorical force of repetition in African-American culture today is ordering how Blacks see the world. And this special form of discourse is unfortunately preempting our larger collective agendas, which include important economic, social, intellectual, and cultural projects which are necessary in order for us to succeed brilliantly in global society, because we live in a very complex and various, highly technologized world. What features of repetition help facilitate its preemptive existential usurpation? And what are some potential real world consequences of existential usurpation for black American culture in general. Well, first, the trope repetition is a compelling linguistic vehicle, fostering an object of instant contemplation or consideration. The nature of repetition and its social imprinting quality is to trigger automatic associations between one entity, say John Doe, and another entity, how black folks are being treated in North American society in systematizing thought. And in a quick fashion, a quick fashion, in some circles, when one says President Trump is a racist, association occurs between Donald Trump George Floyd and a myriad of other awful things that have impinged upon Blacks consciousness and world, historically and individually. It is rare for a group of Blacks to gather, whether tenured professors, star soccer, players, medical doctors, students, mill workers, beauty and barbershop owners, plumbers, mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters without discussing the repetitive trope of racism and its impact on our lived day-to-day -day experiences. Like a moth, African-Americans often discuss how they are treated in North American socially, economically, and culturally. Such linguistic practices are as common as the air Black Americans breathe. Usually, Blacks take pains to list all of the available ways they have been offended, hurt, insulted, stepped over, derided, and degraded. Aside from the obvious fact that racism exists, something we know and have known since our ancestors exited the doors of no return off the coast of Ghana, Angori Island, and Senegal, West Africa. Why do Black Americans spend so much time talking about the problem of racism, defining 
its many dimensions and faces instead of generating more active, enduring, robust strategies for dealing with racism. Is whiteness a hex? Too often. Impacts of the centralizing hub of activities associated with emotionally laden terms such as racism, racist, white supremacy, and comments from many Blacks and other North Americans proclaiming the United States as a racist country. Simultaneously, these things claim too much of our attention. But my message of goodwill to you today is that the repetition of the words racist, racism, and the like rhetorically and linguistically function like existential usurpers. Like a moth to a flame, usurpers draw Black Americans into the heady orbit of repetition. And too often, repetition allocates, prioritizes, and distributes our mindsets in one major direction. It swings people and keeps them awake and alert by impinging hugely upon human consciousness. This is not to suggest, of course, that all of the linguistic and rhetorical space is taken over by repetition. I want to make that very, very clear. Far from it. But enough space is claimed to make a crucial difference. Insufficient to address the myriad of issues and problems that confront African Americans from children not reading at grade level to blacks killing each other in Chicago and other places and spaces in urban cities. Thus, the collective energy of African Americans is dispersed and scattered as a consequence. Of course, this is not to argue that all Black Americans are unmindful, because it would be extreme folly to suggest such. Instead, my key point is that humans miss significant things in the body politic because of our fixation on racism, which again, I know exists and needs to be eliminated, root and branch. But why do Black Americans spend so much of their precious time talking about it? Does the monopolization of discourses centered around racism prevent human flourishing? The point is, that the repetitive trope of racism usurps the intellectual resources of Black Americans. Of course, I am mindful that this is not an either or proposition, but a both and proposition, as well as a robust competition between the factual is world and an ought world. And that is, distinctions that we make between things that exist in the real physical world as opposed to things that inhabit our imaginary. But we know that the imagined world is also embedded in the material world and that social construction works like an invisible hand to weave the imagined order into material reality all around us. As Yuval Harari reminds us, in his fascinating book, Sapiens or Sapiens. But crucially, what are some things that Blacks miss because of the moth-like effect of the repetitive trope racism? Well, let us consider the fact that increasingly young Black children have no after-school programs in music in too many places and spaces. Consider the fact that young people are not attending church where individuals used to get skills necessary, skill sets necessary for them to navigate the world beautifully and spectacularly. I grew up in the church and learned skills of leadership in that very body. For another example, let me reference Richard Reeves' powerful book, 
one that I should have written, but he somehow plucked the idea, stealth-like, from inside my head. He argues in Dream Hoarders how the American middle class is leaving everyone else in the dust, why that is a problem, and what to do about it. A long title, almost 18th century-like. Reeves argues that issues of inequality in America tend to focus on the rich top 1% and instead of upper middle class people, the 20 percenters. Reeves argues further that high income parents are now passing on their class status to their children, threatening American ideals of equal opportunity of social mobility. That upper class, upper middle class children become upper middle class adults. That upper middle class children become upper middle class adults. Class separation becomes class perpetuation. Reeves gives several examples, one of which is a compelling idea that the rise of exclusionary zoning designed to protect the home values, schools, and neighborhoods of the affluent has badly distorted the American property market. Furthermore, he argues that the upper middle class zoning and wealth reinforce each other in a vicious cycle. George Packer, in a 2019 piece in the Atlantic magazine titled, The Culture War Devows the Children. While lamenting the fact that there is no true meritocracy, writes the true meritocracy came closest to realization with the rise of standardized tests in the 1950s, the civil rights movement, and the opening of Ivy League universities to the best and brightest, including women and minorities. A great broadening of opportunity followed, he argues. But he notes, in recent decades, the system has hardened into a new class structure in which professionals pass on their money, their connections, ambitions, and work ethic to their children, while less educated families fall further behind with little chance of seeing their children move up. The repetitive trope of racism prevents us from seeing this crucial terrain because it is often hidden from view. Thomas Piketty, in his big, bold book, Capital in the 21st Century, 685 thickly textured pages, which I tried to read from cover to cover, but failed uh, virtually. Uh, he says the same thing when he observes that so much of our wealth comes from capital gains and not from labor. Too much of our wealth comes from capital gains and not from labor. This means that folks who are born poor are likely to die poor. That's in his book. I hope you see once again why I am so, so concerned about repetition, the usurper. If, as Kendi proclaims in his book, Stamped from the Beginning, a policy is racist, if it produces or sustains racial inequality. And a person is by definition racist if he or she supports such a policy. And how is one to characterize many elites who control hiring decisions in our prestigious August institutions, decide who is in and who is not and with what effect? How are we to classify them? What are we to make of elites, Democrats and Republicans, who zone poor Blacks and 
whites out of their neighborhoods, preventing both groups from getting elegant and richly textured educations. Reeves is quick to add, however, that this is not a conspiracy, that the 20 percenters do not gather at church suppers, civic associations, museums, parties, and soccer fields where they hatch plans for how to deny Black children a beautiful existence. But think of what would happen if many Black children enjoyed schools comparable to the ones in rich neighborhoods. What would the edifying, gratifying consequences of such participation and presence be like in terms of pruning and burnishing their beautifully poised, potentially accomplishing minds? Finally, Reeves writes, the physical separation of the poor tends to grab most of the attention of policymakers, and that there is strong evidence for the damaging impact on life chances of living in these neighborhoods. But the deepest geographical divides are opening up toward the top of the distribution. It is the affluent who are increasingly segregated from other people. Repetitive tropes with their arguments and squabbles and cue jumping over such compelling, compassionate, empathetic points, however, remain largely invisible, hidden from view because of the chromosomal imprinting mechanism that resides in the very bosom of the rhetorical trope racism. There is a cost to be paid for segregated neighborhoods because the clustering of upper middle class families into certain neighborhoods deepens the class divide and affects how we talk to each other, how we sing to each other, how we play with each other, and how we organize our thoughts and behaviors for the common good, the good we share in common. What then? is to be done about existential usurpers. What should Black's national collective agendas be and do? Although there are no magic bullets for a common progressive agenda for change, the following are some quick ideas that with some planning, some planning, and attentiveness just might help African-Americans do more culturally useful things, creating more human flourishing. First, we need a more balanced and nuanced discourse paradigm, which can gradually fill the explanatory vacuum that is being filled with existential usurpation. Happily, I'm working on such a paradigm. But departments of Africana Studies and other departments and organizations across the world can also lead the way robustly and compellingly in this regard. Second, we need to increase interactions between the rich and the poor. The rich have loved lots of space since ancient times, and they have used it to sustain opulent lifestyles build extraordinary manor houses, sustain honorific monarchies, dine on lovely food, and craft gilded ceilings. And herein lies a fundamental human problem for the distribution of empathy, knowledge, skills, and other forms of human capital. For the lives of our people, to become realized in more exquisite ways. We must not only know that racism exists, but we must also hate injustice and do something marvelous about it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my ideas with you. Thank you and have a lovely day.
goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Caroline, for sending us such warm words and sharing us such a valuable contribution. Thank you for insisting on being with us today to enrich this academic event and give us a deep insights on how discourse and injustice work, how social injustice and social inequality and oppression are enacted, produced, and reproduced through discourse. So uh, please, for the participants, I would like just to share with you some of the organizational remarks so that we know the procedures of how the sessions will be run. First of all, to avoid any technical problems, we have preferred that the presentations would be diffused successively as videos. All the presenters in each session are invited to join us virtually so that they would answer the questions in the debate. After the end of the pre presentations, the chairperson will moderate a 15 minute debate. The audience who have questions or comments are gently invited to write the questions in the chat or in the uh, discussion box. The chairperson will decide when to close the session and the debate to remain within the time limits. We'll have a five minute break and then we'll be back with the first session of this conference. Thank you so much.
Hello and welcome again. So we start the first session of uh, this conference, which is around the academic writing and English language teaching, chaired by Dr. Soraya Dreed from the University of Kastimir Bachwood. Please help me welcome the chairperson. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to our uh, second conference at the Department of English at Qasim Erbah University. This is Dr. Thoraya Drip. I will be sharing the, the first session of this conference, which is titled Academic Writing and English Language Teaching. Uh, we have on the panel uh, our colleagues, Dr. Farida Labal and Zuhair Abdeslam from Betna University. Me, Dr. Soraya Drit from Wargla University, and Dr. Nadia Gunen, from Saidi University, Dr. Amina Abdelhadi from Kiert University, mm. and uh, finally, Dr. Radia Bugibs and uh, Dr. Nadia Idri from uh, both uh, Luanes Constantine and Bijaya University. Well, uh, this, uh, I invite the participants to join us virtually so that we can uh, follow the, uh, the presentations. We immediately uh, start with, uh, I have the new program here, uh, with Dr. Amina Abdelhadi to present uh, her uh, paper titled English Language and Scholarly Publication in International Scientific Journals. So we immediately listen to her presentation. Amina. Yes, I mean, I'm going to Hello, I'm Dr. Amina Abdelhadi, a senior lecturer at Ibn Khaldun University of Tirat, Algeria. Warmest welcome and good wishes to you all, dear the animators, moderators, colleagues, the guests and everyone behind my screen. researchers around the world, but also seems to be the right option to spread scientific knowledge to a large audience. This claim is reinforced by many studies such as Borden's Gomez 2004, Tardi 2004, Chandrasekhar Rao 2018 and Solar 2019. 
English has become a prerequisite to being a competent scientific researcher whose papers are internationally recognized and awarded. It may be assumed that the scientific achievement does not depend on the language of which it is written, but a headline such as Publish in English or Perish, Mario Depititi Julia Ferreras 2017, shows clearly that English language plays a major role in readership of scientific research articles. Most editors and publishers of scientific journals are integrating English language as a medium of writing in their guidelines, assuming that this will make scientific articles more visible and cited. We believe that the qualities required to be a good scientific researcher can be broken down into more specific core competencies, but the global medium through which scientists communicate their relevant findings to the global target scientific community matters. Who knows, maybe it will be the turn of another language to play this role in the coming years. That will not matter. What matters is that science needs an international language to communicate important results globally. And now, it is the turn of English to play this role. It is justified that more than 90% of the indexed scientific articles in the natural sciences have been published in the English language. This is justified by Amon study 2012 and Hamel 2013 cited in BTT Firas 2017. Thus, this study may be significant for Algerian non EFF scholars to cope with the challenge of disseminating their research in English. It discusses the issue of writing papers for publication in international English medium index journals and the need for the use of English as a medium of instruction in Algerian universities. Now, it is, it appears of utmost importance that language policy makers understand their role in shaping and creating the future of these scientific minds. In the pursuit of these aims, it is of consequence to answer the following array of research questions. First, how do Algerian non EFL scholars perceive publication in English as a medium of writing for international scientific journals. Second, do they encounter difficulties in writing research for publication in English medium index journals? Third, is the state of English in Algerian universities fulfilling the researchers' needs to successful publication in international index journals? The study at hand employs a self-compiled questionnaire that is created online using Google Sheets. Sampling in this study is a purposive one, following the typical strategy where participants share the same experience as higher education non-EFL teachers. The questionnaire is sent to 40 full-time teachers at various Algerian faculties of natural science physics, and finance, but only 26 are returned. The diversity in the respondent's specialities is required to yield a broad view of the current issue. Mixed method approach is used in the analysis of the questionnaire, quantitatively with the closed questions and qualitatively with the open-ended questions, which is developed on the basis of the concerned questions. As already stated, the results of the present study are displayed by means of an online questionnaire which is divided into four main interrelated sections with both planned closed-ended and open-ended questions. This opening section is designed to determine the participant's specialities. The result presented in this figure may create room for validity and reliability of the gathered information as they represent data that is based on diversity and difference. The second section aims to obtain general information about the participants' perceptions of using English as a medium of writing for publication in international index journals and the major factors affecting their perceptions. The results displayed in Figure 2 
shows that 70% respondents agree on the positive response yes, 24% from the entire sample opts for the answer no, while only 6% report a neutral opinion. The immediate comment on these findings is that the majority of the respondents opine that English is the right option to publish in indexed international journals because of many reasons that are mentioned in the answers of the following question. Having a look at figure 3, we notice that the most important factor leading to preference for publishing research in international English medium index journals is high level of acceptance. It is the most cited by nearly all the respondents with 96% followed by rapid publication 48%, citation visibility 46% and recognition award with 35%. The research expected the teachers to attach great importance to, to citation and visibility because we think all higher education teachers are trying to get cited. As it can be observed, only two respondents, 8% add other answers and they are as follows, transparency, self-improvement through international publishing and gaining prestige. For section 3, which aims at determining whether the informants face difficulties when writing research for publication internationally, it is decision. evident from that the great majority of the participants right. have writing difficulties in English with a rate of 80% as opposed to only 19% of them who show their ability to write effectively in English. And when asked in open-ended questions, about how do they cope with the challenge of writing research for publication internationally. With regard to their level of proficiency in English, unsurprisingly, the vast majority of teachers report that they use some translations, websites such as Google Translation and Context Reversal. The respondents also note that the help from these sites is limited. They are aware that they do not always provide effective translation. I believe it's not Other the way teachers people. report that they have their articles translated to English by professional translations, translators, but unfortunately with high fees. For the aims of the same section, figure 5 indicates that while only 11% teachers report that they do not feel at disadvantage in the publication field, compared to other writers for whom English is an L1, 89% of the total sample believe the reverse. For the last section, which attempts to provide practical suggestions, and when asked about whether or not they believe that the issue of publishing internationally in index journals has a correlation with the need for the use of English as a medium of instruction in Algerian universities, the vast majority of the participants Participants with 79% report their approval by ticking the highly contributive option, while 17%, 2%, and another 2% respectively ticked moderately, slightly, and not contributive. This question is intentionally designed to be an open-ended question to gain access into as much strategies as possible to be published internationally in indexed journals. Among the 26 respondents, 16 of them provided some comments which are grouped according to their sameness as follows. Nine teachers stressed the idea of formal training by their faculties and encouragement by the policy. Five teachers point the significance of extensive reading of papers in English. And two teachers appreciate the idea of proofreading by native speakers or teachers of English language. For this part of the study, it is noteworthy that, according to the results obtained, English language has become the right option to publish scientific papers in international index journals, and by implication, it is an indispensable tool in the respondents' academic careers. This finding tends to emphasize the view that academic research and English language as a medium of writing should not be treated separately, and thus the use of the native language to communicate research findings internationally may have not become a free choice. For the respondents who opt for the negative answer no, 
They may have what to say about the English issue in the research paper and therefore their perspectives merit further investigation. Second, the respondent's preference for publication in the National Index journal, journals is related to many reasons and mainly to the factual high level of acceptance which is the most cited by nearly all the respondents. This is maybe because the need of a of publication international journal is strongly felt in their context, such as prerequisite for habilitation and professorship processes, or perhaps because, in line with some previous research findings, university rankings and the prestige are generally interwined with the number of research articles published in some journals and their following citation by researchers. Regarding difficulties whenever writing papers in English and how they cope with this challenge, results indicate that a great majority of the respondents have writing difficulties. That is to say, instead of working on the ideas in the manuscript, non-native researchers spend a tremendous amount of time revising the language. However, according to them, due to limited English proficiency or poor translation, high quality research may, may lose its value. In other words, since it may become hard to review scientific content of a paper with poor English, as the ideas are often not clearly communicated and the incorrect drama is very distracting, papers are rejected and non-native English scholars are diverted away from international publishing. On this basis, it is recommended to focus on more in-depth investigation into the writing difficulties for scholarly publication in English for Algerian researchers. This question goes further and more specific to shed light on the respondent's feeling of disadvantage in the academic publication as compared to writers for whom English is an L1. It is shown that, that the respondent perceive themselves to be disadvantaged by their non-native status and which is in line with some previous studies findings. Here we can see that the dominance of English is double-edged as it carries both negative and positive consequences. For the last section, practical suggestions, we've mentioned before that the respondent report appropriate techniques for writing quality papers in English and being published in index journals. In the same respect, more than the half of the respondents regards the use of English as a medium of instruction in Algerian universities as a highly contributive factor for successful publication. This is because they consider writing English papers an essential part of their research process. Considering the findings of this study, language education policy makers need to be aware of this situation and improve the teaching of English, especially in sciences. Perhaps they need to understand that global English means the end of English as, if not a foreign, a second foreign language in Algeria. To this end, some questions are addressed to be investigated. First, what plans, if any, are there to encourage international publication in English medium index journals? Second, are there possibilities to introduce English as a medium of instruction in Algerian universities? What are the costs in terms of time, money and efforts of using English as a medium of instruction in Algerian universities? In what ways can other sectors help the introduction of English? Do we need more help from the British Council? And finally, is it likely to have an impact in the future on the languages spoken by Algerian students, their identity and culture? To conclude, I really appreciate the role of this conference, which provides a valuable forum for policy practitioners and experts to discuss crucial global issues on linguistic policy in the world. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to partake in the conference. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amin Abdelhadi, for this very informative presentation and paper on scholarly uh, publication in international scientific journals. Uh, just to comment on the uh, on this uh, paper, uh, I believe that uh, using English to publish one's research has become an obligation rather than a choice, and this requires certain skills. 
And this is uh, essentially the point that I will uh, discuss in my uh, presentation. So uh, immediately I uh, shift to uh, my own presentation titled uh, The Shift from Uniformity to Disciplinarity in Academic Writing and Its Instructional Implications. Uh, this is very closely related to the first uh, paper. Now, I am glad to meet you virtually and contribute to this conference with the paper titled Academic Writing, the Shift from Uniformity to Disciplinarity. The focus is put in my discussion on academic writing in the disciplines. This is my outline. I will first introduce the background of this discussion and state the aims of my paper, uh, starting firstly with uh, the concept of uniformity or the common core in academic writing, and then moving to disciplinary variation, uh, firstly at the level of genre and then at the level of textual characteristics. And I will come at the end to some conclusions and implications. By and large, the expectations of what constitutes a good English academic text have long been considered unchanging and predictable. However, the research tendency now is to focus on how academic writing changes according to its context. Of course, we mean the disciplinary context. In this connection, the term writing in the disciplines or the acronym WID has been coined to capture this variation. The source is extensive quantitative and qualitative research. This is based on document analysis of assignment types in content areas and interviewing professional practitioners, students and instructors. This has been recently conducted on the levels at which academic writing varies in the disciplines. Although most of it centers on English uh, academic writing, the insights derived are interesting and applicable to any language. This presentation, which is based on a review paper, highlights a paradigm shift in academic writing research and instruction within the area of English for academic purposes. It focuses on the way academic literacy, which was held to be universal for some time, is shown to be influenced by the peculiarities of the disciplines. Through this discussion, we aim at demystifying the levels at which academic writing differs across various disciplinary contexts. And on the basis of this, we have the shift from uniformity to disciplinary variation, which is shown in this diagram. Let's clarify the notion of uniformity or the common core in academic writing research. Until recently, if anyone is asked about what academic writing means, uh, they would say that it is a set of decontextualized skills which were transferable and common to all the domains and the disciplines. For example, these skills include the following, the use of reason over emotion, rationality and argumentation supported by evidence, the use of concise, formal and objective language, uh, being focused, structured and backed up by evidence, conforming to traditional conventions of mechanics, lexis, grammar and style. This is found in any textbook on uh, uh, academic writing. This is a common core, but the, the picture has changed nowadays. It is in fact useful to discuss this common core briefly to show that academic writing is on the one hand, a uniform type uh, of writing because its rules are uh, indisputable. And on the other hand, this would help us see the shift to the other perspective, which is disciplinarity and variation. 
the current perspective now in academic writing research is moving towards disciplinary variation or how writing varies academically across the disciplines. In this new perspective, we stress that in addition to the common core, which, is, uh, which should be acquired by any writer, there should be some unique skills which are, skill, uh, which are dependent on the disciplines uh, themselves. Of course, we cannot understand the shaping force of the disciplines unless we understand what disciplines are. And also, we have to understand the notion of a discourse community. Although there are sometimes diverse understandings of what a discipline is and how it divides up, it is possible to say, to say that disciplines form academic tribes. They have norms, nomenclature, bodies of knowledge, sets of conventions and modes of inquiry, which constitute a unique culture. Part of this cultural system is the writing culture. We mean here that the members of each discipline write differently. Writing cultures can be better understood by referring to the notion of a discourse community, which was coined by Swales. Discourse communities have common goals, communicative goals, intercommunication mechanisms, specific genres or text types, and specific lexis or jargon. The practices of disciplinary discourse communities shape the way language is projected, understood and evaluated in specific circles. Therefore, being a member of a discourse community means knowing the conventions of using language effectively to fulfill shared social goals. Here we can cite the examples of the medicine doctors com discourse community or political scientists discourse community or foreign language teachers discourse community. Each group here or each community uses language in a particular way and this is reflected in writing. On this basis, when writing in any discipline, writers to seek to embed their writing in a particular social world which they reflect and call to mind through particular approved discourses or accepted discourses. This exposes the writers to divergent demands and expectations, especially on what counts as good and appropriate writing in each context. For instance, what is expected and praised in a literary context is not necessarily expected and praised in a scientific context. Let's now say more about how academic writing varies uh, across the disciplines. The first level of variation is the genre differences. Here, different fields require different genres, but we have to clarify the notion of a writing genre itself. Of course, we should not neglect that there are speaking or spoken genres as well. A genre is a text type with fixed, a fixed purpose, a fixed communicative purpose, organizational patterns or the sequences in terms of rhetorical moves or the parts of the text, and also salient features produced in specific social contexts. There are two main issues that we can raise regarding genre variation across the disciplines. The first issue is that Different genres are required in different disciplines. So moving from one discipline to another, we find different text types. A very detailed illustration is provided in this table. You see here uh, some disciplines like English, history, laboratory sciences, engineering, business, and so on, and the related written genres or text types. We take, for instance, uh, the discipline of Eng English studies, literary analysis, rhetorical analysis, research paper, argument, definition, essay, evaluation, and so on. We take a business, uh, the business context or the discipline of business. We have uh, writers have to produce a press release, a cover letter, a resume, a memo, a proposal, a PowerPoint presentation, a business plan, and so on. So uh, the writers have uh, are required to produce different types of texts. This dissimilarity in text types 
is related to the dissimilarity in specific communicative functions in given rhetorical contexts. So it's the situation that imposes on the writer the production of a given type of text. The second issue regarding genre differences is about the existence of the genre but the internal difference across the disciplines. We mean here that different fields may have the same genre labels or names, but with the discipline specific textual characteristics. For instance, we may find a lab report in psychology and a lab report in engineering. If we examine profoundly the structure of the, uh, the two, the two uh, uh, texts in both disciplines, we'll discover that there are internal differences. Because different genre labels have different realizations, we have to focus on differences in textual characteristics. The first uh, type of uh, dissimilarity in textual characteristics is the objective of writing or the communicative purpose. In fact, this is the source of all variation. Uh, differences in the objectives will lead uh, directly to differences in the rhetorical organization. Genre analysis relies heavily on the identification of moves in the communicative event or the stages in the unfolding of the social process. There are conventional ways of doing this in each discipline. Uh, to illustrate, Nissi and Gardner 2012 have analyzed the move structure or the rhetorical organization of a lab report in physics and food sciences. They have found that in physics, the lab report contains the following sequence, introduction, experimental details, results, and discussion. While in food sciences, the lab uh, report contains the objective, the introduction, method, results, calculation, and discuss discussion. Here we say that there are different moves or different sequences in each text. The next level is grammar uh, conventions. A good example is the use of the passive voice in scientific writing. Also the use of very complex noun phrases in this type of writing, the use of plain language in legal writing and so on. Another level is persuasiveness. Communities have different ideas about what is worth communicating, how it can be communicated, what readers are likely to know, how they might be persuaded, and so on. For instance, we take persuasion in, uh, in the sciences. This is uh, dependent on experimentation as a proof. While in the humanities, this is dependent on the strength of the argument. In addition to this, there are different conventions on valued processes. Uh, here, there are differences in what is valued across disciplines. For instance, the, the humanities and social sciences value analyzing and synthesizing information from many resources, while the sciences and technology courses uh, value activity-based skills like describing procedures, defining objects, planning solutions, all this is uh, reflected in, uh, on writing. Another level is the different conventions in citation styles. The various disciplines adhere to uh, various models of citation, like the APA, the MLA, the Chicago style, and so on. So because the citation styles are different, the writers uh, in a, uh, will produce uh, texts uh, by following different conventions. Another major difference between the disciplines is found at the level of lexis or the jargon. Each discipline organizes its vocabulary in a certain way and possesses a set of technical terms which cannot be found in another discipline. This is the jargon. 
Finally, in addition to all such dissimilarities, we can also notice that disciplines vary in the desired or the uh, required degree of formality. Uh, for instance, moving from humanities to sciences to legal language, uh, different degrees of formality are required. And this involves also different degrees of writer's impartiality. On the basis of all these, uh, we can say that uh, in conclusion, we state that are academic writing specific. influences and is influenced by the discipline where it occurs. The representations that writers employ to produce and comprehend texts are sensitive to the practices of their disciplinary discourse communities. Writers follow dissimilar conventions governing textual generic structures, discourse features, and stylistic preferences. Disciplines, in fact, have a shaping force exerted on writing. Research on disciplinary academic writing is getting richer and richer. More aspects, in addition to those that I have mentioned previously, of variation are being scrutinized. For example, the methods of praise and criticism in each discipline. The methods of establishing credibility in texts. Hedging, metadiscourse markers, engagement resources, macrostructures, topois, and so on. These constitute perspectives for future research. Whole research collections are being published. An example is uh, the book published by Isa and Drid, 2020, uh, to provide as much detail as possible about disciplinary divergences. The aim is always to raise awareness of what is special about writing in each established field. I come now to the implications of uh, this uh, discussion. Research into disciplinary academic writing has two implications, theoretically and practically. Theoretically, it has begun to provide important insights into the structures and meanings of texts in a range of fields and to show how different academic contexts place demands on communicative behaviors which are likely to be unfamiliar to disciplinary novices. This is a major addition to written discourse research. Practically, training in academic writing or teaching academic writing becomes a process of raising students' consciousness of the choices they can make and the consequences of making those choices in particular contexts. It is extremely useful now to move academic writing instruction towards the socio-cultural realities of university settings. The learners in content areas should be assisted to explore authentic examples of pertinent genres in their disciplines and to make choices informed by professional frameworks. In addition, academic writing materials, materials designers, ought to orient the textbooks to the communicative demands of each discipline. Now it's high time to produce academic writing uh, textbooks which are discipline specific. Through this paper, we have attempted to pinpoint a number of researchable areas in uh, writing in the disciplines. It is hoped that this would stimulate empirical studies to substantiate the major axes highlighted in this presentation with concrete evidence. It is also hoped that in the Algerian university content fields, there should be a shift in English academic writing instruction materials from mere teaching of core skills or the common skills to the teaching of discipline-specific skills based on specialized academic courses and textbooks. This is the list of references. Thank you for listening. Welcome back. Right. So uh, the first two presentations were uh, about uh, scholarly publication, academic writing, always within the realm of academic writing, 
But now focusing on the strategies and the pedagogies that can be employed by teachers, the rest of presentations will each uh, focus on a certain strategy. Uh, now we immediately, uh, uh, I mean, uh, display the presentation of uh, Dr. Nadia Gunen from Saida University, which is titled The Use of Gardner's Multiple Intelligence Theory to Develop Students' Note-Taking in Writing the Literature Review Section the case of first year EFL master students at Saida University. This is connected to the first, uh, to the second paper in that it focuses on one particular genre. سنين الى يوم الدين اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما نافعا امين يا رب العالمين in fact i'm very honored to participate on the first international virtual conference on between perspectives and challenges we investigate in the reality of the english language which is organized by world university my thanks go to the conference chair dr halim and the conference committee and all persons uh, who helped in bringing this event into light I hope that we will present fruitful research work that will contribute to the teaching and learning of the English language in all fields of research. So I'm going to participate with a, a paper which is entitled The Use of Gardner's Multiple Intelligence Theory to Develop Students Now Taking and Writing the Literature Review Section by Taking the First Year EFL Master's Students at Saida University as a case in point. So we all know that researchers in the last few decades turned their attention towards uh, approaches that develop the student's linguistic and thinking skills like the bonus, the six thinking hats, and Gardner's multiple intelligence. And some studies were interested in boosting students' writing in relation to their thinking skills, while others were more concerned with speaking or listening skills. However, these studies did not provide detailed techniques on how to develop uh, linguistic skills with the students' thinking skills. And although the approach was employed to teach children, since it makes the learning process more enjoyable, most of the studies which adopted the approach to teaching English are at the university level, focused on how it is employed in the teaching process in general. To the researcher's knowledge, now studies employ the approach to improve students' academic writing skills, mainly in developing students' note-taking techniques uh, while writing the literature review section. Hence, the researcher's main aim is to develop the student's thinking skills with their writing competence, mainly in dissertation and writing through implementing a classroom environment that favors thinking and practice. To solve the research problem and reach the aim of the study, the following research questions spring from the previous objective. How can multiple intelligence improve students' thinking skills? Secondly, how can multiple intelligence boost students' writing skills? And finally, how can multiple intelligence help students in mastering the note-taking technique? To the researcher's knowledge, few studies were conducted on how to use linguistic intelligence in developing students' note-taking. And the significance of this research is to provide ways to help students in taking notes and organize their uh, writings, mainly writing the literature review section. As far as the research instruments are concerned, so the researcher adopted Armstrong's 2009 and Yumi's 2011 journal writing technique in which students can conduct previous studies that have so, uh, come across uh, through reading different sources. To take notes, students have to follow what is called mind mapping, which is also technique in writing. This technique stresses the point that through brainstorming, students can search for a way that helps them to brainstorm about their topics, to take notes for uh, the methods, uh, and for the methods the researcher selected both uh, dependent and independent variables. Independent variables uh, include what teaching techniques and students' linguistic intelligence. For the dependent uh, variable, we have note taken and reading strategies. And the researcher employed a pre-test and post-test and selected 39 EFL master students from uh, first year level uh, during the first semester of the academic year 2019-2020. As far as the findings are concerned, so we will start with the findings of the pre-test, mainly the reading test, and it was found that 
and there is little background of the four variables as you can see uh, since they were used separately and to read different sources, students were not given the appropriate reading strategies. But when it comes to note-taking technique, as you can see, it scores the lowest percentage. We will go now to note-taking tests, and uh, we have found that it, that students' knowledge of note-taking and its use is limited to identifying and remembering key points and help recall concentration. They didn't know that note-taking is also used to connect sources and avoid plagiarism. We move on now to the results of the post test and it was found that the reading competence has developed after they used these strategies and linked them to note-taking techniques and students succeeded in monitoring comprehension. The teacher focused on developing her students' metacognitive strategies, that is to say, they started uh, here they started to have control over their reading. They also learned to identify the purpose behind reading. For the this test, as you can see, uh, it just found that students' level in taking notes through mastering its techniques uh, has improved after the experiment. They learned that asking questions while reading and taking notes is essential. They also learned that the main aim of reading different sources is to get the agreement with the agreement of scholars to give a good synthesis. Most importantly, they also learned how to level, level, uh, sorry, to level all the gathered notes by using their critical thinking for the post test. So for the post test, uh, here mainly to develop students' linguistic intelligence, it was found that students' linguistic intelligence has developed in relation to their note-taking techniques and writing strategies. This is why students need to use different strategies to be motivated to read, write, and cite. And this thinking skills is also found through reading the different notes. Uh, taken by students and when it comes to interpreting the language and uh, the appropriate here the, and the interpreting the language the appropriate uh, uh, way of cite citing and mastering uh, academic writing techniques here the researcher felt that students need to improve their ability in synthesizing in paraphrasing quoting and summarizing we move on now to the discussion of the main findings, so we have summarized them in the following points. So, regarding the use of the note-taking technique and writing literature review section, the students were introduced to different steps of note-taking in terms of checking sources to get agreement and disagreement among writers. It uh, also helps students to use their thinking, uh, mainly the critical thinking skills, during the reading process. and it also also found that to apply the note-taking technique in writing the literature, the student should have a background knowledge of the different reading strategies and learning the different reading strategies during the first years of learning any foreign language because students need to be familiar with the cultural background of the text. Hence, students who did not develop their reading uh, competence found it difficult to read published works and techniques. In the end, it can be concluded that there is a relationship between developing the student's linguistic competence, reading strategies, and note-taking technique. And this means that uh, students with high linguistic intelligence should also improve their reading competence since these variables are interrelated. Besides, students who did not master the reading strategies were not able to take notes and use its techniques in writing the literature review section. Hence, the, uh, here the teacher should focus on developing the student's uh, thinking skills before uh, teaching them how to take notes by choosing the appropriate teaching methods. In the end, one can say that uh, the worth of reading is to be measured by what you can carry away and select through using your linguistic intelligence and the fruit of these intertwined arts is to master the act of selecting and note taking. In the end, thank you very much for your considerable attention. Thank you, Dr. Nadia Bunan, for this very interesting uh, study on uh, one of the techniques uh, that can help in improving uh, writing. 
uh, always within the same uh, sphere of research. Uh, we have a presentation by uh, Dr. Sabrina Wiltsi-Buzian uh, Wiltsi from Mostaganem University, uh, which focuses on another uh, method that can be used by the teachers to improve or to enhance the writing skill. The paper is titled, uh, it is high time teachers thought about writing differently in the classroom, a shift from product-based approach to process-based approach. So the focus now is on the process-based approach. Uh, we have the presentation. Good day, everyone, and thank you so much for accepting my participation. The International Conference on the Linguistic Policy in the World, Perspectives and Challenges, Reinvestigating the Reality of the English Language, Wurgla, Algeria. The title of my presentation is, It is High Time teachers thought about writing differently in the classroom, a shift from product-based approach to process-based approach. Before delving into this, I'd like first to enunciate the reasons that induced me to embrace this topic. While well, my impetus stems from my experience all along the years of teaching written expression module for second year students while asking them to write different kinds of paragraphs was the gist of the whole syllabus. I used to teach them what to write in any type of paragraph through following a specific model and the objective was to achieve clear, correct and meaningful uh, paragraphs, leaving aside how to make writing interesting and how to assist learners in that process. However, following such a method blindly was not enough to achieve better results. Therefore, a shift from asking students how to write instead of, instead of what to write has been my main concern. I started pondering about new teaching methods uh, that help them or assist learners and immerse them into being autonomous and self-dependent de and reliant in composing through following the process-based approach. The study addresses the issue of how to improve learners' ability to think effectively in English and structure their ideas in writing. Many students at the Intensive Language Teaching Center of Masaganem lack the basic skills in writing as well as motivation. They exhibit flaws, struggle with organizing ideas, developing the topic sentence, writing details to support it, facing problems with grammar, punctuation, and vocabulary use. But more importantly, all that uh, they need to, uh, all that they need is the necessary strategies and adequate uh, approaches to practice and become proficient writers. Thus, teaching writing, which focuses on the process rather than only the product approach, is an example of a recent paradigm shift. The study addresses the following research questions. How can shifting from product-based approach to process-based approach help learners write better compositions? Two, is there any significant difference between pre- and post-writing paragraphs? And how do students react to its process-based approach? The following hypotheses are tested. Process-based approach helps learners enhance their paragraph writings. There is a significant difference between pre- and post-test writing assignments, especially with regard to accuracy, cohesion and coherence, and mechanical accuracy. And finally, students have positive attitudes towards process-based approach. Before presenting the results, I'd like first to explain the development of different approaches in writing, which is really a challenging and multifaceted process. Starting with the product-based uh, uh, approach, which has been labeled differently as the free approach and the text-based or the controlled to free approach and the text-based approach. As admitted by uh, Pinkas, this approach or the product approach 
uh, is primarily about concerned about linguistic knowledge with attention focused on the appro appro appropriate use of vocabulary, syntax, and cohesive devices. Thus, this approach is uh, a teacher-centered and it is the traditional way of teaching written expression. Moreover, it mainly stresses the grammatical and syntactical the grammatical and syntactical forms through the use of modal paragraph. This approach was superseded by another one, which is the process approach. During the 1970s and 1980s, researchers started to question the product approach and consider writing as a combination of a wide range of processes. As illustrated by Badger and White, uh, writing uh, uh, in process approaches is seen as predominantly to do with linguistic skills, such as planning and drafting, and there is much less emphasis on linguistic knowledge, such, such as knowledge about grammar and text structure. This approach goes through different stages, namely planning, drafting, revising, and editing. Moreover, according to Steele, process approach model uh, includes eight stages. They are brainstorming, planning, mind mapping, writing the first draft, pair feedback, editing, writing the final draft, and teacher's uh, uh, feedback. However, the question to be asked is which approach must be used? Both approaches have their benefits and drawbacks. Therefore, teachers should be biased towards using the eclectic approach where blending process and product approaches is evidently required. To conduct this study, the sample consisted of 30 intermediate learners enrolled at the Intensive Language Teaching Center of Mostaganem University during the academic year 2019-2020. They all admitted that writing is a challenging task. Their deficiencies lie in grammar, generalization of ideas, and translation from Arabic to uh, English. The main instruments used in this study were pre- and post-test writing samples. Two procedures were followed. The first dealt with testing students' paragraph writings before process-based uh, approach integration and the second examines students' writing, writing after the approach implementation. Students were asked to write a 10 lines argumentative paragraph. During the pretest uh, writing task, learners were given a model of argumentative paragraph to follow. They were asked to behave like having an exam. Therefore, they were discouraged from uh, discussing with each other since this is deemed as an important ingredient of cooperative writing strategies and the process approach. After the, the submission of their paragraphs to the, teachers, to the teacher, I marked them and provided students with feedback that mainly focused on grammar, vocabulary, punctuation, organization, ideas, unity, and coherence. Each student received comments on his or her paragraph in the, in the next writing session and discussed about them with the teacher in front of the whole class. Students were supposed to write cohesive and coherent paragraphs which was not the case since the no strategies were used. The results were scored and used in order to or and uh, analyzed in order to be compared to the post-test writing results. Post-test writing assignments included process-based approach which took two weeks to complete. Therefore, to achieve this successfully, I asked students first to form groups so that they worked cooperatively together through or throughout the first three stages of the process approach, namely brainstorming, planning, and mind mapping. Students were immensely involved in the writing task through generating ideas about the topic, then selecting the most important ones to include in the paragraph by forming an outline that guided them. 
After that came the writing stage where each student took a piece of paper and wrote his or her own first draft paragraph based on the outline formed by the group. Then they moved to peer feedback stage where students again worked collegially to correct their draft based on the writing rubrics given by the teacher. Such, such collegiality has created an interpersonal inter atmosphere, a network of social learning support and uh, uh, support, uh, and students have shared and exchanged their writing paragraphs with their peers to receive positive or negative feedback. The sixth stage involved editing their draft according to their peers' correction. Then, and for the last time, students wrote their final paragraphs so that they gave to the teacher for an ultimate feedback. After receiving feedback from the teacher, students gained self-confidence in writing and were willing to read their paragraphs to the whole class. To analyze students' paragraph writings and samples, quantitative analyses were used following the Common European Framework of Reference writing rubrics, which involve uh, relevance of content, organization, cohesion and coherence, language accuracy, presentation, and mechanical accuracy. They were scored on five point scale as five for excellent. 4 for very good, 3 for good, 2 satisfactory, 1 poor, and 0 inadequate. The following table indicates the percentage for each writing rubric. As it is seen, a significant increase was found when calculating all rubrics, starting with the first rubric which gauges students' ability to write clearly about one topic without digression, which has to do with the relevance of content. For many students, this domain is considered uh, somehow difficult to keep up. It also covers the supporting arguments and details students provide in their piece of writing and whether the topic and concluding sentences are adequately stated. As the result shows, uh, during the pretest students Percentage was 33.3%, while in post test, students' percentage was 35.4%. There wasn't much difference. The second rubric is organization. It refers to students' ability to organize their writing in a logical and ordered manner. It also focuses on the shape of the paragraph and whether all the ingredients of paragraph writing development are included. During pretest, student percentage was weak, 11.7. However, post-test percentage was high, 28.8%. The third rubric is cohesion and coherence. They refer to the smooth transition of ideas and to, co to cohesive devices and discourse markers that make up the text. The results show that post-test writing paragraphs or percentage 30.3% uh, was, was higher than the pretest 10.5%. Uh, the fourth rubric is language accuracy. This involves spelling words correctly using proper tenses, vocabulary use style that refers to using a variety of polished words, well structured sentences to catch the reader's eyes and the use of appropriate register related to the topic and the target audience. It will show that a student's writing achievement in this domain increased after process approach implementation 24.9% uh, as indicated in this table compared to pretest results which were only 9.6%. The last rubric is presentation and mechanical accuracy, which includes uh, indentation, punctuation, and capitalization. Students' pretest percentage score was 11.4%, however, post test scores improved to 27%. Having collected the data, I went through the process of their analysis and cater for. Uh, or came up with uh, the findings. Intermediate post-test scores were higher than pretest 
scores. The results indicated that the enhancement in writing performance was due to the implementation of process-based approach. Not only did this approach have a positive effect on learners' writings, it also led students to be, to be self-dependent, self-directed, and autonomous. Therefore, the study shows this the show show that students training in writing using the process approach can be effective. It led to an improvement in self motivation, determination and positive attitudes. It is worth mentioning that Nearly all participants improved their writing skill in English, especially regarding language accuracy, cohesion and coherence, and mechanical accuracy. Obviously, participants needed guidance with clearly and explicitly taught strategies on how to construct a paragraph. Therefore, working cooperatively, sharing and generating ideas provided opportunities to boost up writing as they continuously learn from each other. They were also able to share the co content of their thoughts, structure their ideas, and outstandingly gain knowledge from each other. Participants did much collaboration and interaction during planning organizing and revising strategies. Thus, they improved their English communication as well. To conclude, it is worth stressing that these finding, findings will be of indispensable significance of EFL learners and educa educators in general and the Algerian context precisely. Teaching English in Algeria is still product-oriented. Along these lines, the results of this examination attempt to draw the consideration of instructors to focus on the process of writing in general and composing techniques in particular, enable their students to produce clear and coherent piece of writing and raise their perception about the advantages of utilizing different writing strategies to make easy the process of writing their assignments. The findings of this investigation cater, cater for insights into the many-sided qualities of writing as a process and feature the writing difficulties of EFL learners and the Algerian most specifically. Thus, they may carry solid implications for the field of teaching methods and composing guidelines. And thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabrina Wiltsi Buzian, for this very interesting discussion on the introduction of the process based approach to enhance the learning of the writing skill. One remark is that the tendency, your tendency in this presentation, was all about developing the common core in academic writing, while we have a, con a real controversy. Uh, concerning the teaching of the writing skill itself or the teaching of the common core or finally the teaching of discipline specific skills of uh, writing. We come now to the last presentation in this session which will be presented by Dr. Radia Bougibs from LUNS uh, Constantin and Dr. Nedia Idri from Bijaya University titled Fostering Critical Thinking skills via flipped learning approach to a writing course design teachers and students perception here again we have uh, another uh, proposal concerning the teaching strategies now the pre Critical thinking skills via a flipped learning approach to writing course design. Teachers and students perception presented by Dr. Radia Bugas from the NSR Constantine. The ability to think and reason critically is a necessary skill that EFL teachers at tertiary level try to develop in their students. Higher education environments have witnessed the introduction of a new online pedagogies, the flipped learning approach. Another facet of blended learning that makes an efficient use of a class time offers a teaching learning environment that enhances students' learning outcome. 
By a teaching learning process based on reverse taxonomy, flipped learning can more likely offer you for learners the possibility to develop their critical thinking skills. What is that flipped learning? It is a specific type of blended learning design that uses technology to move lectures outside the classroom and use pre-learning activities to move practice with concepts inside the classroom. Why flipping courses? It offers a successful mix. It combines the best of both face-to-face -face and online strategies to create an innovative and effective learning experience for students. Active learning by involving students during face-to-face -face classroom in discussion analysis by asynchronous communication. Personalization as a course characteristics. It accommodates students who have different expertise level, prefer different learning strategies, and who are self-directed learners. It enables students to take a full responsibility of their own learning and becomes motivated and more engaged. Flipped learning is a goal-oriented Active learning in a flipped learning promotes development in critical thinking and overall learning achievement. Flipped learning promotes students' critical thinking growth. Via a reverse taxonomy, as the lot cognitive levels of learning are targeted outside the classroom time via watching online videos, reading materials, and introducing students to related basic knowledge before getting to the class. Once in class, the teacher could easily supervise the progress of the higher order thinking skills as it is displayed in the draft. When putting flipped learning classroom into practice, we are involved to know about its three main phases. The pre-class instruction, teacher uploads an online recorded lecture that is to be viewed by learner at home where basic knowledge is to be developed via the class session. The in-class instruction involves or is devoted to engaging learner in deep analysis and evaluation of this newly acquired information. The post-class instruction expanding their learning by transferring it to new situation out of the classroom walls would mark the post-classroom activities. Adopting new roles in a flipped learning, as far as the teacher is concerned, he is always a course designer and a material provider, yet pre-assessing students and ascending to the course content is a new role added. Preparing in-class activities that promote higher order thinking growth is another activity and providing immediate feedback when necessary. For the learner, he is requested to acquire the new content knowledge prior to coming to the class. Watch online lectures and collaborate in online discussion. Carry out research at home while engaging in concepts in the classroom with the guidance of the mentor. This study, or through this study, we attempt to examine teacher and students' knowledge about flipped learning model, classroom time redesign, course objective instruction, teachers and learners' new rules. We wanted also to diagnose teachers' awareness towards the utility of flipped learning pedagogy in improving student thinking and reasoning abilities, mainly when writing argumentative essays, to determine the difficulties both teachers and students face during flipped learning writing course design and what would facilitate the implementation of this type of courses. We adopted the mixed research design based on a quantitative qualitative data analysis procedure relying on two research tools, questionnaire and interview. The questionnaire finding revealed the following. More than two-thirds of the respondents have no knowledge about flipped learning model, yet they confirm learning writing through this pedagogy during and after COVID-19. The majority of the informant displayed a positive attitude towards the flipped learning course design as it is displayed via this graph. Moreover, flipped learning writing course main benefits. They confirm that this pedagogy releases them from classroom time pressure. It could be they could take full responsibility of their own learning, could have access to lectures at any time, have more classroom writing practice. They, in class, problem solving activities could help them to enhance their critical thinking and they could receive more feedback from their teacher. All in all, the characteristic of the learning writing course could improve writing skills, critical thinking, and learning outcome in general. They encountered problems. 
An awareness of the importance of the pre-learning phase is one major obstacle for learners. Attending classroom with insufficient understanding is another problem they face. They confirm that the need for more explanation before starting in class activities. Difficulties in grasping the online input videos and recording is another difficulty they face. They are not used to learn by themselves and poor internet access is a major difficulty. As far as teachers are concerned, the use of computer or internet mediated platforms in courses enhances the quality of instruction and enriches critical thinking skills of the learner. One teacher says that via manipulating different educational platforms. The overall quality of teaching and learning can be improved and students' critical thinking can also be enhanced since they will develop a new attitude of clear purpose for learning and make efforts to learn. Another teacher added that students will become self-guided, self-disciplined, goal-oriented in the learning process. Another teacher via the ICTs or the ICTs could provide both teachers and learners more opportunities to focus on developing new skills because of the facilities offered by these tools. The flipped learning model course design enables learners to manifest higher order thinking processes such as analyze, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating under the instructor's control. One teacher, for one teacher, this is true because the whole focus and time of the teacher in flipped learning is on developing higher order thinking skills and not on the mere delivery of the course information and content. One teacher finds that when students come to the class having some idea about what the teacher will talk about, and after making some reading prior to the face-to-face -face lesson, they could easily discuss and express their thoughts in the class. Another, for another teacher, when sufficient knowledge is provided for learners at home by e-learning instruction and by making sure that this new learning is well grasped, the student higher order thinking process and skills growth could be supervised. What is challenging? Flipped learning stages are interrelated. One stage completes the other. And this is the real challenge for teachers to create the smooth move from one stage to the other, confirms one teacher. For another teacher, flipped learning course design requires time, efforts and, for and focus in order to achieve certain predetermined teacher learning goals and objectives. Preparing online short videos is another challenge. For the pre-learning phase is demanding certain new skills from the teacher which is in most cases a hard task to uh, fulfill. Coming to class and prepared may stand as a major obstacle that hinders rather than advances the progress of the course, uh, confirms one uh, teacher. Teachers uh, suggest the following, raise teacher and students awareness towards the benefits of uh, this uh, pedagogy, uh, posting online videos with necessary explanation before a classroom session, while in the classroom ensuring that learners are uh, exchanging their ideas, negotiating many through conferencing, self-evaluating and reflecting, keep students motiv motivated and familiar with technology via training uh, learners on how to learn via flipped classroom, solve the problem of poor internet connectivity. To facilitate the implementation of the course, the researchers suggest the following. Recording online videos seems requiring certain additional skill from the teacher. In this case, they could rely on Redia or on also other sources that are Redia and presented via the net. To engage safely in face to face instruction, students should be asked to complete a pre class test or a survey to ensure that they have sufficient understanding before they engage in the classroom activities. To develop the notion of doing at home preparations, which is a prerequisite for a deep in class learning experience, students should be provided with incentives such as earning points for completion of a quiz. All in all, the need for a teaching pedagogy that could develop EFL students' critical thinking skills makes from a flipped learning model the most they wanted. When properly implemented, flipped learning could bring solutions to EFL teachers of writing as this pedagogy provides more time and space for instruction and evaluating. To uh, 
overcome with the major teacher learning challenges, EFL teachers are requested not only to develop the knowledge about flipped learning pedagogy, but also to carefully consider researchers' recommendations on how to overcome the main challenges when flipping courses. Thanks for your attention. Well, I thank the presenters for the innovative ideas they have uh, underlined through this rich array of empirical and theoretical papers. Uh, I say that writing remains the most difficult skill to learn and uh, to teach for, for sure. Now I invite my colleagues who are uh, on, the, on this panel to contribute to the debate I have received a set of uh, questions and sometimes some comments. Uh, well, let me just read some of them and initiate the debate. Uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Dr. Nadia Idri to uh, Amina, uh, to Dr. Amina Abdel Hadi. Uh, what are the most common difficulties facing EFL students in writing research articles? So, uh, Dr. Amin Abdel Hadi, are you with us? Amin Abdel Hadi, please, can you raise your hand so that we can see, we, de we can detect you on the screen? Amina? I uh, move on. Well, Amina, if you are here, you just join us and raise your hand so that we can give you the floor. I move on to another question. Uh, again, it's by Dr. Uh, Idri to Amin Abdel Hadi. EAP topic is crucial. However, the main problem is in teaching English itself. We teach general and not academic English. We send master graduates to teach it in non-English departments. What do you think of a needs analysis question, a questionnaire to prepare an appropriate content to each speciality? Here I comment, this is uh, at the heart of what I was talking about in my presentation, moving the teaching of academic writing from uh, focusing on the common core or the general core to a discipline specific, uh, discipline specific skills. So is Amina with us? Uh, yeah, where is she? Hmm? She's not, right. So um, I have a question to uh, Dr. Sabrina Wolsi Bouzian. Uh, you have talked about the process uh, approach. Do you think that we have to limit ourselves as teachers of writing only to one single approach? Why not hybrid approaches? Sabrina, Dr. Sabrina, are you with us? Can you raise your hand so that we can see you on the screen? Again, Sabrina is not with us, I guess. Well, now I invite, before continuing with the rest of questions, I invite my colleagues who are with us to give comments if they uh, would like. Yeah. Would you like to give comments? Uh, Dr. Nadia Gunen and uh, Dr. Radia Bugebs or Dr. Nadia Idri, if you have comments, I can give you the floor. You can open to all, all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can give your comments in live mode. So would you like to join us giving your comments? Uh, can I say words? Yes, Dr. Radia Bugeps, welcome yes. uh, again. Thank you. Floor Thank is you yours. Very Mm -hmm. <laughs> actually, actually, I'm in a classroom. I'm teaching. <laughs> I'm giving a break for my students. Yes. Uh, While well, you were uh, saying, or we're talking about uh, why why hybrid uh, teaching. Okay. Uh, being a teacher of writing, and we know that uh, writing uh, or teacher of writing is uh, a difficult task. And mainly, the main concern of teachers of writing is one. Uh, uh, to give feedback, when to supervise learners' performances. Actually, all students writing, writing is completed at home. So here we need, we need 
the more class time for supervising learners or the students writing progress. So a hybrid teaching or benefiting from the ICTs could help us with issues of writing to uh, gain more time, gain more time for feedback, more time for uh, developing critical uh, thinking. Uh, so here, all what we need is time. And uh, via uh, flipped learning or via hybrid uh, teaching, uh, whether it is blended or whatever we want, we can gain time. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I've seen a question here raised as far as my presentation was concerned. From where do we have materials that fit the flipped classroom? Well, here I can say that all the net or okay, the net uh, is offering us some interesting videos on how to uh, present some mini lectures. So this uh, any any video any video could help. It could help us, I mean, if it is, of course, uh, downloaded and then uploaded, that, uploaded to learners. Uh, if this video offers a mini lecture, it is a short video, uh, it could provide instruction so that uh, learners could attend the classroom with sufficient understanding of what we are going to deal with. So this will be something that will help us to reach our objective. Yeah, one question, Dr. Radia Bugebs. Do yes, you think okay. that the pre-class activities are sufficient or they have to be supported by uh, further uh, practice in class? And here again, we are moving to the traditional classroom. What do you think? Well, uh, I will explain, okay, I will explain this point. So here, uh, if you notice that uh, the flipped classroom is based on the reverse of the taxonomy, where the lower order thinking skills of are developed as now. So here, if we focus, or the teacher focuses attention only on developing the higher order thinking, mainly application, force analysis, uh, evaluation, and synthesis, all those skills are developed in the classroom. So here, I think the teacher, the teacher will, of course, bring more. He will bring more to the classroom, and uh, all the activities debated and dealt with in the classroom are. Uh, or target, so target the development of the higher order thinking skills. Uh, I right. think we cannot get rid of the traditional class. Well, uh, whatever, whatever, okay, whatever we are uh, saying, whatever we are bringing, but still uh, the uh, role of the teacher is uh, of a great importance in a writing class. It is crucial. In fact, we feel this, especially during this period of the pandemic, when we post videos uh, to be watched by the learners, the learner himself cannot act independently. He needs support from the teacher at another stage. So what is important, I guess, is to follow the flipped learning uh, uh, methodology in a structured manner and not in a free manner. It's not just a matter of reversing the, uh, the stages of, uh, uh, of teaching. It's a matter of following well-defined uh, steps in this uh, strategy. Thank you, Dr. Radia Bougebs. You're welcome. We have a question for you, Dr. Radia, again. Do you think that there are uh, any good sites to download materials through flipped learning for first-year students in writing? We need well, some guidance think, on your part. Yeah, yeah well... Uh... YouTube, okay, YouTube is offering, we teachers, okay, uh, some uh, easy videos explaining mainly for how, for example, to write a paragraph, how to write descriptive paragraph, different types of paragraph. So uh, those the short videos, I insist on the, that the video should be short, okay, because and the short, more it is yeah, short, short, yeah, it should be short and uh, have got some specific or help us to achieve the objective. All what we need is well, are the, the objective we want to achieve via uh, a given video. If we determine and state the objectives adequately, we can find via the net uh, a various number or a variety of videos. Sure, okay. we have abandoned, abandoned materials which are on the net. It's just yeah. a matter of selecting what is most, most pertinent for a given group and a precise group of yeah. learners. Yeah, it's sure. a matter of adapting things to our own uh, context. Thank sure. you, Dr. Uh, yeah. uh, now I see that uh, Dr. Uh, Nadia Idri would like to say something. So the floor is yours. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Just uh, we should fix the problem. Uh, Dr. Nadia Idri here. 
here, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay now. So right. good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure sharing this, this nice experience with you. Uh, well, I carry on what Radia was saying about the flipped classroom and, and employing an, uh, a hybrid methodology while teaching. Uh, as you know, we were obliged to shift to flipped classrooms in a sudden. Uh, hmm. yeah. We can't hear. We, can, we cannot follow. There is a rupture. Okay. Uh -huh. Is right. it all right now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So uh, I, I repeat myself. So you know that with the pandemic, we were obliged to move to the, to the uh, flipped classroom in a sudden without hybrid methodology. And we noticed many of the problems, mainly in some of the subjects. But uh, as uh, asking the questions for a hybrid classroom, I do not agree using the word traditional classroom. It's a face-to-face -face class. Because when you right. say traditional, right. It means that we are using traditional ways of teaching. We can use a face-to-face -face classroom in order to apply the practice, practice stage of the lesson plan. So what mm -hmm. we need to do in the flipped classroom is to prepare the ground for the student, to um, provide the appropriate materials for the students, like videos, like audios, like um, the uh, summary of the lesson, S some uh, questions to ask and debate in the classroom. And we follow them using other techniques, like uh, uh, the forum discussions that we have in the Moodle. The Moodle. Uh, in the practice stage, so we have limited period of time when meeting our students face to face uh, this year. So we meet them once a week. Once a week, we'll be only asking their questions. We can have questions and answers. We can have the application of the activities. We can have a debate, a discussion, focus groups in order to put theory into practice. So the students in this way will be, uh, will gain in different ways. First, he will develop his skills. By his own, by his own, as he, to develop his learner autonomy, so he'll be more autonomous compared to a student who is all the time in front of his teacher. But in the hybrid way of teaching, we will have the possibility to just practice what we sent uh, via the flipped classroom. And in this case, I think that uh, the results will be better in case we do not have a resistance to change by the students and the teachers themselves. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I do agree with you. It's a matter of developing uh, uh, learner autonomy before any other uh, uh, thing. Because as a teacher of writing for more than uh, 20 years, I believe that if the learner is not equipped with the right skills, they cannot uh, in, uh, act independently. It's not a matter of finishing a program or spoon feeding. It's a matter of developing special skills of uh, writing. Uh, there's a question. Uh, from Wilti um, Buzien, uh, Sabrina, to me, uh, she said, I used to teach in an intensive language center. I use headway books, however, it is boring. I prepared needs analysis for all levels. I admit that needs analysis uh, are compulsory. This is, in fact, a comment. In fact, needs analysis are the core of designing uh, uh, courses and especially uh, specialized courses. And when it comes to writing, this should be the starting point. Otherwise, teaching writing would miss the point because especially in these intensive uh, 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 intensive language centers, uh, the, uh, the learners come from a variety of disciplines. And that's why uh, using such books, and of course I'm not uh, criticizing the textbooks themselves, but I'm trying to make the uh, connection between the, uh, the textbook which is selected and the learner, the specific learner. Because the learners here come from a variety of, dis uh, of disciplines, they have different needs. They need to write for uh, special purposes in special rhetorical situations which require special skills of academic writing and hence we insist on disciplinary academic writing rather than uh, general academic writing. Right. Uh, there's an another question from uh, Dr. Yusra Siddiqui to me. Uh, she, uh, she's asking, is interdisciplinary approach the future, uh, the future of academic research? Is the world becoming more interdisciplinary? Yes, indeed. Now, uh, as I was uh, saying right now, uh, 
we have to shift from designing and using general textbooks of teaching academic writing to discipline specific textbooks of teaching academic writing. For instance, we can have academic writing for uh, medicine doctors, academic writing for pilots, academic writing for, uh, uh, for business and so on. And research is uh, nowadays very rich in this uh, area. Uh, well, we just check the, the timing of this, uh, I mean, for the time allotted of, uh, to this debate, uh, I will um, uh, select another question, uh, which is addressed again to me, right? It's addressed to me, right? Um, how do you measure the mastery of referencing styles? Most errors are related to style, concept use. Yeah, I have said that disciplinary academic writing varies at the level of the citation style. So it has to do with the course which was, which was received. For instance, in uh, the uh, psychological uh, department of psychology or human sciences in general, they follow the APA style. So how was the APA style taught? So it has to do with the way of receiving the conventions, the way of training the students on using the conventions. So if we want to measure the master, we have to first refer to how we teach these uh, citation uh, styles. I hope that I have answered your question, Dr. Uh, Idri. Uh, of course, we have other questions and uh, I just, uh, and they exist in the chat box. I invite the, uh, the ones who have asked them, as well as the participants to stay in contact, uh, in contact in the, um, we call it the waiting room. Huh? Mm -hmm. All right, anyway. So uh, I come now to, the, uh, to close this uh, first panel. It was very interesting and we have really uh, appreciated the contributions of all the participants. Thank you again and see you after a while. Thanks.
Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the second session of the first day of this conference. The second session revolves around literature in the FL classes. Literature as a discipline has been a very important issue to be discussed um, as a matter for teaching and for learning also in the EFL classes. So we start this presentation, uh, sorry, this session with the first presentation by Dr. Adwara Anya Chiblu, and I'm sorry if I am mispronouncing your name, from Lagos University, Nigeria. The presentation is entitled Code Switching and Code Mixing Between Stylistics, a study of two Igbo novels. Title reads Code Alternation in Chimamanda Adichie's The People, The Purple Zibiscus. I wish to share my screen now with you. Language is a tool for communication amongst people as well as literary authors. Literary authors make use of language to communicate their messages to their audience, as well as to create aesthetics, aesthetics and for stylistic effects. Most African literary writers write in the English language as against their various indigenous languages, of which Obi Ajumwa Wali objects to. He opines that Africans writing in non-African languages is just like a person pursuing a dead end. As authors write in a foreign language, they tend to alternate codes. In most cases, they switch to their indigenous languages or other languages to achieve some level of aestheticism or to have access to wider audience or even to uh, export their cultural elements to other regions. The trust of this study is to identify and abstract Igbo words and expressions employed by Adichi, attempt to give the meanings of the rules as well as attempt their, categor their categorization. Chimamanda Adichie's The Purpose Habisco is purposefully selected for this study. The study is analyzed based on the theories of Riska and Roman. We look at the synopsis of the novel. The story of Purpose Habisco is woven around the protagonist, Eugene Achike and his family, both nuclear and extended one. Eugene tries to portray himself as a very devoted and zealous Christian by clinging tenaciously to the observance of the Roman Catholic Rituals, whereas the kinds of treatment that he met out to his wife, children, and aged father were totally in ambivalence to the Christian tenets. For instance, his refusal to take care of Papa Nuku and constant beating of the wife and children are all against Bible ethics. His acts of violence and wickedness to the members of his family result in his tragic death through food poisoning. Adichie exposes and ridicules some of the vices and ills that go on in different aspects of. Nigerian life through the characters in the novel, which are effective use of the language through code alternation. We look at some of the literatures that have been written in code switching. Several authors have written extensively in uh, Chimamanda's purpose hibiscus and even in code alternation, whether code switching or uh, code missing. Code alternation is the act of shifting from one code to another code which is exemplified in code switching, code missing and borrowings. These are linguistic devices employed by bilinguals to express themselves in different codes, given different situations, according to Grozin and Holmes. Code switching is a natural phenomenon in many multilingual societies where speakers use multiple languages with the same interaction, not just to quote, but to interject, specify address, and even reiterate or explain messages. They also use it to express a variety of social psychological affiliations, according to Susan Kay and Simona Montenegro. Then, whereas code mixing on its own part, the use of two languages or more by inserting one language element into another 
language element in one utterance. News can divide codes mixing into three types uh, insertion, alternation, congruence, lexicalism. The use of code switching and code mixing has extended to literary works. We look at the data and its analysis. Chimamanda Adichie employs code in her view to cater for different situations in order to suit the Nigerian environment in her narrative. Adichie engages her characters in switching from standard English to Igbo language and vice versa. One of the characters and informer switches to Igbo language occasionally based on her mood and the prevailing circumstances around her. For example, complaining bitterly about her brother's uh, treatment, that is Ijin, of their father, he, she says, yet Ijin will not let him into his house, will not even greet him or Joker. Ijin has to stop doing God's work. Your Joker simply means it's too bad. So if Ijin is doing God's work, it's better he stop because he's making mockery of God's work when he's, he's busy maltreating the father. Again, why addressing Kamili, whom her cousin and Amaka is for not knowing how to prepare oral leaves? And he former switches from Igbo to English, the switches from English to Igbo, saying, Organe de Kambili, have you no mouth? Talk back to her. So she switches from English to uh, Igbo, saying, Organe de Organe de Simlis, what is wrong with you? Can you not re respond back to your cousin? Adichie employs the stylistic device of code alternation in an interesting manner to her advantage. She portrays the emotional and psychological states of the characters at the time of their utterances through code switching. It is evident that most characters code alternate in anger, in joy, in surprise, out of shock, and others as situations demand. This study attempts to give the meaning of the Igbo words used by Adichie and also to attempt to categorize them into different types of uh, switches or code switches, code missing, as the case may be. The, uh, below are some of the categorization. We have the cultural item-based switches. These are the words or ex Igbo expressions that has to do with culture, Igbo culture. They are cultural elements from Igbo. For example, you have atilogo, which are the chest wrongly spelled. There should be W after G, atilogo, not atilogo. Kambli says of his father's compound, our yard was wide enough to hold a hundred people dancing at a logo. Special enough for each dancer to do the usual somersaults and land on the next dancer's shoulder. So at a logo is one of Igbo cultural dances, one of the dances, cultural dance of the Igbo people, where the dancers climb and somersault while standing on the shoulders of their colleagues. Then you have Ogu. Eugene's wife said, they even said somebody had tied my womb with Ogu. Ogu is just traditional medicine. The Igbo believe that one per somebody can use Ogu to affect another person's life. Then you have an Kambili analyzes their visit to Papa Nuku as Papa Nuku eats. I watched him, the smiles on his face. The easy way he threw the mold muscle, mold molded muscle out towards the garden where Aro Festival. Aro it simply means a calendar. So calendar festivals. Patch helps with swayed in the light breeze, asking Ani and the god of land to eat with him. So, and it means the god of the land, in as much as, and it also means land itself, but it's a deity, and it's a deity in Igbo society. Then you have Imamo, and Tifoma tells Jaja, you didn't do the Imamo, did you? Imamo simply means initiation into the masquerade society. Then we have the one we call pleasantly based, pleasantry based switch. These are the ones the Igbo elements that has to do with greetings as recorded in Adichie's work. Keokwan, Kambili says Keokwan to Jaja as he walked into her room. Keokwan simply means, how are you? None, 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 none means welcome. As Eugene travels to his village with his family during Christmas, the elderly men standing under the grown okwa tree. Okwa means breadfruit. Near our gates waved and shouted, none, none to them. That means welcome, welcome. They were only expressing their welcome, acceptance of their coming back to them. Then you have the word Ndo. Dr. Ndoma said Ndo to all of us. Ndo simply means soul. It's what you say to somebody that has, has, is injured or in mourning or in pain. Then you have the one we categorize as interrogative based switch. These are question words. For example, you have the expression queer. Mama says to Auntie Foma, do you not say that the children were coming very soon, or queer, isn't it? 
or again, Auntie Foma says to her daughter, Amaka, when Amaka accuses her mom of not telling her earlier about the Panuku sickness. Or again, again means, what is it? Makanede, this one is dialect out here. The standard form is Makagene. Um, Makanede simply means, or Makagene simply means for what? Imarazi, Imarazi simply means, don't you know? Then you have Kelkwan, Kelkwan means, how are you? It's also a greeting, a pleasant trivial. Then we also have the one we categorize as songs based, which you notice that in the novel, Adichie brings in some Yubo songs, several of them. Amongst them are Bunyaya in, he broke into an Yubo song. Bunyaya in, Bunyaya simply means lift God up. Come Bunyaya again, let me lift your name high. In Asime Sunaya, are you telling me not to follow him or to worship him? I can include the greeting of peace. My dear sister, my dear brother, give me your hand. Then we have the one we call kizim based, which is this one has to do with food, dishes, the different food that we find in Igbo society. Those of them that are reflected in the love, we have a gusi, which is also wrongly spelled, supposed to be E G W U U S I, a gusi, not a gusi, melon, onubu soup, bitter leaf soup. Often sell a pepper soup, okoroko, stockfish, okwa tree, bread fruit, bread fruit tree, angara, which she, she writes as anara. There's dot on top of the N, garden egg, chunk of azu, fish. Azu means fish, akam means pap, then ube means pear. Then we have the one we refer to address forms based switch. This has to do with the way people are addressed in Igbo society, some of the words used in addressing people in Igbo society as recorded in Adichie's work. Under that address, we also have onomastics and then personal names, I mean, place names and others. So, Kambili narrates the manner her father was welcome as they arrived their village for the Christmas celebration. The men and women all rose when Papa came in and chants of Omelor, feel the air. Omelor simply means a philanthropist, is a title name. His personal name is Eugene. But because of the way that he gives out and reach out to his kinsmen, they now gave him the title Omelor. Then you have Omona. Omona simply means kinsmen. Omom, my children. Ikunne, mother's maiden home. Nnochi, or papa nuku, grandfather. Mwani a good or beautiful woman. Because in Igbo society, beauty does not only apply to physical appearance. In fact, what the Igbo refer as true beauty is the one of character, somebody that has good character. So in the novel, you see that the one, the woman that was referred to as one, uh, the chair made us understand that physically she was not beautiful, but probably by character wise, she was beautiful. That's why she was called one, Yomo. The one and one, my sister, union, my wife, the nonomastic based name, these are names that Igbo have, in Igbo society, names are not just mere tag of identity. They speak volume about the bearers. They could be, give information about the family history, place of birth, family value, situation at birth, marketplaces, and others. For example, Chingo, God owns everything, showing us or telling us that Igbo is of the view that it's God that owns everything. Then it can be just a plea for survival. Probably somebody has been having lots of children or didn't have enough children. He's now praying that God should spare the one that is alive. As in a good mother. Chinyan, God gives, and if the deity wills or supports the child, because and it's a deity in Igbo society, they have shame, and God knows. Chukwoka, God is greater than all. Then in summary, conclusion, Adichie in Popo's hibiscus is able to tactfully bring in Igbo words or expressions to add beauty to her work and also to introduce her readers to the world of her people, the Igbo. The analysis of the study reveals that Adichie's use of Igbo loans is very significant, and the most of the loans are categorizable into pleasantry based switch, cultural based switch, address form based switch, exclamation based switch, and imperative based switch, which will also reflect in the main body of the world. Because of time, we just try to accommodate this little. Adichie, at certain instances, give, gives out the meanings of the Igbo loans, such as Annie, which she says she, uh, give, she gives the meaning as the god of the land. I suddenly wished for him that the, he had done the Emma more. She it gives the meaning as initiation into the spirit world or into the masquerade society. A Kenan Kudo, she gives the meaning as the greeting of peace. My dear sister, my dear brother, give me your hand. Then, no, she also gives the meaning as grandfather. The villager says of Kambili, the girl is her wall. 
she gives the meaning of her work as a fully grown medic. So in the main work, we now give the details of what we are doing. Thank you. I thank you so much for your efforts to elaborate the topic in a very informative way. I believe that authors opt for whether code switching or code mixing for very specific and communicative intentions and that uh, they don't do that haphazardly. That is why it is important to include critical approaches in the teaching of EFL, uh, uh, sorry, of literature for EFL readers so that they, the readers would be able to decipher these intentions. In fact, this is the topic that would be presented in the second presentation entitled The Need of Critical Language Awareness in the EFL Literature Classes by Dr. Khawla Hakoum from the University of Qasim Bah. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Khalil from the University of Qasdim. My presentation today is entitled The Need of Critical Language Awareness in the EFL Literature Classes by Dr. Khalil Hakoum from the University of Qasdim. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Khalil Hakoum from the University of Qasdim. My presentation today is entitled the need of critical language awareness in the EFL literature classes. The differences among people and social groups in their cultural backgrounds, life experiences, gender, religion, ideologies, standards, values, and even the geographical spaces where they belong to. Create the binary of the self versus the other where the perception of the self is really complex. Due to the immense changes at the different levels of power relations, where dominance has not become only economic or military, but also political, cultural and ideological. These Changes and differences are very crucial variables in the EFL class of literature, as students' perception and reception of literary texts is different. So we cannot expect that one student would receive or react to a certain literary text as another student. Since students' construction of meaning is rooted in their, or sorry, is laden with cultural connota connotations, which are based mainly on the differences in their background from each other and also from the writer. Therefore, the introduction of critical approaches in the EFL classes is really paramount and exigent in order to foster the critical thinking for students and also to raise their awareness of the self vis-a-vis -vis the other and also help them recognize the difference. What is awareness? It is important that we define the word awareness before the defining critical language awareness as an approach because it's a key word which should change teacher's perspective towards teaching literature in the EFL class. Awareness is the state of being able to perceive, feel, and to be conscious of events, objects, conditions, and 
and sensory patterns. In other words, aware or to be aware of something means to know and recognize consciously the existence sorry the existence of that thing what is language awareness now language awareness is showing explicit knowledge of and about language it also refers to the conscious perception and sensitivity in language teaching, learning, and use. To put it in different words, language awareness refers to the good knowledge about language and the conscious understanding of how language works. The students of EFL are exposed to read te texts from different writers and from different literatures the african literature the british literature the american literature asian literature african-american literature middle eastern literature and so on that is they read universal literature teachers might be misled that the universality of the literary corpora they select for their classes should result into the universality of meaning among students. Therefore, the students should, or even worse sometimes, they must react either positively or negatively in an ident identical manner. That is to say that all the students in one class should react in the very same way to the same text. Especially when the text deals with uh, themes and issues which are culturally sensitive. So usually the teachers in this case expect that students react in a certain manner which should be identical and typical among all the students. And therefore, in this case, this, the teacher should reconsider the approaches followed in the literature class and should reconsider the role of the learner in the, uh, sorry, in the literature class with regard to his language awareness and then to his critical awareness. This is or this should be done for the sake of enabling the learner to read, react, and then appreciate the literary texts. A better way to engage the students with the literary texts is through fostering in their minds that the production of texts is not the end of itself for a language user. That is to say, that the texts are only means to mediate and represent worldviews, ideologies, and experiences, and also to reflect or to refute a certain reality by a certain writer. Texts are analyzed as an end in themselves within the text analysis approach, but this is not really what an EFL teacher should do with his students, as text analysis approach would not really enable students to critically analyze the literary texts in hand. All what text analysis approach would do is to provide some certain statistics about language or linguistic features in a certain text or how, uh, uh, um, how is a certain text pa patterned or modeled as far as only the form is concerned, regardless of the content. Therefore, making meaning out of literary texts is then not dependent only on the analysis of the texts per se, but on the text and all what is linked to the text, beyond the text. 
as a literary text is woven at different levels. The lexicon, the syntax, the semantics, the grammar, the phonology of a text, these are all levels which intersect to make out a certain production. The mere knowledge of these levels does not result into the full comprehension of a certain text, let alone its interpretation and appreciation. The consideration of language as a critical practice would help that the teachers would not expect students to have an attitude, whether positive or negative, towards a certain text if all they know is the tenses, the subject-verb agreement, the simple and complex sentence, and so on. Students should know what is beyond the surface. I mean, the text as a linguistic production. They should be aware of the ideologies, the power relations, and the differences that are mediated through the literary discourse. Thus, they should be aware that the texts are dead until readers recognize its communicative end or communicative purpose. And language awareness in terms of form and function does not really suffice to decipher the intricate cultural and ideological connotations laden in a certain text, mainly when the reader's profile and the writer's profile either intersect, that is, there is similarity, or converge, that is, they are different. Therefore, the need to critical approaches or to critical language awareness is really insistent in this case. The consideration of language as a critical practice leads to critical language awareness through engaging with the other and providing social enacting with the other. Critical language awareness is not far away from critical pedagogy, which uh, Paul Freyer suggests as a substitute to the banking model of teaching. He says, education thus becomes an active depositing in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor, that is, sender, receiver. Uh, in fact, a passive receiver. Instead of communicating, the teacher issues communiques and makes deposits, which the students patiently receive, memorize, and repeat. And that is what we call the parroting of learners. This is, in fact, the banking concept of education. That is, that the learner's mind it just, is just a bank, a reservoir where you would put information without any engagement of the learner himself. So, that is the banking concept of education in which the scope of action allowed to students extends only as far as receiving, filling and storing the deposits. They do, it is true, have the opportunity to become collectors or catalogers of the things they store. The absence of critical approaches is due to the wrong view that students are adaptable and manageable beings, while in fact an active learner is or would be readier to meet or face the differences among the others than a passive one. Isolating students from their subjectivity, that is, eliminating the student from the learning teaching process in the literature class, is impossible. It is, as one can confirm, a mistake and against the human nature. The denial of the subjectivity in analyzing reality and thus analyzing literary texts as they do reflect reality is called objectivism. However, neither 
the total objectivism nor the total subjectivism are favored as or is favored sorry as a position in reacting to a certain literary text but rather both of them this dialectical relationship and cultivating this dialectical relationship in students would allow them to react to literary texts critically and not passively, as they are triggered to see the reality represented in the texts and endeavor to unearth the ideological and cultural connotations or power relations in the text from both positions, the centripetal or the centrifugal. Referring to their schemata and stock of, of experiences for the world and human beings do not exist apart from each other. They exist in constant interaction. In this vein, cultural, uh, sorry, critical language awareness provides three principles which are really necessary in the teaching of literature in the FL classes. The first principle is that teaching is emancipatory, that is, that students experience things. Two, teaching is oriented towards the recognition of difference and not the denial of difference. And the last one is that teaching is an oppositional practice in which all participants are continuously thinking towards the prospects of empowerment we need to empower our learners to face the world with all those differences. Clark and Ivan explain that critical language awareness seeks to empower students as it provides them with a critical analytical framework in which they are encouraged to reflect on their own language experiences and practices as well as the other's language experiences and practices at a narrow and a wide scope, which refer to the institutions to which they belong to and the wider society in which they live. Consequently, the meaning that one reader makes out of a literary text and the attitude he or she grows towards the experiences portrayed in that text should not and cannot be expected to be identical since each reader would raise a horizon or horizons of expectations that are rooted back in his stock of experience, that is, in his background. And when we say stock of experience, it refers both to his life experience, to his literary experience, to his linguistic experience as well. And even though this uh, horizon of expectation can be collective, that is, shared among a certain group, it should as well enjoy a certain individual stance. As a conclusion, we as teachers cannot expi sorry, aspire, and yes, we cannot aspire, so we cannot aspire for a grammar of meaning behind the grammar of language for people's experiences are just not the same. Consequently, their attitudes and reactions to the texts should be anticipated as dissimilar instead of being identical. Thank you so much for your attention. So uh, the previous presentation was mainly about the approaches which are followed and those which should be followed in the EFL literature class. And it is related to the third presentation in a way that this, uh, the coming presentation deals with the content which is presented for EFL readers in the literature class. A content which deals mainly with critical issues related to power relations, to social in, uh, injustice and inequality. The third presentation is by Mrs. Nurul Huda Bazizi from the University of Wurgla and Dr. Nadia Gounan from the University of Saida, entitled 
the significance of teaching post-colonial literature to post-colonial readers. This is Ms. Noor Huda Bazizi, a second year PhD student from Qasdim Erbah University, Wurgla, supervised by Dr. Nadia Hunan from Saida University. My presentation is entitled The Significance of Post Colonial Literature in Post Colonial EFL Classes The Case of Algerian Students. Well, the purpose of an EFL class is obtaining learners who can use language and context effectively and accurately. Using literary texts is one of the means to achieve this goal. Literature provides an effective material for teaching the four skills together with the social, historical and cultural aspects that are always present in any work of literature. Post-colonial literature is considered an integral part of the Western literary canon. Post-colonial writing came to give voice to previously occupied people. It is their tool of resistance against their ex-colonizers and a way to speak out their concerns and experience. Post-colonial authors aim to reshape the dominant meanings and to reconstruct the tarnished image which the colonizer has drawn of them as well. Algeria is a previous French colony. The inclusion of post-colonial literature in the EFL curricula is supposed to be of significance. Since a reader cannot be detached from their background, an Algerian reader whose country has previously undergone the French colonialism would certainly identify with the author's experience. In other words, a post-colonial text is better received and more appealing to a post-colonial reader due to the shared knowledge or what is called schemata. In this case, readers reflect upon the text and relate it to their reality and might even de develop empathy. Eventually, this will encourage them to learn. For teaching post-colonial literature, Baumer and McLeod posit two models, the regional model and the theoretical one. The regional model refers to teaching the literature produced by formerly colonized nations, like Nigeria and India, while the theoretical model refers to teaching the writings that are concerned with post-colonial issues such as resistance, marginalization, and hybridity. For illustration, we take the instance of Jade Snow Wong's The Fifth Chinese Daughter. This novel depicts the life story of a Chinese girl who lives in San Francisco and encounters difficulties to be accepted in the American community. She is bullied, looked down at, and rejected because of her belongings. The colonizer-colonized relationship manifested in the work is similar to the one practiced on Algerian people during the French, colon the French colonization. The Algerian EFL learner will be well comprehensible of oppression and mar marginalization issues, especially that colonialism does not actually end when it is officially declared over. Colonies remain indirectly exploited and bound to their former occupiers. Moreover, Edward Said views that the West uses knowledge and representation as tools for domination, and Peter Berry advances that Europeans assume the presentations in their writings to be the norm and therefore any non-white norms are regarded inferior. On this basis, both post-colonial literature is a must to include category because it is one which or it is the one which represents reality from a non-white perspective 
and introduces a different uh, perception sorry, uh, towards the colonizer-colonized relationship. AFL postcolonial students should be enlightened about the world they live in, especially under the prevailing globalization and Eurocentrism. Postcolonial literature will even help the learners build up their self-esteem. To conclude, postcolonial literature is a category which should have its place in Algerian EFL syllabi. Including this category is beneficent for it encourages them to learn and augments their awareness of the world they are a part of. That was all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for respecting the time limits and for being informative in a precise and concise way. The current situation, uh, which, which is spreading all over the world, has imposed uh, new learning or teaching modes, mainly the online or the distant learning and teaching. The coming presentation deals with this topic. Dr. Hisham Suheli from Batna University and Ms. Nadia Idri from Bijaya University with the presentation, Online Teaching of Literature During the COVID-19 Crisis, Early Experiences Feedback. Uh, Dr. Hisham Suheri, are you here? Good morning. Do you hear Good morning. me? Morning. Yes. I have yes. issues with the camera, so uh, I beg your uh, understanding. That and, would be okay. Okay. Would be okay. So uh, I would like just um, in the meantime, until my colleague Nadia Idri uh, gets in because it's a, a duet, if you want. I would like to yeah. thank Wergla University for the outstanding scientific events they are doing, probably three in less than uh, three months. Uh, I have a particular sympathy for this university, for the colleagues, uh, notably the organizer, Dr. Halimi, uh, who is doing really a wonderful job for Wergla University and for the Algerian University in general. So I would like just to thank you for this uh, uh, enthusiastic, if you wish, uh, uh, set of scientific events and hope it's going to continue and that you are going to meet in other uh, events. Dear colleague, I would like you also just to call Dr. Idri, who is going to present the first part of the PowerPoint and uh, myself will continue the rest. So I'm going to share, if you allow me, uh, the PowerPoint. Can you just give me the hand, please? Uh, sure. We did not send a video, so we need uh, just to share. Uh, Dr. Suheli. Yeah. You already have the hand to uh, to share with us your screen. So I can't. I have a message which is l'animateur a désactivé le partage d'écran pour par les participants. Participants. Can you please okay, check? So otherwise, so otherwise I'm going to do without uh, the presentation. Can you just check, please? Just a second, please. It's okay. Okay, so uh, Dr. Suhali, yeah, uh, can we just start? Meanwhile, I uh, will try to fix uh, the problem and give you the hand to share the uh, PPT. So, normally, it's Dr. Idri. Can you give her just the, the phone, the microphone? Sure, sure, she's probably so, here. I don't see her, but she is probably here. Yes, she's here, she's online. So just excuse me for all the inconvenience, huh? Um, no, it's okay. That is part of online teaching and learning. Thank you. And sharing also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
So, uh, Dr. Nadia Idri, are you here? So she's not here. She's going to join me. So um, just um, not to waste time because uh, I believe time is really precious. So I'm going to start. So the, the presentation is- yes, uh, Dr. Suhali. Yeah? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Otherwise we can just move to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the other presentation and then come back to you if you don't mind. It's okay, it's okay. I'm going to reach Dr. Idri and get back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, uh, meanwhile, we'll move to uh, the fourth presentation, oh, sorry, the fifth one, uh, which is uh, Rewriting Afro-American Women, Identity Pursuit and self ascertaining in Morrison's Sola. Uh, the presentation is delivered by Ms. Wafam Khazniya and Dr. Mohamed Sagir Halimi from Wergla University. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would love to uh, express my gratitude and my appreciation for granting us the chance to uh, contribute to this event. Uh, our uh, topic uh, for today is going to, um, uh, to be uh, rewriting Afro-American women, identity pursuit and self-asserting in, in Morrison's uh, Sula. So, so as you may uh, as you may perceive the um, the focal point of the uh, presentation is uh, the idea of uh, discrimination and the idea of oppression that afro Americans uh, face within the American community in particular women and how they strive to uh, and how they strive to uh, to uh, realize uh, their ambitions and their dreams and how they strive to prove themselves and to uh, assert their true identities as being uh, black women and uh, with with uh, with free will to to assume whatever identity they are willing to so the idea that discrimination is uh, is is something inevitable all humans and in particular women all over the world because we uh, we face uh, all types of discrimination and oppression, oppression on a daily basis yet when it comes to uh, black women and women of color uh, this discrimination will be heightened because they will be um, they will be facing discrimination uh, on different levels uh, racial discrimination sexual discrimination uh, maybe social discrimination. So there are different factors and elements that contribute to uh, to such discriminatory uh, attitudes and uh, behaviors toward these women. Uh, there is a quote that uh, somehow uh, summarizes the uh, the entire idea. Uh, it has been suggested by uh, Willa May Hemans who claims that discrimination is uh, an inevitable factor in the life of black women of a black woman no matter from uh, which class geographic region or family background she originate, originates discrimination limits whatever chances and opportunities are available for her so this this is quite uh, this is quite uh, important in terms of the the fact that these women encounter all types of discriminatory attitudes from uh, from from people whether white people or even uh, black people uh, they their their uh, their discrimination uh, stem stems from the fact that they are black uh, first of all and women second of all so this discrimination does not uh, take into consideration uh, their class uh, status or their social status or the the place from which they uh, originate or uh, or even the educational level so uh, they are blacks and they are women and hence discrimination is always there and eventually uh, it would uh, pose uh, a lot of obstacles and limitations uh, and would uh, hinder the opportunities that they would that they would be granted and 
limit their uh, their choices in life. Uh, the this is really important, and hence we have chosen to discuss uh, this kind of issue that has uh, a lot to do with um, with racial and sen- and gender and gender subjugation and discrimination and uh, the horrendous and the uh, depressive consequences that would uh, that these uh, that these uh, types of discrimination would leave upon the black women uh, so this is a very important issue that was uh, addressed by uh, a lot of uh, black scholars uh, writers uh, activists uh, freedom fighters and they have thought that uh, it was the time to uh, to discuss such uh, sensitive matters and such such sensitive topics that were considered uh, as taboos and not all women were allowed to address them. Uh, so, in 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 such contemporary times, a lot of things uh, have been uh, altered. Uh, nowadays, these African um, uh, Afro-American women are able to write, or they are able to use to use different means and different methods to address such notions and to fight for their liberty and to fight for their for uh, equality and to fight for uh, for more uh, rights and more opportunities, whether uh, on the domestic level or the uh, social level or the uh, occupational level. Uh, they have uh, understood that it's it's uh, it's their responsibility to carry out their voices and to transmit the voices of the weak, uh, of the weak ones. So uh, their uh, their writings were the starting point from which from which these uh, sufferings and these uh, discriminations were reflected, and a lot of uh, solutions and a lot of uh, alternatives were discussed. Uh, in this regard, uh, Bell Hooks uh, argues that uh, it is obvious that the two forces, sexism and racism, intensified and magnified the suffering and oppression of uh, black women. And this is the, the starting point of uh, liberation and of uh, revolution, because these women have uh, understood the uh, importance of uh, taking a stand and uh, starting to uh, rebel and starting to uh, to uh, to address such uh, sensitive uh, issues and such uh, important issues. So uh, this, this statement by Hooks uh, explores and uh, encompasses the heart of the black females' concern and uh, and. Uh, and it it does uh, it does um, uh, manage to uh, to uh, bespeak a number of the central tenets in the writings of black women, with a reference to the danger of both uh, sexual and racial oppression in which the body of the black female is seen as a site of othering and uh, marginalization to render black women as merely objects of both racism and sexism, and that was a means to justify these uh, such oppressive attitudes and such oppressive um, because of the uh, because of the uh, stereotypes that were given to these women uh, uh, the stereotypes that uh, include hypersexuality uh, bestiality uh, uh, under uh, under develop under development uh, um, um, in civilization and a lot of other assumptions that were given by the uh, white, by the white people, and the white ideology or the Western ideology in general to justify such uh, uh, harsh treatments and such uh, uh, negative attitudes that were uh, that were uh, that were given to uh, these uh, people. So uh, it was up to these uh, black women and scholars to. Um, to start the fight, and hence their uh, fiction uh, was uh, used to compromise of several uh, variants of narratives st- extending throughout different periods of time, 
and also different literary genres. Uh, these uh, Afro-American women, uh, they have uh, contributed in offering full expression of the complexity of the Afro-American life, and uh, especially when this life relates to black females. So a lot of uh, a lot of concerns are actually transmitted through these writings, and and um, and since these women took the responsibility of depicting and historicizing contemporary uh, Afro-American life, uh, to stress their history, to um, to uh, to stress the their their uh, glorious past, and to uh, to stress those. Uh, pre-slavery uh, times uh, in which black women were given more uh, value and more um, and more equal rights. So these rights, uh, these uh, sorry, writers explore the black feminine self, and they also celebrate the black female along with her own culture and history. And this is like, and this is like the the to start because for these women. Uh, history is history is crucial and important in terms of uh, in terms of uh, giving uh, giving glory and giving her and giving credit to uh, to their past and to their uh, and to their uh, culture and to their own uh, to their own uh, civilization. Um, so, uh, due to this fact, these uh, female writers uh, were more interested in criticizing the black community for embracing Western beliefs and ideals. And since those beliefs and ideals were in direct contrast to the black community and its beliefs, and they tend to stand as an obstacle in the face of the development of the social and cultural status of this community, and particularly black women. So, uh, this criticism was one of the means that would uh, strengthen the uh, black uh, image uh, and the uh, black female uh, self-esteem as well. <clears throat> um, this is why we have uh, chosen to um, uh, to uh, to rely on one of the most uh, important contemporary uh, female writers, Toni Morrison, because she's uh, seen as one of the as one of the important of uh, of the time. Uh, she took the burden of struggle, uh, struggling against all kinds of social, political, and cultural prejudices, and she devoted her uh, novels and writings to express the way black women suffer and struggle every day. Just uh, their worthiness and to prove their own existence as free independent women who are able to function as good and efficient as uh, as any other uh, women all over the world. So in doing that, Morrison tried to shed light on sensitive matters that can be considered as taboos in the black community, uh, as it is the case with female sexuality and uh, its importance and function in defining the black female, starting from slavery and how black women were exploited and discriminated uh, during uh, during during this era, to post slavery, where these black women uh, were still being discriminated and their basic rights. So uh, Toni Morrison here can be seen as a mediator, and uh, because of because of the. Uh, a fact that her works may differ in time and setting, yet the focus was always on the black female's experience and her own uh, issues and concerns within the black community. And that was due to the fact that Morrison is seen as a writer who values the importance of the community and, uh, and knows the significance of belonging to a certain category or group. So her ethnic and racial inclination is always there and it has always been reflected in most of her works. So this is why she can be seen as a mediator and uh, between black men and black women, between the past and present African culture and tradition, uh, traditions and even modern Western lifestyles and the uh, self. Uh, 
the 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 idea the focal uh point of discussion is uh is the uh negative impacts of such discriminatory attitudes toward these women and hence we have uh uh chosen few uh few questions to be uh to be answered throughout this work the very first one is uh types of question that deals with uh that deal with the uh, present that are uh, that we deal with in our present work that are essential linked to human beings position and struggle in life, struggle against violence, oppression, exploitation, quest for feminine identity, the raise of uh, self-consciousness and awareness, the question of the black feminist literary production and the way through which black writers um, tend to reflect their own concerns to arrive at some sort of remedies regarding important uh, matters such as racial and sexual discrimination. Uh, also questions that are linked to human identity and the way in which the individual tends to perceive him or herself in relation to uh, other factors as it is the case with uh, factors um, uh, uh, and uh, eventually uh, how they can function on this on these uh, or on that basis uh, the other point is the questions that are related to the black community and the way in which uh, racial discrimination provides some kind of a bond between black men and black women and uh, unites them as one uh, unit to uh, transcend and to overcome such, uh, such uh, prejudices and such uh, oppressive, uh, oppressive uh, treatments. Uh, also, questions of contemporary matters related to black female within the American community, as it is the case with beauty standards, uh, interracial relationships, domestic violence, self realization female sexuality, female identity, and even, uh, even ideas uh, of love and acceptance. So, for, uh, for the personal motivation, uh, we were actually uh, we were uh, pushed to choose such a topic because of the urgent need to discuss uh, matters that are related to both race and gender uh, due to the increasing number of both physical, sexual and psychological assaults and violence that most women and uh, especially women of color uh, face every day uh, within the uh, American community and even elsewhere. The second point is that uh, the existence of the increasing number of racial, ethnic and even religious discrimination uh, faced by many ethnic groups and most importantly uh, black people uh, who are being persecuted on a daily basis simply because of their color and background. So, um, uh, so for black women this persecution is doubled and uh, their suffering also is doubled and it is actually uh, it is important to address such uh, such notions and such and such Uh, Ms. Mkhaznia, we do apologize for uh, not being able to diffuse the whole presentation as it does ex uh, uh, sorry, exceed the time limits uh, allotted for each presentation. Your presentation was another way to insist and to emphasize the need of critical approaches in the literature class, as African literature provides a content which is heavy and which is deep and intricate with power relations, gender issues, and race issues. Thank you so much. Uh, I, would be, I would like to be back to uh, Dr. Suheli. Yes, I am here. Yes, uh, Dr. Idri is here too, I guess. Yeah, uh, she's here. Hello, Nadia. 
But she can't speak, I believe. Can you just? Uh, there is another hello sent to you from Mr. Halimi behind the screen. So uh, hello to him uh, and warm, very warm um, greetings. So can you please, dear colleague, um, allow Dr. Idri to speak? Are, are, are two um, speakers allowed to speak at the same time? Sure. And I believe she can share also. Uh, now the sharing Idri. problem has been solved. So I'm going to share, I'm going to share and avoid all uh, what's going there. Okay. Can you see this, uh, the, the PowerPoint? It's coming. Yes. Uh, good morning, Dr. Idri. Good morning, good morning everybody. Morning. Thank you. I'm not aware of the time. I believe I apologize the PowerPoint because is I visible. Have, yeah? I apologize for um, not being present when you called me because I had a call from the faculty and I was obliged to answer. You know that Sunday is a bit busy for teachers. Sure, sure. Okay. Good luck with that. Shall we start the presentation? Uh, please do. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. So uh, we are really pleased to share this experience with you, mainly that we are sharing an experience related to the COVID-19 crisis. Why teaching literature? You know that teaching literature remains problematic for many of the students when meeting them in our ordinary classrooms. So we uh, experienced other kinds of problems when dealing with teaching this module uh, online. So our presentation, so of course, I, I would uh, also thank you for the good organization uh, of the event. Uh, so our presentation is entitled Online Teaching of Literature During the COVID-19 Crisis, Early Experiences uh, uh, Feedback, presented by Hisham Suheli, Dr. Hisham Suheli from the University of Benda too, and myself, Dr. Nadia Idri from the University of Vijaya. Uh, this paper addresses the question of literature teaching in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. The, uh, and of course, the sudden implementation of the online and distance instruction, which was, uh, uh, oh, oh, which was uh, uh, dictated by the ministry, uh, urge teachers to undertake particip precipitated actions to implement online teaching and assessment at the same time. Mm. Uh, of course, first, there is a consensus on the fact that the literature course is by far one of the most complex subject matters to convert to distance learning. Nevertheless, creative approaches appeared and sustained instruction beyond the constraints observed during the lockdown. The, uh, concerning the scope of the crisis, so there were many, um, many, scope, many problems. So we have unprecedented crisis, massive lockdown worldwide, which was also a sudden, a sudden change, the closure of educational structures. Uh, in Algeria, you know that this happened uh, on March the 14th. Uh, school and academic dropout prevailed. Emergency measure to counteract dropout included the setting of online teaching. However, we would like to focus on some of the psychological incidences. Here, we have many problems appeared within the online and distance instruction. So we reported symptoms related to the morbidity. When dealing with, these, with disease states, it, uh, when we say a word about morbidity, it is any kind of physical or psychological state considered to be outside the realm of normal well-being. The lockdown and the disease were an uh, abnormal well-being related to what students live in their homes, uh, trying to learn online by their own. The term is often used to describe illness or impairment or degradation of, or, or degradation, degradation, degradation of health. Uh, the second uh, psychological problem we observed was uh, anxiety. There was high level of anxiety among a number of students, mainly when we teach literature. So I would say here, we can relate the word anxiety here to pandemic anxiety. We can have students feeling anxiety in their normal state, but in the during the pandemic, the level of anxiety exceeded its normal state and the uh, researchers referred this to uh, pandemic anxiety and this can lead 
two kind of avoidance and isolation that students experience. We also add the notion of depression and these changes a lot of how students feel, the way they think and the way they act because they are in their own room and trying to learn difficult content without any kind of help. And remember that when we use the online platforms, it was like just putting documents inside. Rare are teachers who already use the platform as it should be in an interactive way. Depression here causes feelings of sadness or of loss of interest in activities uh, uh, that use, uh, students use to enjoy. How it we think about teacher literature where students can find problems in motivation. Uh, we have also problems of substance abuse. And here we refer the word to drug abuse, whether it is allowed or not allowed, it can be alcohol, it's going to be dry, it, it can be medicines, it can be uh, uh, overuse of uh, coffee, etc. So many people can fall within this trap and uh, use substance abuse. And finally, uh, in the world, of course, we do not have uh, results about Algerian situation, but suicide rates increase over the world with the lockdown. Uh, to move forward, so we talk about online teaching and the solution. Here, it's a big question mark. Educators, politicians, and practitioners agreed on maintaining a, maintaining a link with schools and universities. The idea was just to keep the students uh, in relation with their schools. Uh, we do not expect to have great results, but at least we did not stop 100%. <coughs> E-learning structures were improvised and tested. So we used them as they are. We did not have the chance to pilot or test any kind of material. Teachers were urged to adopt alternative approaches to maintain the link and keep learners connected. Teachers changed, they did not use only the platform, the e-learning platforms offered by universities, but many teachers use emails, use Zoom, Google Meet, use the Messenger, some others use the WhatsApp. So teachers really had the opportunity to uh, think of other materials to keep learning uh, alive. So uh, here, so I have given a number of, of examples. So I anticipated the slide. So we have the Moodle, the Easy Class, the Google Classroom, etc. We have professional websites, social networks, and forums, and we have the teleconferencing apps uh, that, are uh, that are becoming more uh, used in the world like Zoom and the Google Meet. Uh, so, uh, so I would okay. like to, uh, to, to, uh, to invite Dr. Hisham to carry on the presentation in order to be fair in what we are doing. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nadia. So I take the, the floor, it's my turn. So in this scheme, which, is, which was uh, drafted by Marwa Abdelaziz, you find the link here on ResearchGate. You see how basically um, uh, e-learning wor works. In, on each side, we have the student, we have the teacher, and knowledge, which is in the center, which is supposed to be, um, uh, let's say, shared uh, and transmitted from the instructor to, to the learners. And here, if you see the cursor, it's moving. So we have the types of communication, synchronous when it's on Google Meet or on Zoom. So communication goes in the same time simultaneously and asynchronous, uh, synchronous story when it's about- uh, Dr. Suhaili. Yeah? Uh, sorry for interruption. Would you please share the uh, screen in a, uh, in a diaporama so that we can see the, uh, the figure oh, more clearly? I'm going also to send to people who are interested the PowerPoint presentation, right. So, Thank you so much. Okay, so give me just some little bit time. Voila. It's there. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, it's clearer now. Thank you. So um, this 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 scheme shows how communication and online teaching basically works. So not going to enter much into details, but I'm going to send it to all the stu uh, to the students, teacher who are teachers who are present, and you see the link here. It was uh, drafted by Marwa Abdelaziz, and you have the link here. So uh, basically all teachers we have seen, because the, this work is about uh, professional feedback basically, have more or less um, worked uh, on this scheme, respecting or not respecting the various, uh, the cursor is moving, the various elements 
and paradigms that could um, make online teaching successful and possible. But the case of literature has a specific complexity. I am a literature teacher. I probably, we have a lot of literature teachers here. And here I have taken um, uh, a slide from Dr. Husni Sahami from the University of, uh, University of Putra in Malaysia, who has basically uh, listed the, the most important approaches in teaching literature. We have the skills-based approach, that is a specific approach that uh, uh, concentrates on a specific skill. We have the information-based approach in which literature is about giving information, language-based approach, which is very close to creative writing, a personal response re re approach, which is that approach that deals with readers' responses, that is basically how do learners or people, readers basically, respond, judge, uh, and evaluate and interpret a given text. We have paraphrastic approach in which it's about rewriting, re-speaking, re-interpreting uh, a specific text. An approach that I like so much, which is the moral philosophical approach, which makes of a, a literature, uh, studying a literary text, a type of a springboard onto the study of moral philosophy, uh, moral issues. It's, it's that approach that I basically favor when teaching literature. And we have stylistics, stylistics or stylistics, depending on the pronunciation approach, which deals with language and with comparative literature, basically. So uh, for my own experience, I, um, I have tried just to test these two approaches online. What we know is that language-based approach will test the learner's command of language with reference to the study text. This approach focuses, focuses on written production in the exams, for example. And we have the personal response approach. Here, we try to involve learners in the introspective study, that is the word study missing, sorry, of the text in relation to their own personal experiences. That is, how can you relate to the story or how can you relate to the characters and so on and so forth. In this, in this other scheme, um, drafted by Nancy Green Michaels, the link is there. You see that the approaches to teaching literature, uh, it, it's also about finding a balance, that is, finding um, subjectivity in responses and reflections, trying to make the students develop his aesthetic and cultural analysis while doing interpretation. And most mo above all, what we are looking at. It's that notion of creativity, how to take the text and make a kind of reappropriation of the text. For example, for myself and for a lot of students, uh, teachers of literature, what we could not do online, online the teacher could not or cannot set drama performances. I used to give to my students uh, pieces of prose and ask, ask, ask them, sorry, to transform that piece into dialogue setting, encourage them to use decors, etc. I could not do it, not because it's not do it, doable, but the ambient uh, setting of a theater set in the class cannot be repro uh, reproduced online. Can do it on videos, but you omit the live performance. Um, we don't have loud, interactive, collective reading. We don't have immediate and sincere responses because um, there is a, 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 a hollow effect. Uh, people, when, when they say, when they see that they are observed, they change their behavior, and we cannot observe situational synergies. We don't see the interaction within the students when they read collectively, and so on and so forth. What do we have in terms of feedback? The students' feedback was uh, basically mixed. We have a negative feedback, which consists in adaptation difficulties to this new mode of teaching. Technophobia, many people do not trust technology, computers, smartphones, etc. It still exists even within the younger generations, not to speak about teachers. And we have carelessness. When we speak about morbidity, like Dr. Idri said earlier, when all the, the idea I have in mind is the, the idea of death, of, of despair, etc. So we don't care basically about study, literature, or any other topic. Whereas the positive feedback, we have some kind of relative enthusiasm because people these young students wanted to experiment something new. And this experimentation was quite, uh, uh, had just encouraged them to do something differently. We have rational substitution, which I link much to pragmatism. Students believe that they have to end the year to have their marks, to 
make some kind of um, um, kind of uh, accumulation of knowledge that was not only uh, that was not possible during the lockdown. Mind you, the lockdown was from Mars, March 2020 to September. And um, if if people were very uh, um, let's say um, uh, were much shocked about the students' attitudes and behavior during the the, 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 the the getting back to school in September. Let me tell you that those who, who made the first academic year that is starting starting sorry in December, the, 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 the situation of the students was really scary because we felt that we have lost a lot of students because of this famous uh, dropout. These students were basically lost. So in conclusion, what do we retain? First is that this pandemic has affected teaching, but not only teaching. Uh, second is that e-learning emerged as the only alternative not to have the students uh, losing their contact with academia. E-learning models are multiple and the tools also. Literature uh, teaching is specifically complex because it's based on interaction or interpretation on live observation. Whatever approach chosen, pedagogical and epistemic shortage will remain. When I speak about epistemic, we speak about knowledge. We could not really transfer all the knowledge we can have to the students because of the constraints uh, imposed by uh, online teaching. The early feedback shows mixed with results. These results go basically from dropout to pure pragmatism. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you both Dr. Suheli and Dr. Idri uh, for presenting your topic in such a pract practical way. In fact, such a topic is uh, of, of a great interest for all teachers, especially that we here in Algeria are very green in using uh, online teaching, uh, which the circumstances of the COVID-19 crisis uh, has, uh, sorry, have imposed. We move now to the sixth presentation which sheds light on another approach of teaching literature. It is entitled, Shifting Towards a Social Constructivist Approach in Teaching Literature Within the EFL Context, presented by Dr. Noel Uhiba and Dr. Latifa Bussadat from Saida University. The present research paper is entitled A Shift Towards a Social Constructivist Approach in Teaching Literature Within the EFL Context, presented by the researchers Dr. Uhiba and Dr. Busadet from Saida University. It's at the heart of human life. Therefore, people from all walks of life aim for quality education. One has to equip him or herself with the right. At the heart of human life. Therefore, people from all walks of life aim for quality education. One has to equip him or herself with the right skills to face adversities of life. However, according to Leistein, most teachers are not willing to try out new approaches in teaching because they are already confined to traditional approaches. As a result, many learners find difficulties in understanding important concepts because most schools do not adequately provide the requisite experience for learners to fully develop their skills and potentials. On the other hand, these teachers do not want students to listen passively and expect them to be actively engaged in learning. 
Interestingly, literature is the source for the students to learn worthwhile values and skills necessary for their existence. Literature can make it reader see life in a wider perspective. It's a realistic representation of life's situation, and characters can hurt learners into another world or another period. It can create an emotional situation, a mood or a tone, a feeling that can make them experience the significant human experience. As teachers, it is therefore important to provide experience and motivation for students to learn in a manner that makes sense to them. Due to the nature of the discipline and from our humble The present research determines the effect of social constructivist approach in teaching literature within an EFL context. It aims to answer the following questions. To what extent can social constructivist approach enhance the teaching of literature? And how to implement this approach in literature classroom within the Algerian context? The progressive education movement, led by Swiss developmental psychologist Jean Piaget and the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky, eventually modeled into the constructivism theory. Reduced to its most basic elements, constructivism is simply a learning or meaning-making theory. This theory proposes that learning is an active process in which the learners construct new ideas and concepts based on their current or past knowledge and experience. While there are similarities between the theory of a Piaget and Vygotsky, differences exist. And those differences are critical in the understanding and application of the theories in educational settings and have a great impact on the teaching methods. We can distinguish, therefore, between cognitive constructivism, which is about how the individual learns and understands things in terms of developmental stages and learning styles, and the social constructivism, which focuses on how meaning and understanding grow out of social encounters. that cognitivists such as the Piaget had overlooked the essential social nature of language. According to him, the learner should not be separated from his environment, but should be encouraged to integrate with other learners, teachers, or other sources of language, such as books, journals, computers, etc. These interactions provide the learners with the language used for learning communication. According to Derry, Vygotsky differentiated between two sorts of concepts, specifically between what he called everyday concept, or spontaneous, and the scientific concepts. These concepts have their precise meaning and are learned through different contexts, while everyday concepts are those that are learned spontaneously in daily life. Scientific concepts are those learned through formal institutions. Further, everyday concepts are formed from concrete experience to abstract experiences. However, scientific concepts take the opposite direction. The learner, for example, adopts the everyday concepts in the school where he learned the scientific concept. And simultaneously, he has to learn the scientific concepts on the basis of the concrete example application. Accordingly, both the directions are crucial for understanding and constructing knowledge. Vygotsky distinguished between two development levels, the level of actual development and the level of potential development. This means that there is such a difference between a learner who performs a task independently and the one who performs a task with assistance and guidance of someone else who has already mastered the concept being learned. For example, a 16 years old child can drive forward and backward perfectly. But when it comes to parking, he or she may find difficulties. For this reason, a teacher is needed to guide this child to teach him how to park the car. Bridging this gap, therefore, depends on the kind of support that is provided by an adult or any expert. In short, the basic and most important idea about the zone of proximal development is that
With the most sensitive instruction or guidance, the child will be able to develop skills to use on his or her own to develop higher mental functions. The difficulty in understanding and appreciating literature is due to the fact that some teachers of literature don't pay attention to the appropriate methods of teaching literature, which would enable them to transfer the information to the students easily. Since the learners are somehow excluded from participating in making and creating the learning process, so instead of driving a pleasure and entertainment out of studying literature, they feel burdened with its implication for the exam, a thing that makes them take the study of literature works as a difficult task to accomplish or a boring one. Fortunately, these results are almost general in all Yafe literature classes and not specific to the conducted research. The question to be asked here is how to make literature more enjoyable and more interesting for our students. We may say that a shift toward a social constructivist approach is a potential solution because this approach advocates a classroom interaction wherein students are given the opportunity to interact with their teachers, other students and the material they read. Therefore, to learn is to experience that is to interact with one's environment, to do, to feel, to sense, to handle, and to perceive the opportunities. Certainly, students benefit from the social interaction by sharing ideas, appropriating understanding, and articulating thinking. With the social constructivist approach, the students construct their knowledge actively rather than just mechanically ingesting ideas from the literary text, from the teachers, or from the textbooks. Likewise, the students get amorphous information through their engagement in conversations and they themselves put together their own personal questions and figure out how to go about answering them with the teachers being the mediator of that meaning-making process. The floor is given now to Dr. Bissadet to explain how to use effectively this approach in an EFL literature classroom. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uhiba and Dr. Bethedet from Saida University. I do agree with you that although we pretend that we use learner-centered approaches, but we always fall in the trap of teacher-centeredness. Uh, Dr. Ibel Okafor, are you here? Dr. Okafor, are you here? Yes, but the line is breaking. Hello? Hello? Yeah, the, line so, is, uh, the line is breaking. Sorry? The line is breaking. I can hear you very well. The network. Okay. So let's yes. just try again, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay, so would you like to prefer to uh, go online or we just uh, display or diffuse the recording that you have sent? Yeah, you can use it because the line is breaking and maybe off and on. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So now we move to the last presentation in this session uh, entitled Igbo Language Expressions in is in one these shadows on arrival by Dr. Uh, Ibel Okafor from Lagos University, Nigeria.
to easily and appropriately express issues they discuss in their test. Hell shows that despite individual differences, all bilinguals share the ability to act in their native language, in their second language, and to switch back and forth between the two languages they know. However, a writer may use multiple languages in their test for one reason or the other. A writer in English may find the use of her own indigenous language or another indigenous language more appropriate than English language to describe a phenomenon or an experience in their test. The phenomena are technically termed code switching and code mixing, as the case may be. Bilingual or multilingual writers often have code switching and code mixing in their writings. Switching or mixing codes is a common feature of Igbo writers in English. This paper examines Igbo language expressions in Asian one based shadows on arrival, an English drama test. This will be analyzed via content analysis of the data collected from the test. The study aims at identifying the use of Igbo language expressions in the English test and motivations behind the code switching and code mixing found in the test. Literal review. Code switching and code mixing are social sociolinguistic phenomena. They are features they are features of language in contact and the effects of bilingualism and multilingualism. They are stylistic devices employed by Nigerian novelists in their attempts to tackle the nagging problems of language in Nigerian literature. Code switching and code mixing are therefore aspects of language use in Nigerian prose fiction and by implication the Nigerian society. There are three major factors responsible for code switching and code mixing in a given speech situation. They, these include the participants in the speech event and the code, the first speaker selects topic and setting. Code switching. In sociolinguistics, code, code refers to a language or a variety of language. It is a system used for communication between two or more parties in any occasion. The term code switching means switching from one language variety to one to another when the situation demands. These types of code switching, Poplack identifies three different types of code switching, which are tax switching, intercentation code switching, and intracentation code switching or code mixing. Tax switching. Tax switching involves inserting a tag or short phrases or expressions in one language into an utterance that is otherwise entirely in another language. In this kind of code switching, tax, exclamation, and certain phrases in one language are inserted into an utterance of another language. Tax include interjections, fillers, and idiomatic expressions. In Shadows on Arrival, the writer is the one that uses the following tax switching to indicate surprise, shock, and so on. Examples in Extract 1, it is used to show women's confusion state, confused state when they suddenly heard the sound of Ekwe, a traditional wooden musical instrument. Aru Ego, wait, wait. Can you hear that sound? Ego Ibo. Which sound? Oilidie. Ah, it is the sacred Ekwe. Listen to what it is saying. Aru Ego. Death has struck the land. Someone is dead. Chimo. In extra two, it is used in a situation. Ego Ibo refused to accept the initiation of her daughter, Aboma, as the next pretest. The gods forbid. My daughter will live in a groove. What kind of life is that? When other children in other towns are going to the white man's school, learning about new things in the new world, Umweze plans to consign one of her own to a life in the groove, to fear not my abomma. In extra three, Akudo scolded his wife. 
Ego Yibu for seeing the titled men who gathered at the village square for a meeting. You did not mean any harm, or choir. You saw the titled men on their way to the, to the square, and instead of going home, Mbano, no, you stayed until they met you on their way back. In intersentential code switching, it is a type of code switching where there is the alternation in a single discourse between two languages. In this respect, switching occurs after a sentence in the first language has been completed and the second and the second and the next sentence starts with a new language. In Shadows on Arrival, the writer is the one who uses the following intersentential code switching to indicate situation of things, disapproval, or irritation about another person's behavior, surprise, annoyance, emphasis, evil greetings, etc. For example, in Extra 4, it was used in the description of the message from the sacred traditional wooden Mexico instrument. Koko Tibo Agobanie, let the leopard come. Koko Tibo Dikebanie, let the brave one come. Koko Tibo Agobanie, let the leopard come. Koko Tibo Dikebanie, let the brave man come. Koko Titi Bom 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 Agonona Kreka, there's a snake in the raffia roof. Titi Bo, Titi Bo, Titi Bo, Titi Bo Bo Bo. In extra five, it was used when Oilidie clarifies the message from the sacred traditional wooden musical instrument. Mbano, never, she listens. It says that a giant tree has fallen. Hey! In extra six, it was used to describe how Aboma's mother, Ego Yibo, answered her angrily. Who called you? When I call you, you will not hear. It is when I do not call that you will answer. Ta, seba po, get out of my sight before I close and open my eyes. In extra seven, it, it is used to show the Igbo greetings. Ego Ibo greeted her husband Akugo when he was lost in thought because their only daughter Aboma was chosen as the next pretest. Good morning, sir. Akudo didn't respond. She touches him gently. Nani or the kwama. Hope all is well. In transcendental swishing or code swishing it refers to a type of code swishing where there is an alternation in a single discourse between two languages. In this case, the swishing of the languages occur within a phrase, a clause, or a sentence boundaries. In Shadows on Arrival, the writer is the one who uses the following intersentential code swishing or code mixing to indicate emphasis, condition of things, etc. In extra 10, it appeared in the words of Oilidie when she was describing the reason Chika joined the worshippers of the foreign god. She gave birth to a child who is neither black nor white, Ananyali, Abino, with a four o'clock eye. In extra 11, intracentation code switching also occurred in the test when Ego Ibo explains to her husband the reason she left early in the morning to sweep the village square. It is the turn of our Iyomdi, the association of wives, to sweep the Abala or her square today, and they normally do it early in the morning. There are different reasons or motivations for code switching and code mixing. According to Hoffman, there are a number of reasons for bilingual or multilingual person to switch or miss their languages. These are taking, talking about a particular topic. Two, quoting somebody else. Three, being emphatic about something. Four, interjection. 
five repetition used for clarification six for intention of clarifying the speech content for interlocutor seven expressing group identity eight to soften or strengthen request or command nine because of real lexical name or let's go need and tend to exclude other people when a comment is intended for only a limited audience. Code switching and code missing are common features in Nigerian prose fiction. This involves the character's choice of appropriate linguistic codes for different contexts or situations in their interactions. The author employs them as stylistic devices to cater adequately for the varying local situations in her drama text for instance in shadows on arrival is one a big character is one base character employ code switching and code mixing depending on the situation in which the characters find themselves choices of appropriate codes enable the characters assume corresponding rules which best serve their communication communicative needs in different speech encounters Sometimes characters communicating in English switch to Igbo language and vice versa. In terms of motivations, Igbo language expressions in the text are of two categories. First, the necessary kinds motivated by Igbo sociocultural expressions that do not have equivalence in English. And secondly, the unnecessary kinds that have equivalence in English but were used alongside the English forms. The Igbo cultural expression that do not have equivalent in English include Igbo address forms in greetings, such as greetings to elders, a special greetings a woman uses to greet her husband. In extra 12, Ego Oyibo enters her husband's OB in the morning. Husband. Nani Akudo. Akudo replies, Ego why, Ego why. In extra 13, when the flute singers announces the arrival of Igwe, the traditional leader of Humez, his people, with his guards to a meeting, the council stand, stand until he takes his seat. They greet before sitting. Igwe. During the discussion at the meeting, there is a heavy uproar because of people's reactions and counter reactions. One of the title men in the traditional leaders' cabinet, in trying to calm the people's attention, greets them. Thus, Umweze Obrodike Kwenu, Eya. In extra 15, when Chieme, the priest test, refused to join the chief priest, who wants to initiate a bomb through false pretense that God shows her. To replace CMA as the next pretest, the chief priest, through prayers and incantation, tried to invoke the spirit of CMA. CMA Wanyoma, the great pretest of Abaroha. CMA, who dares gather at the shrine of Abaroha without your benevolence. Conclusion Code switching and code mixing are some of the stylistic strategies devised to preserve Igbo language in Nigerian prose fiction. Thereby catering, adu catering adequately for the varying Nigerian local situations, culture, and environment. This is because English language is in contact with the numerous Nigerian local languages and dialects. The use of code switching and code mixing are demonstrations of some of the attempts by Nigerian novelists to reflect the realities of the use of English in Nigeria. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Okafor. And I, I do apologize uh, for not being able to follow the uh, audio recording with the, with the slides. It was a bit difficult for me to uh, make them work in parallel. Uh, we move now, that was the last, uh, sorry, presentation. We move now to the debate. And uh, here I've got some questions for almost all the presenters. So we start with the first question, which is addressed to uh, Dr. Uh, Adwara, the question is, what is the goal behind code switching 
or code mixing? Is it an expression of one's identity in writing with a foreign language, or is it to make the readers curious to look for the translation to understand their meanings? So uh, I'm not sure if she is here. I think that Dr. Okafor can answer this uh, question if she wishes to, of course. Dr. Okafor, are you here? Yes, I'm, I'm yes. Okay, so uh, shall I repeat the question for you? Yes, yes. Please, I'm sorry okay. for the mix up. Eh? I've uh, sent the, the, the record, recordings before the slides. That's why the mix up. Please, I'm sorry for that. No, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. So uh, I uh, repeat the question again. What is the goal behind code switching or code mixing? Is it an expression of one's identity in writing with a foreign language, or is it to make the readers curious and look for the translation to understand the meaning? Uh, yeah, the goal behind the code switching and code mixing is uh, for the Igbo writers in English to uh, show their identity as an Igbo writer, and as well as showcase the Igbo culture, their life, their, well, their life, their belief system, their tradition, and also their way of life. So that's the reason they all, some of the, one of the writers employ Igbo language in writing English texts to show their identity and also to preserve Igbo language from extinction. And also to intimate others about Igbo language. That's why they have the Igbo translation in English. For those who want to learn Igbo, we also learn Igbo through that means. Okay, Th thank you so much. So do you think that all authors venture to write in English language instead of their native language? Like, what is the reason? Why would they choose English and then code switch to their native language or code mix their uh, native language? Why not, no. oh, sorry, why not writing in their native language in the first place? No, they, they, are, they are doing it, they are, they are doing it, at times they are doing it unknowingly, you know, because once you're bilingual, you are bound to mm. put in your native language in writing, another language is even normal in speech. And it's always, is your cause when you are, the person you are talking to is uh, maybe you are in a gathering of um, similar intentions of people around. So as you are now, as you are writing in English or speaking in your uh, English language, you, got, you are bound to put in your own native language. So it mo mostly happens to bilinguals and multilinguals. So that's what um, happening to Igbo writers in English. So it is a matter of uh, readability and audience as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. Uh, the other question is addressed to me, in fact. Uh, it's a comment. Uh, the more students are exposed to different cultures, ideologies through, uh, through universal literary works, the more they become open-minded and tolerant. I, I would join this point of view uh, yes, it is true, because the more they see the differences, the more they are led to be more aware of themselves as distinct beings and uh, entities within uh, this human diverse, sorry, universe, which is too much diverse. The other question, again, is to me, uh, it is from Dr. Yusuf Benamar. 
Do you think that teachers take into account students' different subjective interpretations in assessing the literary analysis of a given literary text? In fact, that was what I have started the presentation with is that as teachers, Sometimes it is expected from learners that they would provide a very typical answer, a very typical analysis, uh, disregarding their different backgrounds, their different uh, schemata, their different stock of experience, and also disregarding the, their different literary and linguistic experiences. So uh, we look for uh, uh, objectifying, if I might say, the literary, uh, the class of literature, which is almost impossible with uh, the human sensitiveness and uh, the human different experiences. Uh, the other question is addressed to Dr. Suheli and Dr. Idri. The question is, since teaching literature is a complex, a complex task, which approach do you suggest? So Dr. Suheli or Dr. Idri, any of you would answer this question, please? Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the mic was uh, off. Can you please repeat the question? Sure. So yeah. uh, since teaching literature is a complex task, which mm -hmm. approach do you suggest? First of all, um, there is a real problem in literature and Dr. Halimi, who's probably uh, somewhere there, will not contradict me. Uh, teaching literature in the modern programs of the LMD system um, changed. So uh, those who belong to the classical system have studied literature as such. The, uh, the, the term was global and we were teaching literature. Now it is called study of literary text. So everything revolves around um, teaching uh, literary texts. So um, I, I, do, I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood when I said uh, teaching literature is complex or more complex than other uh, courses because all courses are varied, whether courses of civilization, courses of um, grammar, phonetics, etc. So all in all, it was um, it's very difficult to teach, but literature requires students to read, to read at home, uh, to have a reading list of texts, of novels, works of fiction, of nonfiction, and so on and so forth. So if there is no uh, background knowledge uh, let's say that is accumulated by the students, the teacher cannot do anything. Now, teaching what? So um, we, first of all, before teaching literature, we need to introduce uh, students to theory, theory of literature, the genres, um, the approaches to the text, etc., etc. Once uh, what is mostly adopted in Algerian universities is new formalism, that is studying the themes, uh, the characters, the study in the, the motives, the symbols, uh, a little bit of narration, etc. So depending on the teacher's training himself, so the teacher, um, the teachers generally reproduce what they have been taught. So someone who is who was um, who did magister studies or doctoral studies in post-colonial theory will only focus on post-colonial approaches to literature, whereas those who studied with new formalism uh, or um, the Marxist approach will also uh, follow this path. So depending on the texts, it's always good when you teach theory to take a little uh, piece of writing. Generally, when I do it for lisson students, I choose fairy tales, for example, like Cinderella. Uh, and uh, much of the studies that were done on Cinderella and all the fairy tales we were told when you're young, uh, basically uh, include, include approaches to fairy tales, which might seem at first hand naive because we were all um, uh, told these stories when we were young. But when you present to the students, for example, the case of Cinderella uh, that could be studied uh, from four perspectives, psychoanalytical, we study it uh, referring to Freud, uh, the unconscious, Marxist, if we see it as a clash of the class, uh, a poor woman who, want, who once was rich and who descends to the lower class and then gets back to the higher class. Darwinist also, if we speak about survival, for example, and um, 
what I, what I can add also uh, regarding Cinderella, I don't have the course in mind basically, but four approaches are possible to a fairy tale. How can we teach? First of all, it's in content selection. Uh, there is a program that majority of Algerian teachers agree on. This program should be followed. But from time to time, I advise strongly teachers to introduce um, specific topics that relate to nowadays fiction students like uh, uh, Twilight, Harry Potter, all the youth literature that they can do. So it's always good uh, to, to, to choose the appropriate text or to take Shakespeare, which is an absolute must read in the class and try to introduce them using movies, for example, adaptations. Uh, there are wonderful adaptations uh, of Shakespeare. And when we do comparative literature, cinema and, 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 and writing, it's also a way to bring a little bit of attention. Uh, noting that always um, we tell the students that uh, the text, uh, the movie cannot replace the text. So there are possible, a lot of possible approaches. It's all about grabbing attention and making the students understand that once they read fiction, it's, it's a personal experience uh, first before thinking of the exam or having a good mark. And if exams, if the student understand that the exam is not an issue and that he will pass uh, if he is um, involved enough in reading, I think it's a good way to bring students to read. Uh, we should not scare them about the reading or uh, give them the belief that uh, if uh, the literature class is difficult and they would not have good, good marks, it's all about basically making the, 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 right, uh, the right choice. I hope uh, I have answered the question. Thank you. That was fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Latifa Besadet, do you have something to say? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, to be a part of this uh, very interesting academic uh, event, being uh, with you uh, this uh, specific day. Uh, thank you very much to give us uh, such an, uh, an opportunity. So uh, I just wanted to uh, intervene uh, concerning the interruption that it happened uh, in uh, our uh, oral presentation, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Bessedat Latifa and uh, Dr. Newel Uhiba from uh, University of Saida. I know that it was technical uh, difficulty because uh, the slides were, uh, uh, were difficult to be held. I understand you. Uh, but anyway, uh, the practical side was uh, was uh, was complementary to what have been uh, or what what has been uh, uh, held by uh, my uh, colleague Dr. Ohiba uh, Newell. So, uh, especially uh, uh, concerning uh, the tools or the, the the method that the teacher can use in order to uh, to apply uh, such a uh, an approach in teaching literature in an EFL context. So, uh, the two methods were uh, mainly. Uh, uh, meant with the, with the group work. It means how to put uh, students uh, together in a social, uh, 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 making, making the classroom a social community for them in order to interact and, uh, 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 I mean, getting benefits from one another. It means how to learn from one another more or maybe better uh, than to learn from the teacher. I mean, uh, the, the, the two methods were uh, the, the group work or what we call the, the literal circles and the second method what, what we call the double entry journals. That's why I wanted the, the teacher to, to finish uh, the, the oral presentation in order to have an idea about the methods. Anyway, I just wanted to conclude and to say that uh, our, our aim, myself and my colleague, Dr. Ohi Benoel, was to, to, to bring something new in contrast to the traditional physical education classes that we usually used to, to, to do or uh, to, to apply with our students, uh, in which uh, the, the, the focus on developing individual skills in isolation. Uh, the emphasis in, on collaboration in group situations recognize the independent uh, nature of student learning. Uh, when teachers emphasized cooperation, students realized that they had learned how to connect with each other while also practicing individual skills. 
Uh, I mean, uh, in conclusion, the social constructivist instruction resides in shifting the focus from individual skill development to learning a social uh, construct. Uh, this was uh, the aim of our uh, uh, of our paper. Uh, that I hope that uh, uh, my colleagues uh, have uh, 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 have enjoyed. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, there is just one question, please, if you'd like to answer. Yeah, of course. Um, the question is, would you like, uh, sorry, would you provide illustrations on the types of instruction within uh, the uh, approach that you have suggested in your presentation, that is the uh, constructivist approach? Uh, so yes. What types of instructions do you usually uh, present for your uh, students? Uh, yes, so uh, this is what I've already mentioned. There are two uh, major methods. The first one is called the literature circles in which a student uh, 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 or, uh, or the teacher teach students how to use each other as resources and to become independent learners and represent a social experience for students who are accepted to talk a lot, in contrast to the rest of their time at school to debate and argue their ideas. It means that uh, when you give the, the student this chance of putting them in literature circles, a uh, student can be inspired and, uh, and eager to say things uh, between uh, their peers more than they dare to, to say it in front of the teacher. Uh, this is uh, one side. But here, the, the teacher has to, uh, to, uh, to be careful not to, uh, uh, to, uh, to encourage, uh, encourage reflection uh, with the students and uh, invest a significant uh, beforehand showing students how to work collectively. It means they, the, the, the teacher must uh, teach the students how to work collectively, then uh, uh, assign this kind, of, uh, uh, this kind of task or activities, let's say. The second method was uh, what we call uh, double entry journals. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is a kind of note-taking frameworks that help students contrast meaning as they interact with the text. It means the teacher assign a specific text or a selected text. Then students uh, will, be, uh, will be taught how to use this method in order to gain more benefits from the text. Uh, the journals uh, in this context, the journals become a place for students to easily recall thoughts and ideas as they read. Uh, double entry journals are one of the most simple and direct way to teach students to read or to review, listen to a text carefully. The, strat the strategy uh, supports English language learners in numerous ways. First, it helps the reading comprehension skills. This is one side. The second side, uh, uh, it gives a chance to conversational uh, interaction between students as well academic discourse about the text. In addition to enhance the writing skills, because at the end of this task, students will be given a, a, a writing assignments in order to respond to what they have already read using these notes uh, of, the, the, of this uh, journal as, as, as their personal resource. It means they go back to these notes they have already selected from the text and start writing their own uh, written production. So here we can see that uh, the learners will be developing their, their, uh, their learning skills all at the same time. They speak to one another, they interact, uh, they, they listen to one another, they are reading the text in attentively together, and at the end, they will be writing something, uh, I mean, a written production. So uh, developing the, the, the four skills all at the same time. I see. So uh, the literature class or the objective of the literature class is not really to teach literature per se, but rather to yeah. help EFL learners to develop their skills in learning the English language. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to go back to, again, Dr. Suheli and Dr. Idri. There is another question uh, for both of you. Uh, the question is, do you use online teaching in your literature classes? And if you do, which, which one or which mode do you think should be opted for? Online or face-to-face -face teaching of literature? So if Dr. Idri or Dr. Uh, Suheli would like to answer the question, please just uh, go ahead. Uh, 
Thank you, dear colleague. I was writing to you a, a, a chat to, to ask for uh, the mic. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, okay, so I always want to be sure about the question. Can you please repeat the question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the question is, do you, in fact, it has two parts. The first part is, do you use online teaching in your literature classes? And the second part, if you do, which mode do you think should be opted for, online or face-to-face -face teaching in the class of literature? Okay, thank you. So uh, speaking of online teaching, uh, the, basically we were forced uh, to put our, our, our courses um, on our personal websites, uh, not personal, let's say called professional, uh, because Batna University, Batna 2 University has allowed teachers to have um, um, personal profiles or websites in which they can upload uh, questions, uh, has provided the students with the emails. But I did not only rely on that, I relied also um, on my students' suggestions uh, to put, um, to create a, a messenger group on Facebook to which uh, they, they invited me and I tried to interact with them as much as possible. But if, 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 um, if I wanted to be more honest, uh, indeed, uh, I was very amateur at doing this. So the students uh, basically reason that uh, as long as they have the handouts, they can um, get prepared to the exam because I insist on testing and evaluation as much as that because rare are the students who are there just to learn. Uh, we have entered in a period of competition uh, in which students um, under the pressure of society and the pressure of their parents, etc., need to score the higher marks for ranking, for master, for doctorate. We are all teachers, we know all that basically. So uh, I always ask the students uh, to find the necessary balance between training um, uh, and scores. Um, so basically, uh, I, I was just giving them handouts. Uh, I would lie if I say that I have staged things or put videos, etc., because it was not possible because of the number of the students, because of technology issues like internet network, which does not so always work, etc., and because also of technophobia. Stud majority, of, a great number, considerable number of students was conservative regarding this. So uh, they favor online uh, online teaching. However, I must uh, I must just uh, report the experience of a colleague of, colleague of mine from the University of Algiers too, who was stuck in France because of the lockdown. You know the frontiers were closed, and she was authorized to provide her courses of literature online using Zoom. And the the feedback she she gave me was that it was extremely positive. Um, simply because she had a limited number of students, approximately 20 uh, per class. Uh, she said that they were regular, uh, that they did their task, that she was lecturing in, 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 uh, in groups uh, and subgroups, etc. So she had a very um, positive feedback. I did not have this uh, feedback. It was like uh, being able to close the year, be very pragmatic and help the students to get their marks. I insist on marks and testing because the students basically have entered uh, since a couple of years in this logic of competition, of scoring, etc., and have a little bit forgotten about the role uh, of, of the university that is training and preparing them to be able uh, really to, to do something in literature and to be able to use these references, which is quite uh, important and, and, uh, and interesting. To the second part of the question, of course, face-to-face uh, um, teaching um, can only be the 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 the, the, the valid way to do um, because online teaching can only operate uh, in emergency cases to avoid this dropout and this disconnection of the students uh, from the university. So personally, I'm very old school. I don't say it doesn't work, but it's a way just to catch up. Uh, the possible uh, drop out uh, of the students. I hope I have answered uh, the question. As usual, just elaborative enough and informative enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so the last question is addressed to uh, Mrs. Norhuda Bazizi. Uh, the question is, do you mean by post-colonial liter literature or readers or class, the post-coloniality as a state or as an experience? 
So I invite her to uh, join us here to answer the question. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, by post-colonial literature or reader or class, we mean both uh, post-colonial, uh, since we have already mentioned in the uh, presentation that we have two models for teaching post-colonial literature. We have uh, the method um, uh, theoretical model and regional model. The first, uh, let's say the regional model refers to previously colonized people, uh, regions, sorry, and post uh, and theoretical model refers to uh, people who, uh, uh, or literature written by people who experience uh, experience uh, post-colonial features or aspects like uh, people who are marginalized or uh, uh, stigmatized, let's say. So uh, by, uh, by a post-colonial literature readers or class, we mean both people who have undergone, uh, who have undergone uh, uh, colonialism, all people, poor people who are uh, uh, like uh, who are experiencing a post-colonial state, uh, people who are marginalized, stigmatized, and uh, like for example, for yeah, example, the say, American African when we say uh, when we uh, talk about the uh, African Americans, here we are uh, talking about marginalized people or stigmatized. Yeah. Sorry. Now I can continue. So I said, yes, we refer to both uh, post-coloniality as a state and an experience. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe that to answer uh, such a question, we need first of all to know what is colonialism or what is meant by colonial experience in the word post-colonial as one word or post-colonial because uh, there are different types of colonialism. The first one is the physical colonialism, which is uh, the one like with the uh, with the uh, with the armed forces and military forces occupying a certain land. But there is also, and especially after, uh, like in the in the recent decades, there is also uh, what is called the cultural dominance or the cultural colonialism or the colonization of the mind, which refers most to post-coloniality as a state more than post-coloniality as or post-colonialism as uh, an experience. So, do we have any further questions, any further comments by any of the participants? And then I declare the second session closed. We'll uh, go back, uh, sorry, we'll go for a break. And then we'll be back with the third session chaired by Dr. Deep Noel. Thank you so much.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين. Uh, good afternoon everyone. This is Dr. Deeb Nawal. I would like to uh, welcome you again. So uh, right now we will proceed with the third session entitled Critical Thinking and English Language Teaching. Now the بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شكون داخل التليفون داخل التليفون لا كونفرنس شكون داخل لا كونفرنس التليفون شكون داخل التليفون ادخل بك بتاكد ان الصوت كاين لا هي صح المره تطلع هنا تطلع هنا بلي راهي هي اللي تهضر دري دي خايف من داخل You are here in Normandy. Okay. So, Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Deeb Nawal. Uh, welcome again. So, uh, we will proceed right now with the third session entitled okay. Critical Thinking and English Language Teaching. And uh, as researchers, we know how valuable and the role of um, critical thinking skills uh, are in both the, uh, the university setting and even the professional one, since they uh, let students think out of the box and um, let's say, understand the content um, on a deeper and more lasting level. That's why uh, it's advisable to think about how to implement critical thinking skills in um, our lessons. And I think uh, uh, this can be answered by the, uh, the first presentation by uh, Ms. Amal Lekhal from the University of Khanshla and Dr. Ahmed Bishar from the University of Biskra with the presentation entitled as uh, Integrating Critical and Creative Thinking in EFL Classroom Challenges and Restrictions. Hello everyone, this is Amal Lekhal from University of Abbas Laghrur Khanshla, Algeria. I am a third year PhD student, speciality of didactics of literary text. My presentation is titled Integrating Critical and Creative Thinking in EFL Classroom Challenges and Restrictions. My presentation will cover the following points. Due to the 21st century's constant change and development in the educational system, especially in language teaching, teachers are always concerned with adopting new skills and using new approaches. New approaches. Teachers work towards enhancing EFL learners' role in the classroom and encourage them to be active and aware participants. Critical and creative thinking is one of these skills that may help EFL learners be autonomous and independent in their learning process. These skills could help EFL teachers create more space for EFL learners to bring new ideas and perceptions into life. However, integrating critical and creative thinking skills in the EFL classroom might cause some limitations or challenges. This presentation tends to investigate the challenges and restrictions that EFL teachers may face while integrating critical and creative thinking skills in teaching in the EFL classroom. 
The research adopts an online survey distant towards EFL teachers. The collected responses make clear the concerns formed on the restrictions and challenges that these teachers may face when trying to integrate the critical, for creative, critical and creative skills in their classrooms. Starting with a definition for creative thinking, uh, it is an essential component for the language use in that it requires learners to use their thinking processes to be able to create new, intelligible, relevant, and original meanings. Also, creative thinking is defined as the thinking that enables students to apply their imagination to generating ideas, questions, and hypotheses, experimenting with alternatives, and to evaluating their own and their peers' ideas, final products, and processes. Uh, moving on to the definition of critical thinking, uh, it is defined as uh, thinking as reasonably reflective thinking that it is focused on the deciding what to do or what to believe. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking involves learning to evaluate, drawing inferences and arrive at conclusions based on the evidence. In other words, critical thinking is thinking critically. In It has both cognitive and attitudinal dimensions. On the one hand, a learner must know how to think critically. On the other hand, one must be inclined to do so on appropriate occasions. Putting critical thinking and creative thinking side by side, we notice that uh, critical thinking uh, involves the ability to question, use logic, remain objective, examine, analyze, interpret and evaluate reason and reflect on the uh, information or the data or uh, the, the ideas of a specific topic and then come up with a conclusion or form an opinion about that specific topic whereas creative thinking involves the ability to be open-minded to new ideas be flexible to accept different uh, different let's say uh, ventures adaptability risk taking uh, bring something original elaboration brainstorming and imagery also imagination is uh, a very uh, important part of creative thinking Moving on to the research questions. Uh, the research questions are mainly two. Uh, first, what are the challenges and limitations uh, that may face EFL learners when integrating both critical and creative thinking skills in the EFL classroom? The second question is what are the possible solutions to ease some of these challenges and limitations? Uh, this research aims to explore EFL teachers' concerns on the challenges that may occur when integrating creative and critical thinking skills in the EFL classroom. The research also aims to explore some of the proposed solutions, solutions by EFL teachers to try and break free from some of the restrictions they face when integrating these skills. Uh, the methodology uh, teachers, 10 teachers participated and responded to the shared survey via Facebook platform. The online survey consists of eight questions uh, which address uh, issues at hand. The first part focuses on the teachers' views on these skills and how they evaluate their learners' performance or outcome in the classroom concerning the critical and creative thinking skills. The second part of the survey focuses on the two main questions of this research which are uh, the, the limitations and uh, challenges of integrating these skills into EFL classrooms and the solutions proposed by teachers. Uh, moving on to the results and discussions. Uh, for the first questions, uh, we noticed that uh, the majority of teachers, all, all of the teachers think that uh, are interested in integrating new skills and new approaches in their classrooms. Uh, the majority of teachers, uh, on, the un on the one hand, believe that uh, learners are active and particip active participant in their classroom. Only two think that uh, their learners are not that active or that uh, part, the active participant uh, in the classroom. Moving on to the next questions, uh, all of the teachers think that adopting uh, creative and critical thinking for learners may help them become more autonomous. Next question, 
eight teachers believe that uh, integrating critical and creative thinking in language classroom may cause some challenges and limitations for them while uh, doing so. And one specific teacher think that the use of any innovative approach would result in finding challenges at first. Moving on to the next questions, uh, teachers here rate uh, their, uh, their learners critical and creative thinking skills. So uh, as we notice that uh, the scale goes from one to five, uh, one being the lowest and five being the highest, most teacher uh, think that uh, their, um, their learners are average when it comes to creative, creative and critical thinking skills. Here for the main question of this research, which is uh, moving on to the next uh, question, uh, which is the main question of this research. What are some of the challenges and limitations that may face, face teachers when integrating the creative and critical thinking skills? So here, I think most of the, uh, the answers of uh, the teachers, as you see here, uh, are concerned with the motivation of the learners uh, but lacking background knowledge to be more critical and analyze some topics. Also here some teachers are concerned about the differences uh, uh, between learners and how they view, view things. Uh, also some teachers think that the learners are not mainly interested in these two skills and they are mainly interested with grades and passing the exams. They neglect and forget that critical and creative thinking skills are not just for the classroom but also uh, are very important uh, in all the domains of life. Uh, also, some teachers think that uh, the differences that are between uh, learners may cause some conflicts and uh, especially uh, about some specific topics uh, because different learners have different upbringings and different beliefs so uh, their perspective or their views towards one topic might be different and might cause some uh, perturbance uh, during the classroom uh, which we in uh, hinder the uh, learning process. Here uh, also uh, it is difficult to overcome or break the cycle requires individuals to stand uh, apart from the group and question opinions here when group working uh, with their classmates some uh, learners might have some egocentric thinking and they might like affect the thinking of their classmates which uh, will like uh, let's say dim the voices of uh, most of the learners and uh, that is what's known as egocentric uh, behavior here some teachers also are uh, concerned with the schedule pressures and uh, the biased experiences of learners uh, which are very narrow main minded when it comes to some topics Uh, moving on to uh, the solutions that are uh, suggested by uh, teachers are mainly, uh, let's say, focused on the teachers' roles and how they need to uh, organize and order, remind learners that they should respect that this is an, ed an educational setting and no personal ties, uh, especially uh, when some topics are brought into discussion. They, sim they th simply should not take it personally. Also, uh, teachers should always keep trying to find new motivational ways in order to uh, to uh, motivate the learners uh, into, uh, let's say, uh, understanding how important is these two skills in the language classroom. Also, uh, let teachers need to guide and uh, their learners and advise them to uh, try to read more in order to acquire uh, some background knowledge about different topics which will help them into uh, being more creative and more crit critical in their uh, discussion or their creation. Here, uh, and their own uh, their own ideas about specific topics so uh, these are the, the answers that uh, I uh, 
extracted from the online survey. So coming to a conclusion which summarizes the results that show that EFL teachers are always open to integrate new skills and innovative ways of teaching to enhance the quality of learners' performance in the classroom. Also, the results show that teachers believe that both the creative and critical skills are crucial and important in fostering learners' autonomy in, in, and classroom participations. However, when, with innovative ways that give learners the space to explore their talents and thoughts on different topics, they can also switch the talent to them. Yeah, like differences between learners, social restrictions, bias experiences, schedules, restriction. Also, uh, let's say the egocentric thinking of some students that might dim the other opinions of other learners. Here, the solution that were suggested ranged from reinforcing learners' motivations to teachers' important role and te to teachers' important roles as guides to avoid conflicts and issue order and respect between learners, to create a safe space where they could be creative and question things in a respectful environment. So uh, this is all for uh, today's presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have so uh, thank you so much for this very informative presentation. Um, I think what I can add to to your presentation is that um, teachers should use effective questioning skills inside EFL classes. Of course, we're paying attention to uh, to the extra curricular activities the teachers are responsible for. And one um, very important point is that um, teachers uh, should be role models for the for the learn, for their the learners by being very good critical thinking uh, thinkers themselves. Um, uh, with the same realm, we will move to we will we will move to the presentation of uh, Dr. Noel Deep from the University of Wergla, entitled as "Fostering Foreign English Learners Critical Thinking Through Flipped Classroom." Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafi al-mursaleen. This is Dr. Deep Nawal from the University of Qasdim Marbah Wargla. Algeria, Department of Letters and English Language. My presentation is entitled as Fostering Foreign English Learners Critical Thinking Through Flipped Classroom. The COVID-19 pandemic is mainly a health calamity which caused a global lockdown. The educational system received a massive shock and faced the dilemma of whether close or keep school open. At the same time as the drastic change in humans' daily life was being so fast, education also adapted with the situation and maintained its advance with inventive learning approaches. Concerning Algerian universities, this conversion and revolution in the educational field led to the use of the flipped classroom system. Then what is the flipped classroom? The flipped classroom is a model of an intermingled education which consists of two parts. First, there is a kind of an individual teaching online where students learn the content, the content of the lesson, usually at home. Concerning the second part, during class time, students bring their homework to be corrected by their teachers and discuss together what has been presented online. Therefore, in the flipped classroom, a teacher interacting with students and students with each other is more emphasized than lecturing. 
For that reason, this model is said to emphasize a student-centered learning, where students prepare themselves before class by watching videos, listening to podcasts, and reading articles. Besides, it is also a model which contributes to make learners take their own learning responsibilities. In fact, this model has been first used in 2007 by chemistry teachers Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sam from Woodland Park High School, who recorded live lessons and broadcasted them online for absent students. Simply said, the flipped classroom is what is done at school, done at home, homework done at home, completed in class. The following figure illustrates the difference between the traditional model and the flipped one. As it is shown in the figure, we see that the places of classroom practices are changed. Since in flipped classrooms, students watch lesson videos at any computer, from their tablets, smartphones, or from different media players at any time as they want. Then they bring their homework to the classroom and participate actively to learn the process. Also, in the flipped classroom model, the educator is no longer a direct person to educate, but actually he or she uses different technologies and provides flexible learning to students one by one or as a group. Teacher discusses the subjects that are not understood well by the students and reinforces the subjects with different activities. Flipped classroom approach does not eliminate the education in the class directly. On the contrary, this approach maximizes the time spent for each student instead of spending time for all students at once. To understand what a flipped classroom is, you need to understand the change in the roles of both the teacher and the students. As for the teacher's role, they need to create learning condition based on questioning instead of transferring knowledge directly. They are a guide to make learning easy. They make one-to-one -one interaction with students by correcting misunderstandings. They individualize learning for each student. They use technological equipment suitable for learning condition. They create interactive discussion conditions. They increase participation of students and they share lecture videos as out-of-class activity. Concerning the student's role, they take their own learning responsibilities. They watch lecture videos before the course and prepare for the course by using learning materials. They learn at their own learning speed. They make necessary interactions with the teacher and friends. They take and give feedback also. They participate in discussions within class and teamwork. A successful class is characterized by the intensification of teacher-student communication throughout class time. Moreover, a healthy learning process is the one built through students' inquest and application, not through memorization of information. As Dr. Mazur said, once you engage the students' minds, there is an eagerness to learn, to be right, to master. This actually goes in parallel with what is offered in the flipped class as it is seen in the following advantages. More time can be spent with students about the original research. Students are able to spend more time with scientific equipment that can only be used in the classroom. Students being able to easily follow the classes which they couldn't because of sports conference activities. The method here pushes up students to think and study out inside and outside the classroom. Students being more active in the learning process. Students will participate to the learning environment more actively, and this will cause students to love the work they do. In this research, it is assumed that teachers are in charge of guiding students how to learn and control, control their own learning. Nowadays, at university level in Algeria, teachers are asked to flip their classes, i.e. blend between online and in-person classes. For that reason, we attempt to view the efficiency of flipped classroom in implementing and fostering the critical skills. We intend to get the attitudes and feedback of 10 university teachers on how they apply the flipped classroom and also how could they develop the students' critical skills using, using this model. Our study will be guided by the following questions. How is the flipped classroom prepared for? Since preparing for a flipped lesson is different from the way teachers typically prepare for and plan a, a traditional lesson. How is the learning process perceived by teachers in the flipped classroom? And what position do teachers hold to develop their, their students' critical thinking skills in the flipped classroom? 
for the reason of to examine teachers' classroom behaviors and practices to observe what actually happens during class time and to try to determine the factors that contribute to effective implementation and fostering of the critical skills. To conduct our study, we constructed a questionnaire for teachers aiming at unveiling the teachers' attitudes about flipped classroom and their approach to implement and develop students' critical thinking skills. We administered, we administered the teachers' questionnaires to 10 teachers at the Department of Letters and English at the University of Qasli Merbah Wergla to get better insight on whether or not they implement development of critical thinking skills in their flipped classes. The teachers' questionnaire is presented through 15 questions alienated into three sections. Section one, entitled Lesson Planning, aims to have insight on teachers' perspective in preparing for a flipped class and the responsibility they hold as a facilitator of learning, the approach they follow in planning and presenting the lesson, and how do they assess students in a flipped class. Section 2, entitled Classroom Practices, seeks to collect teachers' opinion about the nature of the learning process in a flipped class, to inspect the teacher's self-reflection about students' reaction to this model of teaching. Section 3, the student's performance and engagement, aimed at collecting teachers' insights and perceptions on the relevance and importance of the flipped classroom in increasing students' engagement in the learning process. Concerning the analysis and the interpretation of the results, it, they are shown in the following tables. As it is observed from the table 1, all the participants use technological materials and take the role of facilitator. And most of them, which is 70% of the population, emphasize direct instruction and clear expectations for and from students, and accentuate assessments that develop students' points of view towards the subject presented. As a matter of fact, in every section, we provided one open question. The, the one of the section one is, how has the flipped classroom model changed the way you prepare for lessons? Here, teachers' answers hovered mainly around one answer. Teachers change the way of preparing the lessons, become more concise in establishing the most important points to record. They reported that in a flipped classroom, the teacher is encouraged to shift away from the traditional way of just stockpiling learners with knowledge into thinking about new ways to just pave the way for students to discover their learning needs to achieve higher level of learning. Concerning uh, the classroom practices, the results of uh, this section shows that all participants reported that they shifted their classes to a learner-centered one, and the majority, which is 80%, reported that more class time becomes available, learning is more dynamic and practical, and they meet the needs of individual students. For the open question here, it was how are the students reacting to this model? Most teachers agreed upon the fact that students were at ease in using the technology device since they come from a digital generation. Moreover, students are allowed to study at their own pace. Whenever they feel ready, they check the video online and they might pause and review at any time. With reference to the, res to the results of Section 3, which tackles the students' performance and engagement, we can see that 80% of the participants believe that the students' role in the class changed to an active and all to an active one and also the same percentage reported that the students demonstrate uh, an increase in understanding and achievement concerning question two and three, almost all the participants, which is 90%, observe that the students are more engaged in problem solving and they do interact more between each other. For the open question, we said, in your opinion, how effective is the flipped classroom model in your classroom? The teachers reported that some of them emphasized the importance of video presentation in a flipped class and how it helped in the learning process. Others reported the struggle they faced since many of them did not have a training in the model. Just like some teachers are not skilled in technology devices such as making a video. With reference to the gathered results from the teacher's questionnaire, we conclude that there is a reason to judge that flipped learning in the classroom may foster students' learning process into a more centered one when it is employed attentively.
By employing the flipped teaching, we are given the chance as teachers to guide our students to higher level levels of learning. Furthermore, the results obtained from the study will lend a hand to teachers and policymakers to increase practices that engage students in the learning process of a flipped class. Hence, endorse the student's academic and even personal career. The results obtained from the study as well will pave the way for future consideration to assist and train teachers how to benefit from a flipped class in empowering learners with critical thinking skills. To do so, it will be suggested for further research to scrutinize the use and practices of the flipped classroom for the sake of, maybe in the future, adjusting teachers' practices as they continue with the model in the coming years. Based on the findings from the review of literature and the results obtained from the practical part, it has been demonstrated that the thoughtful usage of the flipped classroom may foster learners' critical thinking skills. Therefore, it is worth considering its implementation and the factors that contribute to the effective realization of the flipped class as it promotes students' understanding, engagement, and achievement. That is why it is wiser for a qualified education system to keep up with the new situation by taking advantage of the speed of the development in technology and attempt to transform and develop new innovative learning approaches for the benefit of our students. Thank you so much for your attention. So uh, I would like to apologize for the uh, quality of the video. I think that was a technical problem. Um, so within the same sphere, we will uh, move now to the presentation of Ms. Bougelmouna Ahlem from the University of Wargla and uh, Dr. Halimi Benzouk from the University of Wargla as well uh, with the title, Implementing the Task-Based Learning Approach to enhance EFL students' critical thinking. entitled Implementing Task-Based Learning to Enhance EFL Students' Critical Thinking. So, let us present our outline. We start with an introduction, then we move to task-based learning in a glance, critical thinking in the EFL classroom, enhancing critical thinking by implementing a set of tasks, and then a conclusion. In the modern perspectives of teaching, students are to be the protagonists of their learning. The need to incorporate activities that fully engage students in, is of paramount importance since engaging students makes them responsible and aware of their own learning. Teachers usually aspire to adopt approaches that stress students' role as the doers. This exposes them to a variety of tasks that urges them to activate their mental abilities, among which is critical thinking. Critical thinking is a key skill enabling students to be conscious and to possess an analytical eye throughout the learning. And critical thinking for sure enables students to learn languages better. Among the approaches that might help the EFL students to think critically and for sure to foster their criticality and act freely in the learning environment is the TBL that stands for the task-based learning. Task-based learning in a glance. Task-based learning is considered to be the development of the CLT, that is, the communicative language teaching. Some of the experts of, or the linguists make the assumptions that the task-based learning is the logical development or the logical continuation of the communicative language teaching. 
This is owing to the adoption of the CLT's pillar principles. It means the task-based learning adopts some of the principles of the communicative language teaching. Task-based learning emphasizes the notion that natural language learning processes can enhance an optimum learning and an optimum learning environment in the classroom. It opts for tasks to be the vehicle of learning in the classroom. Tasks are defined as activities where the target language is used by the learner for a communicative purpose to achieve an outcome. It means that students do some activities using the target language in order to achieve a communicative purpose. Now we move to the critical thinking in the EFL classroom. Critical thinking is defined as a process through which people can develop different mental and metacognitive skills so as to be able to analyze, reflect, make decisions and intelligent actions. Bayer claims that critical thinking encompasses the individual's capacity to gather information, evaluate it and make use of it efficiently. In the EFL classroom, critical thinking is highly recommended since teachers are constantly aspiring to form the type of students who act in an autonomous and conscious way in their learning. In other words, students who are responsible of their own learning, who can assess themselves, who can assess their learning. So critical thinking enables students to communicate and use English properly and this is the purpose that teachers are looking for. So they are looking to activate the students critical thinking and when students activate their critical thinking this leads them for sure to learn the language in a conscious and in better way. Being critical is in Pineda's view a lifelong process. It means it is not a matter of one session or two sessions. So it is a lifelong process and teachers can adopt tasks, for example, that activate the student's critical thinking and this, is, can be, this can be considered to be as the first step in the development or the activation of the student's critical thinking. It means to be a critical thinker is not a matter of um, one session or two sessions. So, critical thinking is only enhanced through time and life experiences. To develop students' critical thinking, teachers are required to expose them to a bunch of critical thinking related tasks. These include, according to Willis, six types of tasks ranging from simple to complex ones. They are creative, comparing, sharing, personal experience, altering and sorting, problem solving and listing. Practical examples of these types are as follows. Listing, for example, this includes brainstorming, fact finding, ordering and sorting, such as sequencing items, categorizing items and classifying items. Comparing, this includes finding similarities, finding uh, differences. Problem solving, these are principally related to real life, show, real life problems. It means activities that are related to real life, that are life-like activities as we call them. Short puzzles, expressing hypotheses, describing experiences, and so on. Sharing personal experiences, these tasks encourage learners to express themselves freely and share their personal experiences with others. Creative tasks, these involve projects or they are called projects that make students collaborative, uh, co collaboratory in groups and pair works. Now we move to the conclusion of this short presentation. It is indispensable for language learners to improve their skills, to think critically, then to improve their language learning skills accordingly. So, as I have mentioned before, when students improve their critical skills, they can improve their learning of, the, of languages. 
If a teacher should work constantly to help their students to promote their critical thinking skills, the implementation of the task-based learning in the EFL classroom enhances to a great extent students' criticality and helps them in a better to learn in a better way. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation entitled Implementing Task Uh, I would like to thank Ms. Bugelmuna and Dr. Benzouk for this very informative uh, presentation. And I do agree with, uh, with your findings since in a task-based lesson, the, um, the language to be studied is actually not predetermined pre by, uh, by the teacher. And uh, the lesson is based around the completion of a task and the language also studied is determined by what the student will complete. So here we are saying, with what the student will complete. So um, in other words, we are speaking about how students hold responsibility of their own learning process. And this is what we look for in implementing critical thinking skills. So within the same realm, we will uh, now pass to the uh, presentation of Ms. Ashori Karima from uh, Biskra University with the presentation entitled S. Using the Socratic seminars in writing classrooms, a possible strategy to enhance the students' critical thinking skills. So this is Kerima Ashwari from the University of Biskra. My presentation today is entitled Using the Socratic Seminaries in Writing Classrooms, a Possible Strategy to Enhance the Students' Critical Thinking Skills. So my presentation is organized as shown here in this slide. Right. At the present time, the concept of students' autonomy acquires a significant importance. Today, one of the primary aims of higher education is to make the students more active in their learning process. The intended outcome of today's work is to facilitate the students' engagement in order to foster important skills that may call for a lifelong learning, such as the critical thinking skills, which can be fostered through a student-led discussions technique, which itself is based on Socrates' methods or the Socratic seminars. So before I move on, I should define this concept. The Socratic seminar is a method used to understand information by creating dialectic in class regarding a specific text. During this activity, participants seek deeper understanding of complex ideas in text through rigorous, thoughtful dialogue rather than by memorizing bits of information. So despite the fact that critical thinking is an essential skill for university students as they need to analyze and evaluate their learning outcome, however, most teachers tend to teach the way they were taught with an emphasis on instructor-based strategies that value content acquisition over the learning process. This habitual way of teaching, in fact, impedes the integration ways or the integration of the different ways that may reinforce the student's critical thinking skills. Accordingly, the present small-scale study aimed to investigate the effect of the Socratic seminars in helping the students thinking critically about their writing. The question raised here is, how could the Socratic seminars affect the students' writing performances and raise their critical thinking skills? It is assumed that engaging the students into their learning process would positively affect the students' writing skills and critical thinking skills as well. To this end, a quasi-experimental research method was conducted with 32 students enrolled at the University of Tabissa. Right, in this slide, we can see that 
or we can see the different steps that have been taken into consideration during the realization of this small case study. First, choosing a topic. Second, preparation of the first drafts. Third, set up inner and outer circles. Fourth, questioning the students. So in this case, the Socratic circus circle starts with a question raised by the teacher. The question has no right answer and it generates new other questions that have been raised later on by the students themselves. Fifth and the last step is discussion. Statistically speaking, we can see in this table that the mean score of the pre-test was higher than the mean score of the post-test, which means that the students' writing abilities have been improved after being exposed to the intervention. In the second table, the T-value here is negative 5.41, which is less than 0 0.05. It should be noted that in this study, the P-value is set at alpha level 0.05, which proves that there is 95% probability that the difference between the same group before and after the intervention did not occur by chance. So taking into account this result, it can be said that there is a significant development in the participants' writing abilities. Accordingly, the formulated hypothesis is confirmed. During the Socratic circles, it was found that the students had an equal opportunity in which they shared their knowledge and raised their problem solving skills. However, this study has also some inevitable limitations, such if among them overcrowded classrooms, L1 interference, problems of classroom arrangements, and time constraints. So the obtained results show that the students became more engaged in their learning. After the intervention, they recognized that their writing can be discussed and refined according to their peer commentaries. During the Socratic circles, they, they have discovered the new ideas, new writing styles, and their writing abilities have been as well improved. So my presentation comes to an end, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Ms. Achori Karima. So, uh, as I have understood and adding to what you have uh, presented, uh, so you are actually creating dialectic, dialectic sorry, in the class. It means you are using uh, reasoned methods, argumentation. So, um, I guess that it's very helpful in classes, but Concerning university classes, sometimes it works with some subjects and others it, it, it doesn't, since it is kind of um, time consuming. So I think uh, with this uh, with this paper, you opened a new horizon for uh, for other researchers to scrutinize more this uh, dialectic in class. Thank you so much. Uh, with the same sphere, we will uh, uh, now proceed with the last presentation of uh, Dr. Tisan Tuhemi from the University Center of AFLU, uh, entitled as the Pedagogy of Skills and the Threshold Theory at the Service of Criticality and Creativity. And uh, meanwhile, I would like to remind the participants to feel free to, um, to ask questions in the chat and box area. presentation is the pedagogy of skills. Good morning. The title of this presentation is the pedagogy of skills and the threshold theory at the service of criticality and creativity. The table of contents includes a theoretical background on the 21st century education, the pedagogy of skills, as well as the threshold theory. The blending learning model, at the end we have a conceptual framework that would combine all three and the practice of the proposed conceptual framework at the level of literary class, master's one's level. The 20th century education 
uh, what synonymous of compliance and conformity over creativity. The two skills highlighted, which are compliance and conformity, were considered to be necessary to do well in the professional environment, and it perhaps was accurate for the 20th century. However, in the 21st century, the focus is more on creativity to face a complex world challenges. And this is becoming increasingly clear in education and the workplace. But while the idea of success has changed, the education system has not always adjusted. The 20th century education. The 20th century education is a four-dimensional education. Uh, it has broadened uh, the focus from teaching, uh, from its content-based teaching, to the, to the teaching of the necessary skills for academic and career success. It is a four-dimensional education that requires the intersection between four distinct dimensions. The first dimension is knowledge, that is to say, the content or the know what. The second dimension is character, or more specifically, the know how to be and how to behave in the world. The third dimension are the skills, or the know how to bring the previous two dimensions together through the four C's. We'll explain these uh, in the next slide. And finally, the fourth dimension, which is uh, perhaps the holy grail of all educators, I guess, is the meta-learning dimension, which could be translated to the autonomous learner par excellence. The dimensional education of the 21st century calls for a new pedagogical uh, approach, namely the pedagogy, the sorry, the pedagogy of skills. So what is meant by this pedagogy? Um, in simple words, it is the incorporation of skills development in the content teaching. Uh, that is to say that teaching approaches and strategies should include activities that develop the following skills. The learning skills, which are the four uh, C's, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration and communication, the literacy skills, the modern ones and the traditional ones. By the traditional ones, we mean literacy. Uh, modern ones, it uh, refers to illiteracy. And finally, uh, life skills, which are related to personality and character. The focus of this research is going to be on the learning skills that are essential to bridge the gap, to, sorry, to bridge the gap between the know what, which is the knowledge, and the know how, which is how to uh, apply this knowledge. Um, the skills we are focusing on are critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. So, if we need to sum up so far, the four-dimensional education of skills uh, focuses on incorporating the four C's and the teaching approach and strategies might be the magical portion to the best teaching practices. In theory, that might be correct. However, uh, in practice, not so sure. Especially when critical thinking, which is a cognitive mind process, and creativity, which is a personality trait, are involved in the mix. Which brings us to a crucial question, which is how smart do you have to be to succeed? This question in particular was the trigger for the first longitudinal research study conducted over 65 years from 1921 to 1986. This research study that became known as the Genetic Studies of Genius conducted by Lewis Terman in 1921, a psychologist at, the, uh, at Stanford University. The study gathered a sample of 1,000 smarter students in California who became known as the termite. And the aim of the study was to observe or investigate the correlation between success okay, and intelligence. 
Surprisingly, the finding of this research showed that IQ, that is to say intelligence, does not necessarily equal creativity and genius. The finding also highlights that above a certain level, intelligence does not have much effect on creativity. Intelligence has no correlation with being fantastically creative. Rather, it is a minimum threshold you need to have, and after that, it becomes down to a lot of practice to develop skills. So the words that are highlighted here are the minimum threshold and the skills to be developed. Threshold is the point at which something begins. But it is also a key concept in the contemporary theory in pedagogy. The core idea is that threshold concepts are distinctively troublesome for students and act as gatekeepers to their disciplines. The objective of teaching becomes helping students cross the portal. A crossing of the threshold serves as a means of transformative learning and promotion of critical thinking. It only makes sense this return to the threshold. Why? Because from one hand, we have we are in the age of infobusity, where too much information kills the information. And from the other hand, we have the generation Z and the generation alpha who are considered as digital natives. And these digital natives, they, they are facing infobusity. Unfortunately, they are very skilled, skilled in accessing the information, but they're not so skilled in evaluating the information or the source of the information. So what we could suggest at this level or at this point is a threshold model combined with a blended learning model in order to bring the students to a, a better, uh, sorry, to bring the student to the 21st century education requirement. For the threshold model, the teacher selects the prerequisites to cross the threshold in the pre preliminal phase, which triggers the critical thinking or the cognitive mind process in the liminal phase. And the post-liminal phase is for the student's feedback. And all three phases will be designed in a blended learning model. In the following section, we present a conceptual framework related to these theories. The following graph, we try to create a visual illustration of the threshold theory by juxtaposing the uh, threshold theory against Bloom's taxonomy. This iceberg-like illustration highlights the prerequisites to cross the thresholds toward creativity. The problem with this framework is that the teacher has the control over the prerequisites. So this model is in fact at a very high risk of becoming uh, another version of the banking model system, okay? And the banking model system uh, is just a repressive model, a repressive form of teaching that doesn't allow for um, creativity or critical thinking. It's a, it's a very repressive system, a repressive teaching. Uh, the main depository of knowledge is the teacher, and it is. Uh, it hinders critical thinking and creativity. Now, also, if we consider uh, the blended learning model, okay, in this framework or in this sorry illustration, we uh, again juxtaposed the Bloom's taxonomy against a flipped classroom model. We could see that in the lower order thinking part, the students are in an independent study. And in this independent study, students are seeking information from uh, open sourced world. So again, we are at risk of facing the idea of infobesity, considering that our students or the generation Z and the alpha 
students, the generation alpha students are not equipped with that analytical, with those analytical skills to evaluate the info. Therefore, both models have advantages and inconvenience. Um, at this point, what is needed is to bridge the gap between the two, and this could be achieved through incorporating the pedagogy of skills. The blended learning model has advantages where it brings the student to a higher level order thinking, and the threshold model, uh, the threshold theory model, encourages the students to to acquire the prerequisites in order to reach a level of creativity. So in order for these two models to function properly, what is needed is to have the necessary skills, the skills advocated by the 21st century education, and they need to be scattered properly in order to achieve the purpose needed. More specifically, this has been practiced with the class of literature. This is the framework we came up with. Again, in this model, we have all three concepts together. This, concept, this conceptual framework shows the blended learning model where the learning objectives includes the threshold and the 21st century skills all together. In the first, in the lower order parts, the students, they have, uh, sorry, in the, uh, with the red arrows, you have the student independent study in the lower parts. In the upper parts, you have the students, uh, the teacher student engagement with the content, and this is where the higher order thinking level occurs. As far as the uh, blue arrows or the blue uh, uh, frames, uh, you have in the upper part creativity and the lower part are the prerequisites that needs to be achieved in order to uh, reach creativity. Now, in the lower parts, we have the communication and collaborative skills that would allow the students to go through the lower part of the, uh, of the pyramid. The critical thinking and creativity are considered to be higher order level thinking skills that could be incorporated in the third part. So, this framework is going to be juxtaposed against a program or is going to be aligned with a, a course design. We designed the course in four units, considered as the threshold to literary class. The units covered were first phase, second phase, third phase, and fourth phase. In the first phase, it was the historical context and ideologies. To be more precise, the course covered was modernism, literary, uh, modernism and literature. In the second phase, we have the philosophers and thinkers. In the third phase, literary concepts and techniques. And in the fourth phase, or the fourth week, sorry, the corpus analysis. Now, the first phase uh, coincides or is, is aligned with a pre-classroom uh, activity in the flipped classroom. And the skills we focus on are collaboration and communication. The students were able to collaborate with each other and the teacher and communicate through various multimedia tools. In the second phase, uh, it was a bit more sensitive considering that philosophies are a bit difficult for students to understand. And uh, it was better to have it in a face-to-face -face phase. And even then, we managed to have collaboration and communication. The third phase, which are literary concepts and techniques, it was through a learning platform it was pre-classroom. The students were able to use critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. Again, between communication and collaboration between students and with the teacher. In the fourth week, which is the final phase, we moved to the corpus analysis. Now, in the first, second, and third phase, it is considered to be the threshold or the, the prerequisites to cross to the next one. The next one, which is the creativity, involved the uh, analysis of the corpus. All the students share the same prerequisite knowledge. When it came to the analysis of the content, now we start seeing different points of view, different analysis, and it, it was extremely, I mean, not extremely, but it was very creative, okay? At, well, at least it was not copy-based. In the final phase, we also were able to see, it was face-to-face, -face, and we were able to see the skill of critical thinking and creativity. 
So this is a these are examples of the correspondence and the connect of the sorry the collaboration and the communication of the students with each other and the teacher. They created a group where they were able to exchange documents, sources, books, ideas, information, perfect illustration of collaboration. They were able of course to communicate with each other on instant messaging. And sometimes in their conversation you could see uh, discussions about concepts and terms and even analysis of themes. They would diverge, their, the, their ideas would diverge, which is quite interesting. So that means that there is an actual critical thinking and even a creative drive going on there. I hope that I did not exceed my time and I hope that was clear. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you, Dr. Tissam uh, Tuhami. Uh, as a matter of fact, you exceeded the time allotted, but I didn't want to stop the video uh, because as a researcher, I know that the conclusion is considered as one of the most important parts in um, any research. So now I invite you, my, uh, my colleagues, to uh, contribute to the debate and let's debate. Uh, I can see that I have two uh, questions for, for me. So question number one, COVID-19 obliged us to use flipped learning. That is to say, teachers and students use flipped classroom by force and not by choice. Do you think that we are prepared for flipped classroom? Tricky question. <laughs> um, we are not we were not prepared for the flipped classroom. Uh, but as good, responsible teachers, I think we have to adapt to the situation. We are responsible for ensuring a successful learning process. So whatever the situation is, we, we have to, to, to adjust to it. Um, Personally, in the beginning, I was lost, to be honest. I was lost, and um, not only me. I think that even some of my colleagues uh, reported the same thing. But actually, as a teacher, we have to make research. And as I have said, we have to adapt to the situation. So through time, myself, and I speak about my own experience, I think that, uh, by making research, you can adjust to the situation, you can adapt, and you can make your students adapt to also. Uh, question number two, for me also, is flipped classrooms successful? Another tricky question. Um, yes, I do think it is. Now, with uh, some conditions, uh, as I have said in the beginning, not all students um, can have access to the internet. It's true, but I think you can find um, uh, you can find solutions. For example, with my students, we uh, we created um, a Facebook page, and uh, I will not make an ad to uh, to. Uh, Okay, I will stop here, but we have we can use Facebook for free. There is a free Facebook. So students can have access to, to, to Facebook. So I did that on purpose and I was uh, publishing whether the, uh, the, the, the lessons or homework or even the help. Uh, I used to help my students through um, uh, Messenger and I felt that I was dealing with every single student. Uh, though in the traditional classes, we, we, we didn't have this chance to, uh, to deal with every single student. That's why I say that we have to always look for the, uh, the, the shining part of a flipped classroom. I would say that it's successful. Let's be optimistic. Uh, third question goes for Dr. Tuhani. How can we make students pass from portal to get into creativity? So Dr. Tuhani, are you here to, uh, to answer the question, please? 
Dr. Tuhami. Tuhami Ptisam. So if uh, if Dr. Tuhami is not here, uh, meanwhile I have um, a question. So as we ha as we were uh, speaking during COVID nineteen pandemic, all uh, worldwide students have been impacted by uh, by lockdown so theoretically speaking integrating critical thinking skills seem an easy task now i would like to and to ask you what do you think of integrating uh, the critical thinking skills in practice i have as i have said theoretically speaking it seems easy what about uh, in practice it means in real efl classes so can any of the participants answer the uh, the question please so you just ask for uh, for a hand so that i can uh... anyone knock knock Who, uh, Dr. B Ms. Bugilmuna Ahlam, would you like to answer? We are sorry, we cannot hear you. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. Uh, okay, hello everyone. And uh, I'm very pleased to take part in this uh, conference. So uh, as you have mentioned, or as you have asked, it is not really an easy task to apply the critical thinking tasks into the EFL classroom. This is very demanding on the part of the teacher. And as I have mentioned in my presentation, it is not a matter of one session or two sessions. It means we cannot really uh, touch or see the impact. It means it is a long term uh, change you cannot see or you cannot witness the, the impact of these activities or these tasks on the learners. So I, I can say that it is not really an easy task. It is demanding on the part of the teacher because we need to plan lessons that target the, uh, the critical thinking skills. Uh, and these lessons are not always, uh, I mean, these activities are not always available uh, when we take into consideration the students' needs the, the level of proficiency of uh, the level of the language proficiency, because uh, I have uh, tried to do this with my students, but it was not always workable. Uh, since, like, for example, the information gap uh, tasks, the, uh, the brainstorming tasks, students are not really at this point of maturity. So, as I said, it is demanding on the part of the teacher and right. At the same time, it is not really uh, easy for the students to grasp it. Thank true, you. true. Thank you so much, Ms. Bugelmuna, for your participation. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have uh, another question for uh, uh, Dr. Tuhani Tisam, if she's here. Uh, so in your presentation, there was a part where it, it was said, intelligence doesn't have much effect on creativity. I would like to, I would like you to give me your point of view. Do you really think that intelligence doesn't have much effect on creativity? So, Dr. Tuhan, please. So I can uh, see that Dr. Tuhami is not here. So I think the uh, the debate will be between both of us, uh, Ms. Bugelmuna. So I have asked this question uh, where uh, Iris said, intelligence doesn't have much effect on creativity. Myself, I think that uh, integrating the critical thinking skills and implementing them is going to um, 
to uh, to put the students at a higher level of uh, degree of intelligence. So actually, creativity, uh, critical thinking skills do boost the uh, the intelligence of the students. So I think they can uh, can work together. So if you have another uh, observation, Ms. Bugelmuna, please uh, go ahead. Uh, I repeat it. She, it is said, intelligence doesn't have much effects on creativity. What do you think of that? Um, Ms. Bogimuna? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Do you hear me? Excuse me? Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Okay, I can hear so you. Okay, personally, I do not think so, uh, because it is not forcefully to be a, an intelligent person to be creative. Sometimes creativity gets out of students who are not really intelligent. So intelligence, I do not think that intelligence is a prerequisite uh, for creativity. But, but, but don't you think that creativity leads to boost intelligence? Since we, uh, by integrating critical thinking skills, we make students think out of the box. So yes. we are actually working on the, their intelligent parts. So I think that, that's why I, 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 I wanted Dr. Duhani uh, to answer this. Yeah. Um, so I'm not you, saying you... that intelligence must be here so that we can be creative. But I think that it's the other way around. Uh, if we develop creativity, so we are here developing the, uh, the student's intelligence. Yes, uh, here in this case, I do agree. When we develop, as you said, when you develop creativity, we are working on the intelligence of students. It's but true. The cannot always be true. We, when we say that intelligence leads to creativity, this cannot always be true. But when we say creativity leads to intelligence, yes, it can be true. I do agree. I do agree. And that was my point, actually. So uh, I do have uh, two other questions for uh, Dr. Tuhani uh, Ibtisem, uh, uh, very famous today, but uh, as I can see, absent. So uh, another question, threshold blended model is... She will? Okay, so we are waiting for you. Um, but remember uh, time constraints and we have other, uh, other sessions. I hope she will join soon. Um, I, will re, uh, I, will, please, I will repeat the questions for Dr. Tuhani. Uh, so we have one, how can we make students pass from portal to get into creativity? And the threshold blended model is not clear, any further explanation. And the last one, what do you suggest as, as substitute for the banking model? I think they are very, uh, very good uh, questions to be answered by Dr. Tohemi. Uh, we will uh, wait for more few uh, minutes. Uh, Meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Ashori uh, Kerima to please, would you like to explain, I will, I will not say better, but I will say explain more, uh, what do you mean by the Socratic seminars? Uh, it wasn't really um, uh, shown in your presentation. So I am calling um, Ms. Ashori Kerima, please. Yes, good. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Ashori Kerima. Uh, 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, should I repeat the question? Yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's clear. Okay, go ahead. So uh, as far as the Socratic seminars are concerned, as I have already said that uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, seminars or uh, this kind of discussion has to do basically with uh, discussing uh, or it is, let me say, a formal discussion based on a given text, the text or the topic that is uh, given by the, the teacher, or sometimes it is uh, chosen, I mean, uh, among the, uh, the learners. Here, uh, the leader or the teacher would open this uh, debate by asking open-ended questions and therefore, uh, or upon uh, those questions, the, uh, the students will launch their debates concerning, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the given topic. And it was uh, done in my writing classroom. It was about writing essays. But uh, I mean, uh, honestly speaking, it was uh, hard because uh, most of the time- I'm consuming, I guess time consuming and the most of the times we found that students are so reluctant to any further change inside the classroom because they are more comfortable with the old way of teaching. I mean, uh, where the, uh, the, uh, the teacher is monopolizing the talk. So they, I think that the quality of our learners, they are too passive, they are too dependent and uh, they are so reluctant to any further change. Um, so, uh, as you have observed that it is um, time consuming during uh, written expression session, so uh, I guess maybe you are advising that we use it in an oral expression session, probably? Yes, why not? Because, I mean, in a written expression teach, uh, I mean, uh, uh, classes, we are bounded by, I mean, writing essays, for instance, different types of essays, so we need more time to conduct all types of essays to make more practice. So it's very time consuming. So uh, it's preferable to be done, I mean, in other modules like oral expression where, I mean, I think the, the, the program, I mean, teachers are not uh, so restricted by a given program. Although okay. I don't believe in, in being restricted, I mean, with a given program at the level of the university, but sometimes we need to be so. Uh, so you you are suggesting that we 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 cannot use it use it in um, a written expression session. We cannot, or it's advisable no. not to. No, if it if it will, I mean, if it is, I mean, a, an overcrowded classroom, so uh, it's very hard to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, I mean to apply it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Ms. Me, uh, Ashori in, uh, in, in such a classroom, because and uh, I mean we need two we, we need even two circles. I mean inner circles and outer circles. It cannot be I mean uh, workable in our classrooms. Thank you so much, Ms. Ashori Kerima, uh, and I would like to thank uh, all of the participants for uh, these innovative and uh, very informative. Uh, uh, presentations. So before we declare the session to end, uh, Dr. Ibtisem Tuhemi, are you here? Tuhemi Ibtisem, please. You're here, Dr. Tuhemi. So, Dr. Tuhemi, please uh, ask for, uh, for a hand so that we can allow you to participate. Hello. Hello, Dr. Tuhemi.
technical problem, I guess. So we will try one more last time, time, uh, time uh, constraint, please. So we will try with one more last time. She's not here. Mm. Uh, Dr. Tuhemi, please ask for a hand so that we can allow you to participate. Mm. So uh, I would like to apologize, Dr. Tuhemi. Time constraint, and we still have uh, another session. So I was very honored to chair this session. Thank you so much. Uh, the following session will be chaired by uh, Dr. Ahmed Nordin Belarbi. Thank you so much. Dr. Tuhemi. Yes, so technical problem. Dr. Tuhemi, please. Mm. I think she is disconnected. So we have give, given, sorry, uh, the chance. So again, I declare the session finished. Thank you so much.
Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is session number four, and it is entitled Translation and Knowledge Production. Uh, we have how many presenters? One, two, three, four, five. Five presenters. And directly, I want to go to the first presentation, which is by Mrs. Lina Rumeisa uh, and Dr. Abdelkader Belgarnin, Tlemcen University, entitled Discourse analysis as a method of literary translation. So here is the first presentation. Translating literary text, and that is Discourse analysis. I will start with the objective of the present study, then move to the definition of discourse analysis, later coming to discourse and context, then talking about approaches to discourse analysis, shedding light particularly on Halliday's model of discourse analysis and what should be taken into account while analyzing a literally translated work. And finally, 
we end up with the conclusion. Starting with the objective, the prudent study seeks to explain the usefulness of moving from the linguistic level to the cultural and discourse level in literary translation work. Before going into depth about discourse analysis, let's get a general idea about it. Discourse analysis involves studying written or spoken language in relation to its social context. Its purpose is understanding how language is used in real-life situations. There are different definitions given for discourse analysis, but I have chosen the one by the Ukrainian linguist Delik Harris, since he was the first one who used that term in his article entitled Discourse Analysis. He defines discourse analysis this way. Discourse analysis is the method of seeking any connected discrete linear material whether language or language-like, which contains more than elementary sentence, some global structure characterizing the whole discourse, the linear material or large section of it. From the given definition, we can say that, according to Harris, discourse analysis is a method that attempts to take into consideration larger chunks or the entire passage to gain meaning, not small individual sentences or portions of them. We can't talk about discourse if we don't deal with the context. Context can be defined simply as the circumstances that contribute to the meaning of a text. So, in other words, it can be said that context is the setting to word or event. Context helps in the interpretation of discourse. Then there is a relationship between them. Context can be divided into linguistic context, situational context, and cultural context. Now, moving to different approaches of discourse analysis. Let's start with the speech act theory, which considers language as a sort of action rather than a medium to convey and express. Then we have interactional social linguistics, which is concerned with the significance of context in the production and interpretation of discourse. Additionally, there is ethnography of communication, which means understanding a language from an anthropological perspective. Next, there is pragmatics, which deals with the contribution of context to meaning. Furthermore, there is conversational analysis, which deals with analyzing speech that is produced as a result of normal, everyday interactions. And finally, we have variation analysis, which is concerned with studying variation and change in language. Coming to Halliday's model of discourse analysis, Halliday developed what is known as systemic functional grammar or systemic functional linguistics. What does this mean? SFL is the study of the relationship between language and its functions in social settings. 
So the language is used as social semiotic, a resource people use to achieve their purposes through expressing meaning in context. Asafals deal with registers with sorry with the register in terms of three parameters known as semiotic functions. These are field, tenor and mode. What do we mean by those parameters? Field is what the text is about. So it is the content or the subject matter. Tenor has to do with the relationship between the author and the reader. Mode is how the text is constructed, in other words, the channel of communication being used. So when we combine those three elements, we have what we call register. Before moving to the conclusion, it is useful to talk briefly about the house translation quality assessment model. Both house quality assessment translation and holiday and systematic functional theory were inspired by Prague school ideas. What are those ideas? Among conclusion, the task of translating is not only replacing one word with another. The environment of the source text in order to transfer the message of it to the target text for more accuracy. Otherwise, it's going to be nonsense. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Ms. Uh, Romaisa Fragna. Now we move to the second presenter, Mr. Lazhar Sadouqi from Wargla University and Dr. Ahmed Nordin Belarbi. Uh, under the title, How Primordial is to be an in-house native translator. And here is the recorded presentation. major literary translation. Today I'm going to present my work which is entitled How Primordial is to be an in-house native translator. It's commonly believed that translators are better at translating into their native language than into a second language. The underlying reason for this assumption is that translators have a more profound linguistic and cultural background of their mother tongue than of a second language which they have to learn in order to be well-versed translators. By the same token, the translator who translates in into his or her native language has a more natural and practical knowledge of the various linguistic elements of his or her native language, such as semantics, syntax, morphology, and lexicology, than the translator who translates into a foreign language. In addition, Translation into the first language enables translators to render cultural elements such as proverbs, idioms, metaphors, 
collocation, swear words, and OVA into proper equivalents in their mother tongue because such translators are born and bred in the culture into which they translate these culture-bound aspects. In fact, the translator's first language is naturally acquired in a culture and environment where the first language is naturally acquired and practiced. On the other hand, their second language is, for the most part, learned rather than acquired later on in the course of their life. As a result, the linguistic and cultural knowledge is in progress and never complete. In this respect, James Dickens points out that translators training normally focuses on translation into the mother tongue because higher quality is achieved in that direction than in translating into a foreign language. On the linguistic level, translation into the first language provides the translator with some advantages such as an instinctive knowledge of morphological, semantic, syntactic and lexical aspects of his or her mother tongue because the translator acquires these linguistic elements naturally in the course of time. These various aspects constitute the translator's increasing linguistic reservoir. In contrast, Translation into a second language not only provides the translator with some kind of bookish knowledge, but it also puts him or her at the mercy of references, such as grammar books and general and specialized dictionaries, as the translator's second language is, in most cases, learned outside its natural context rather than acquired. Every time the translator is unsure of the morphological, semantic or lexical rules of the second language into which he or she translates, he or she will have to refer to references and dictionaries for help. Sometimes he or she consults more than one reference or dictionary to decide on the right, to decide on the right meaning of a certain word or phrase and the search for appropriate equivalents in the target language may take even a long time. In this respect, Catherine Rice argues that due to the fact that differences between grammatical systems of languages are frequently quite great, it is the morphology and syntax of the target language that clearly deserve priority unless there is some overriding factor either in the nature of the text or some special circumstances. As far as the morphological aspect is concerned, translation into the mother tongue tends to be more successful than translation into a second language because of the translator's inherent knowledge of the morphological rules of his or her first language. The following invented example in Arabic may illustrate this point. The sentence is, huwa akbar waladin fil aila. This Arabic sentence corresponds to the following English sentence, he is the eldest child in his family. Such a sentence may confuse a novice translator whose first language is Arabic because Akbaru, which is morphologically equivalent to the comparative language uh, English from Elda Auda, is in fact used here to refer to the superlative degree. For a translator whose first language is English, such a sentence will not pose a challenge because his or her morphological competence will automatically lead him or her to the right choice. Furthermore, the semantic knowledge of the translator who translates into his or her mother tongue is an added asset to good translation because he or she does not translate words in isolation but meaning in a given context. In some languages, one word can be used to refer to more than one thing and only those translators who translate into their native language are aware of such a semantic feature. This, however, may cause confusion or translation loss when translation is done into a foreign language. Michael Honey highlights the, this point by stating the following example. 
European cultures traditionally make a firm distinction between emotional and intellectual activities, attaching them to the heart and the head, respectively. In, addition, in traditional Chinese culture, no such distinction is made, since the heart is referred to as the location of mental activities of all kinds. Despite the fact that translators' best friends are assumed to be monolingual and bilingual dictionaries, the translators who translate into their first language perform well, even without the help of such dictionaries, because by intuition, they are more aware of the lexical aspect of their native language than that of a second language. In addition, they are fully equipped with the lexical knowledge of their first language, which will help them match correct lexical items in both the source language and the target language. By virtue of this knowledge, for example, they can decide what verbs collocate with what nouns, what adjectives collocate with what nouns, what adverbs to use before what adjectives, what tense to use, whether a feminine, masculine, singular, or plural should be used, and other important lexical information. Roman Jacobson further illustrates this point by providing an example from Russian. In order to translate accurately the English sentence, I hired a worker, a Russian needs supplementary information, whether this action was completed or not, and whether this, uh, the worker was a man or a woman, because he must make his choice between a verb or, uh, of completive or non-completive aspect, and between masculine and a feminine noun. In conclusion, it can safely be said that the translators who carry out translation into their native language are do they follow translators who translate into a second or foreign language because the former are more naturally equipped with both the linguistic and cultural knowledge of the target language than the latter. Besides, in terms of linguistic competence, translation into the first language provides the translator with an intuitive knowledge of the morphology, semantics, syntax, and lexicology of the target language, which is, in fact, his or her mother tongue. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, now we give the floor to the third presenter, Dr. Abdel Qadir Bilgarnin from Tlemcen University. The presentation is entitled Translation in Multilingual Era, the Case of Multilingual Institutions. I'd like to thank Professor Halimi and all the organizing committee for this uh, opportunity to participate with you at this uh, international conference. My communication is about translation in the multilingual era, the case of multilingual institutions. Uh, it is my first time to communicate in English, so I hope I won't uh, offend your hearing with my awkward pronunciations or, why, or with my strange English structures from time to time. Uh, also, and uh, before I start, I want to emphasize on the difference that I make in my uh, communication between three types of multilingualism. The first one being the societal multilingualism, which refers to the linguistic diversity found in a country or community. Secondly, the individual multilingualism, which refers to the person's ability in languages other than their mother tongue. And finally, where I situate my communication, is institutional multilingualism in organizations, which refers to the institutions policies and use of languages, both for internal and external communication. To deal with global problems, 
many international organizations have been established during the 20th century. Most of these organizations have an effect on not just on individual notion, uh, nations, but on the world, and thus they are powerful and important providers and users of information. Power is exercised through language use and by making strategic choices about what information is to be made available and in which languages. It is here where the importance of translation comes into play. Accordingly, and from the analysis of a corpus produced or translated in a multilingual context, namely the United Nations, our communication aims to shed light on a case where the production of pragmatic texts is governed by both extralinguistic and linguistic factors. We mean here the diversity of languages, drafting conventions and rules, editing and layout standards, as well as other quasi-legal factors that characterize these texts by the stamp of law. Our study is intended to be an analysis of the behavior of language in this particular and binding context characterized as multilingual space. To understand and detect the uses of language, of course, that are established and justified by, by multilingual. My key assumptions and postulates. To the extent that we postulate that translation is an act of communication with change of language support, we do place the translator at the core of interlingual communication and we grant him accordingly all the right to operate on, this, on the discursive level of the message. The different modulations or change made on some scraps of the text confirm the existence of a leeway granted to the translator to overcome the structural constraints that characterize its language. Nevertheless, these fragmentary operations, which are at the microstructure level, seem to reflect only the tactical stage of a host translation strategy which should normally operate on a more global microstructure level. That is to say, on the linguistic and extralinguistic, on the form and the function, on the texting complex, or in short, on the discourse. We have here many different notions binding up in many others. The term discourse, for instance, taken from this perspective of intercultural and multilingual communication, implies the notions of the situation of communication, context, locutionary and perlocutionary acts, in the sense that we consider that any translation aims to make people understand. The linguistic modes of communication, I mean types, genre, text, discourse, are in fact only an actualization of our intentionality conditioned by several contextual and situational factors. That said, the act of translating which springs from understanding consists of reproducing the discourse in an equivalent form but adequate and inherent in target language culture. Or in the words of Daniel Henri Pajou, this act consists in passing a text from one culture to another, from one system to another. It is to introduce a text in another context. However, the autonomy to interpret and reformulate enjoyed by the translator according to the basis of understanding does not give him the right to alter the form, it being inseparable from the function. Content are conveyed according to each context in a proper form designated above by type or genre according to the Bactanian principle of verbal economy. It is connections that exist between the uses of language in communication situations and social discursive practices that must serve as milestone for the translator. The theoretical elements advanced above, which provide only a schematic or even a reductive outline of the problem, refer to all situations of general translation between two languages to varying degrees. The constraints that may occur in this form of translation are often terminological in nature, which can be overcome thanks to termino terminographical work and teamwork between specialists and transcribers. transcribers. Transcribers, sorry. Legal translation, for example, in bilingual context such as in Algeria, represents certainly some complex problems, but which are only part of the sphere of the Algerian law, the context being always the same. 
but as soon as this translation opens up to another legal system, problems of other orders, cultural, religious or ideological, will surface and translation will therefore adopt other strategies likely to achieve the balance between these different factors. Even more complex is the situation when it comes to translating illegal content in several languages brought together in the same context, an international organization for example. This is what we call here multilingual context. In some international organizations such as the United Nations or the European Union, the forms of drafting and translation are agreed upon by the laws that emphasize on the sovereignty of the member states. Resolution, decision, statements and several other texts are considered to be written concurrent concurrently and simultaneously in the languages of the member states, known as official languages. To speak of an original and the translation or version, in this case of founding resolutions or treaties, would inevitably give rise to connotation of dictates. In this context, the term official language should not be confused with working language. The former one may refer to the language of official documents and, con in, and texts sorry, intended for in external communication, while the later one refers to the language of any non-official internal communication, whether written or verbal. Thus, and for reasons for, of verbal economy and efficiency, the various, ins various institutions of these international organizations agree to use to a large extent only one working language. However, external communication implies the unification of content and the normalization of forms, the interlocutor being the same moral person. Nevertheless, the representation of the same content cannot under any circumstances be articulated in the same order in all languages, especially when they belong to different linguistic families. Each language weaves textures relationships according to its proper cohesion elements as well as to its own argumentation structures and strategies. However, under the terms of the aforementioned agreed laws, drafting conventions and they are standards that sometimes do not apply to the syntax of the Arabic language, for example, can generate semantic conflicts at the referential chain level and consequently at the thematic change level chain level so to overcome these constraints Arabic translators resort to the use of the cohesive devices at the microstructure level to stitch the dislocated parts by least drafting and layout standards the other segments of the text are molded on the structures of the other dominant uh, Germanic and Latin languages English in the first place as a result, hybrid forms are introduced, new text type makes birth, and special use of language is justified. As we may notice here, the problem is serious enough to deserve a scientific reflection since it mainly affects the coherence of discourse where the form prevails. To, conf to confirm the evolved postulates, we produced by taking, we proceeded, uh, sorry, by taking the deep structure of the English version from the text of UN re resolution as follows: the Security Council, recalling, expressing, emphasizing, and we have X verbs, and finally, the verb decide, which means that we have different paragraphs. Each paragraph starting with a different uh, gerund form. Compared to the other French and Arabic deep structures, French, the French one, firstly, rappelant, se déclarant, soulignant, x verb, le conseil de sécurité décide. And in Arabic, in la majlis al amni, il yushiru, wa yu'aribu, wa yu'akidu, wa yu'rahibu, wa adad bin al afa'al, ma yuqarrir. This structure allows us to know if they are modeled on the English one or co-drafted, that is to say, translated or produced. And this, thanks to the analysis of the anaphor anaphoric chain and the theme ring layouts at the sentence level. 
as you may uh, see here uh, we have the scheme of the deep structure of the English text with the anaphoric uh, anor anor chain and the different uh, different uh, forms the French deep structure and the Arabic deep structure now we need to demonstrate that the three structures are identical and that the thematic chain follows the same order in the three texts for the French text this correspondence may be justified by the structural parallelism between French and English but it cannot in any circumstances be the same for the Arabic language which disposes its predicates in entirely different order in order not to infer hasty conclusions we also analyze the referential chain of the three texts by calculating the themes recurrences in the three versions the results revealed once again a great correspondence between the three texts at the referential chain level where the reference to the main theme is made by more than 10 general nouns this point led us to deduce that it There is no need to change names and give general nouns in Arabic.
Briga.
Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mohammed Kudad. Uh, the last uh, presenter of today of this session is uh, Ms. Afaf Azizi, Dr. Belarbi and Dr. Belgarnin, with a very interesting, it seems to me, very interesting title, Rashid Bujadra, an author, translator, or translator author. Here is the presentation.
Thank you, Ms. Akaf. Uh, well, now I go to directly to, to make a brief debate. And uh, we have so far two questions addressed to the first presenter. The number one addressed to first presenter, uh, Fregne, to Fregne. Here is the question. Are you, are you here with us? Fregne. Okay. So the first question is, well, Ms. Fregna is here with us. So the first question is, how can translators practically use the insights of discourse analysis in the process of translation? So I give her the floor first, then I will repeat the question. Yes. The first question here it is, how can translators practically use the insights of discourse analysis in the process of translation? Can you provide us with illustration? Yes. So discourse analysis, it does, uh, discourse analysis doesn't deal with, with, gram, with the grammar. It is what goes beyond the sentence. So it has to do with the setting. Concerning the illustration, for example, um, uh, the novel uh, uh, written by um, uh, Shukri, which is entitled Al Khubz Al Hafi, it's uh, his uh, it's a translation which is translated by uh, Paul, the American uh, Paul uh, Bowles. So he wrote in the introduction that the the translation is not literary. So it means that he used discourse analysis. To convey, to convey the meaning of of that that work because he uh, the Shukri and uh, Paul so they were friends so he uh, Paul Bowles didn't know the as uh, as it is called Derja so it was uh, translated into uh, standard Arabic and Spanish so that he could understand what he true he he meant by uh, by uh, his uh, his work. So I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you so, very much. You're welcome. Uh, the second the second question is addressed to Dr. Abdul Qadir uh, Your presentation is interesting. Can you advise us about books and materials that might help in teaching writing? Can you advise us about books and materials that might help in teaching writing? And uh, are, you, are you here with us, Dr. Bilgenani? Not with us. So uh, I give the floor to, to, to everybody, whoever wants to, uh, I mean, participate, the floor is yours. You are all allowed to comment or ask questions to each other or whatever. Do we have do we have any comment from the participant? No. So we I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly or no. Uh, do you have do you have any comment or or question from from Burundi, right? No. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you for the flow. Uh, actually, I don't have a question, but uh, I'll, I'd like to express my uh, uh, my pleasure. I have been following the, the conference from the beginning till now, mm -hmm. and uh, I have learned a lot. Uh, there have been great presentations, and it has been a great pleasure for me to see uh, again my my former teachers. Uh, by the way, I have uh, uh, 
been there at the World Grand University. And uh, I was very happy to see again my teachers. And I thank all the presenters. I really learned a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, for tomorrow's presentation. My presentation is tomorrow. Thank you uh, very much for the floor. Thank you, thank you, Arcade. Yes, uh, so we come to the end of this session, but I want to remind you all that tomorrow uh, we will have two sessions, uh, parallel sessions, one on Zoom, the other on Google Meet. And uh, this is the end of today's, uh, and today's session. The conference was entitled, the first, this is the first international conference on the reality of the linguistic policy in the world. And until tomorrow at nine o'clock, be safe. Thank you.